Section 0 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Ezenvine. Section 0. Things to think of first. A forward. The efficiency of a book is like that of a man, in one important respect. Its attitude toward its subject is the first source of its power. A book may be full of good ideas well expressed, but if its writer views his subject from the wrong angle, even his excellent advice may prove it to be ineffective. This book stands or falls by its author's attitude toward its subject. If the best way to teach oneself or others to speak effectively in public is to fill the mind with rules and to set up fixed standards for the interpretation of thought, the utterance of language, the making of gestures, and all the rest, then this book will be limited in value to such stray thoughts throughout its pages as may prove helpful to the reader. As an effort to enforce a group of principles, it must be reckoned a failure, because it is then untrue. It is of some importance, therefore, to those who take up this volume with open mind that they should see clearly at the outstart what is the thought that at once underlies and is builded through this structure. In plain words, it is this. Training in public speaking is not a matter of externals, Primarily, it is not a matter of imitation. Fundamentally, it is not a matter of conformity to standards, at all. Public speaking is public utterance, public issuance, of the man himself. Therefore, the first thing, both in time and in importance, is that the man should be and think and feel things that are worthy of being given forth. Unless there be something of value within, no tricks of training can ever make of the talker anything more than a machine albeit a highly perfected machine, for the delivery of other men's goods. So self-development is fundamental in our plan. The second principle lies close to the first. The man must enthrone his will to rule over his thought, his feelings, and all his physical powers, so that the outer self may give perfect, unhampered expression to the inner. It is futile, we assert, to lay down systems of rules for voice culture, intonation, gesture, and what not unless these two principles of having something to say and making the will sovereign have at least begun to make themselves felt in the life. The third principle, we surmise, arouse no dispute. No one can learn how to speak who does not first speak as best he can. That may seem like a vicious circle in statement, but it will bear examination. Many teachers have begun with the how. Vain effort! It is an ancient truism that we learn to do by doing. The first thing for the beginner in public speaking is to speak, not to study voice and gesture and the rest. Once he has spoken, he can improve himself by self-observation or according to the criticisms of those who hear. But how shall he be able to criticize himself? Simply by finding out three things. What are the qualities which by common consent go to make up an effective speaker? By what means at least some of these qualities may be acquired? and what wrong habits of speech in himself work against his acquiring and using the qualities which he finds to be good. Experience, then, is not only the best teacher, but the first and the last, but experience must be a dual thing. The experience of others must be used to supplement, correct, and justify our own experience. In this way we shall become our own best critics, only after we have trained ourselves in self-knowledge. The knowledge of what other minds think, and in the ability to judge ourselves by the standards we have come to believe are right. If I ought, said Kant, I can. An examination of the contents of this volume will show how consistently these articles of faith have been declared, expounded, and illustrated. The student is urged to begin to speak at once of what he knows. Then he is given simple suggestions for self-control, with gradually increasing emphasis upon the power of the inner man over the outer. Next, the way to the rich storehouses of material is pointed out, and finally, all the while, he is urged to speak. Speak! Speak as he is applying to his own methods in his own personal way, the principles he has gathered from his own experience and observation and the recorded experiences of others. So now at the very first, let it be as clear as light that methods are secondary matters, that the full mind, the warm heart, the dominant will are primary and not only primary, but paramount, for unless it be a full being that uses the methods, it will be like dressing a wooden image in the clothes of a man. J. Berg Essenwein, Narberth, P.A., 
January 1, 1915. The Art of Public Speaking Sense never fails to give them that have it, words enough to make them understood. It too often happens in some conversations, as in apothecary shops, that those pots that are empty or have things of small value in them are as gaudily dressed as those that are full of precious drugs. They that soar too high often fall hard, making a low and level dwelling preferable. The tallest trees are most in the power of the winds, and ambitious men are the blasts of fortune. Buildings have need of a good foundation that lies so much exposed to the weather. William Penn End of Section Zero Section One of The Art of Public Speaking this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and J. Berg Esenfein Chapter 1. Acquiring Confidence Before an Audience There is a strange sensation often experienced in the presence of an audience. It may proceed from the gaze of the many eyes that turn upon the speaker, especially if he permits himself to steadily return that gaze. Most speakers have been conscious of this in a nameless thrill, a real something pervading the atmosphere, tangible, evescent, indescribable. All writers have borne testimony to the power of a speaker's eye in impressing an audience. This influence which we are now considering is the reverse of that picture. The power their eyes may exert upon him, especially before he begins to speak. After the inward fires of oratory are fanned into flame, the eyes of the audience lose all terror. William Pittenger, Extempora Speech Students of public speaking continually ask, How can I overcome self-consciousness and the fear that paralyzes me before an audience? Did you ever notice in looking from a train window that some horses feed near the track and never even pause to look up at the thundering cars? while just ahead at the next railroad crossing a farmer's wife will be nervously trying to quiet her scared horse as the train goes by? How would you cure a horse that is afraid of cars? Graze him in a backwards lot where he would never see steam engines or automobiles, or drive or pasture him where he would frequently see the machines? Apply horse sense to ridding yourself of self-consciousness and fear. Face an audience as frequently as you can, and you will soon stop shying. You can never attain freedom from stage fright by reading a treatise. A book may give you excellent suggestions on how to best conduct yourself in the water, but sooner or later you must get wet, perhaps even strangle and be half scared to death. There are a great many wetless bathing suits worn at the seashore, but no one ever learns to swim in them. To plunge is the only way. Practice, practice, practice in speaking before an audience will tend to remove all fear of audiences, just as practice in swimming will lead to confidence and facility in the water. You must learn to speak by speaking. The Apostle Paul tells us that every man must work out his own salvation. All we can do here is to offer you suggestions as to how best to prepare for your plunge. The real plunge no one can take for you. A doctor may prescribe, but you must take the medicine. Do not be disheartened if at first you suffer from stage fright. Dan Patch was more susceptible to suffering than a superannuated dray horse would be. It never hurts a fool to appear before an audience, for his capacity is not a capacity for feeling. A blow that would kill a civilized man soon heals on a savage. The higher we go in the scale of life, the greater is the capacity for suffering. For one reason or another, some master speakers never entirely overcome stage fright, but it will pay you to spare no pains to conquer it. Daniel Webster failed in his first appearance and had to take his seat without finishing his speech because he was nervous. Gladstone was often troubled by self-consciousness in the beginning of an address. Beecher was always perturbed before talking in public. Blacksmiths sometimes twist a rope tight around the nose of a horse, and by thus inflicting a little pain, they distract his attention from the shoeing process. One way to get air out of a glass is to pour water in it. Be absorbed by your subject. Apply the blacksmith's homely principle when you are speaking. If you feel deeply about your subject, you will be able to think of little else. Concentration is a process of distraction from less important matters. It is too late to think about the cut of your coat when once you are upon the platform, so center your interest on what you are about to say. 
Fill your mind with your speech material and, like the infilling water in the glass, it will drive out your unsubstantial fears. Self-consciousness is undue consciousness of self, and, for the purpose of delivery, self is secondary to your subject, not only in the opinion of the audience, but, if you are wise, in your own. To hold any other view is to regard yourself as an exhibit instead of as a messenger, with a message worth delivering. Do you remember Albert Hubbard's tremendous little tract? A message to Garcia? The youth subordinated himself to the message he bore. So must you, by all determination you can muster. It is sheer egotism to fill your mind with thoughts of self when a greater thing is there. Truth. Say this to yourself sternly, and shame your self-consciousness into quiescence. If the theatre caught fire, you could rush to the stage and shout directions to the audience without any self-consciousness, for the importance of what you were saying would drive all fear-thoughts out of your mind. Far worse than self-consciousness through fear of doing poorly is self-consciousness through assumption of doing well. The first sign of greatness is when a man does not attempt to look and act great. Before you can call yourself a man at all, Kipling assures us you must not look too good nor talk too wise. Nothing advertises itself so thoroughly as conceit. One may be so full of self as to be empty. Voltaire said, we must conceal self-love. But that cannot be done. You know this to be true, for you have recognized overweening self-love in others. If you have it, others are seeing it in you. There are things in this world bigger than self, and in working for them self will be forgotten, or, what is better, remembered only so as to help us win toward higher things. Have something to say. The trouble with many speakers is that they go before an audience with their minds a blank. It is no wonder that nature, abhorring a vacuum, fills them with the nearest thing handy, which generally happens to be, I wonder if I am doing this right. How does my hair look? I know I shall fail. Their prophetic souls are sure to be right. It is not enough to be absorbed by your subject. To acquire self-confidence, you must have something in which to be confident. If you go before an audience without any preparation or previous knowledge of your subject, you ought to be self-conscious. You ought to be ashamed to steal the time of your audience. Prepare yourself. Know what you are going to talk about, and, in general, how you are going to say it. Have the first few sentences worked out completely so that you may not be troubled in the beginning to find words. Know your subject better than your hearers know it, and you have nothing to fear. After preparing for success, expect it. Let your bearing be modestly confident, but most of all be modestly confident within. Overconfidence is bad, but to tolerate premonitions of failure is worse, for a bold man may win attention by his very bearing, while a rabbit-hearted coward invites disaster. Humility is not the personal discount that we must offer in the presence of others. Against this old interpretation there has been a most healthy modern reaction. True humility any man who thoroughly knows himself must feel, but it is not a humility that assumes a worm-like meekness. It is rather a strong, vibrant prayer for greater power for service, a prayer that Uriah Heep could never have uttered. Washington Irving once introduced Charles Dickens at a dinner given in the latter's honor. In the middle of his speech, Irving hesitated, became embarrassed, and sat down awkwardly. Turning to a friend beside him, he remarked, There, I told you I would fail, and I did. If you believe you will fail, there is no hope for you. You will. Rid yourself of this I am a poor worm in the dust idea. You are a god, with infinite capabilities. All things are ready if the mind be so. The eagle looks the cloudless sun in the face. Assume mastery over your audience. In public speech, as in electricity, there is a positive and a negative force. Either you or your audience are going to possess the positive factor. If you assume it, you can almost invariably make it yours. If you assume the negative, you are sure to be negative. Assuming a virtue or a vice vitalizes it. Summon all your power of self-direction, and remember that though your audience is infinitely more important than you, the truth is more important than both of you, because it is eternal. If your mind falters in its leadership, the sword will drop from your hands. Your assumption of being able to instruct or lead or inspire a multitude or even a small group of people may appall you as being colossal impudence, as indeed it may be. But having once essayed to speak, be courageous. Be courageous. It lies within you to be what you will. Make yourself be calm and confident. Reflect that your audience will not hurt you. If Beecher in Liverpool had spoken behind a wire screen, he would have invited the audience to throw the overripe missiles with which they were loaded. 
but he was a man confronted with his hostile hearers fearlessly and won them. In facing your audience, pause a moment and look them over. A hundred chances to one, they want you to succeed. For what man is so foolish as to spend his time, perhaps his money, in the hope that you will waste his investment by talking dully? Concluding Hints Do not make haste to begin. Haste shows lack of control. Do not apologize. It ought not to be necessary, and if it is, it will not help. Go straight ahead. Take a deep breath, relax, and begin in a quiet conversational tone as though you are speaking to one large friend. You will not find it half so bad as you imagined. Really, it is like taking a cold plunge. After you are in, the water is fine. In fact, having spoken a few times, you will even anticipate the plunge with acceleration. To stand before an audience and make them think your thoughts after you is one of the greatest pleasures you can ever know. Instead of fearing it, you ought to be as anxious as the foxhounds straining at their leashes, or the racehorses tugging at their reins. So cast out fear, for fear is cowardly, when it is not mastered. The bravest know fear, but they do not yield to it. Face your audience pluckily. If your knees quake, make them stop. In your audience lies some victory for you, and the cause you represent. Go win it! Suppose Charles Martel had been afraid to hammer the Saracen at Tours. Suppose Columbus had feared to venture into the unknown West. Suppose our forefathers had been too timid to oppose the tyranny of George the Third. Suppose that any man who ever did anything worth while had been a coward. The world owes its progress to the men who have dared, and you must dare to speak the effective word that is in your heart to speak, for often it requires courage to utter a single sentence. But remember that men erect no monuments and weave no laurels for those who fear to do what they can. Is all this unsympathetic, do you say? Man, what you need is not sympathy, but a push. No one doubts that temperament and nerves and illness and even praiseworthy modesty may, singly or combined, cause the speaker's cheek to blanch before an audience, but neither can any one doubt that coddling will manifest this weakness. The victory lies in a fearless frame of mind. Professor Walter Dill Scott says, Success or failure in business is caused more by mental attitude even than by mental capacity. Banish the fear attitude, acquire the confident attitude, and remember that the only way to acquire it is to acquire it. In this foundation chapter we have tried to strike the tone of much that is to follow. Many of these ideas will be amplified and enforced in a more specific way, but through all these chapters on an art which Mr. Gladstone believed to be more powerful than the public press, the note of justifiable self-confidence must sound again and again. Questions and Exercises 1. What is the cause of self-consciousness? 2. Why are animals free from it? 3. What is your observation regarding self-consciousness in children? 4. Why are you free from it under the stress of unusual excitement? 5. How does moderate excitement affect you? 6. What are the two fundamental requisites for the acquiring of self-confidence? Which is the more important? 7. What effect does confidence on the part of the speaker have on the audience? 8. Write out a two-minute speech on confidence and cowardice. 9. What effect do habits of thought have on confidence? In this connection, read the chapter on Right Thinking and Personality. 10. Write out very briefly any experience you may have had involving the teachings of this chapter. 11. Give a three-minute talk on stage fright, including a kindly imitation of two or more victims. End of chapter 1. Section 2 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joe Mabry. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Essenvine. Section 2. Chapter 2. The Sin of Monotony. One day, ennui was born from uniformity. Mote. 
our english has changed with the years so that many words now connote more than they did originally this is true of the word monotonous from having but one tone it has come to mean more broadly lack of variation the monotonous speaker not only drones along in the same volume and pitch of tone but uses always the same emphasis the same speed the same thoughts or dispenses with thought altogether monotony the cardinal and most common sin of the public speaker is not a transgression it is rather a sin of omission for it consists in living up to the confession of the prayer book we have left undone those things we ought to have done emerson says quote, the virtue of art lies in detachment in sequestering one object from the embarrassing variety end quote. that is just what the monotonous speaker fails to do he does not detach one thought or phrase from another they are all expressed in the same manner to tell you that your speech is monotonous may mean very little to you so let us look at the nature and the curse of monotony in other spheres of life then we shall appreciate more fully how it will blight an otherwise good speech if the victrola in the adjoining apartment grinds out just three selections over and over again it is pretty safe to assume that your neighbor has no other records if a speaker uses only a few of his powers it points very plainly to the fact that the rest of his powers are not developed monotony reveals our limitations in its effect on its victim monotony is actually deadly it will drive the bloom from the cheek and the luster from the eye as quickly as sin and often leads to viciousness the worst punishment that human ingenuity has ever been able to invent is extreme monotony solitary confinement lay a marble on the table and do nothing eighteen hours of the day but change that marble from one point to another and back again and you will go insane if you continue long enough so this thing that shortens life and is used as the most cruel of punishments in our prisons is the thing that will destroy all the life and force of a speech avoid it as you would shun a deadly dull bore the idle rich can have half a dozen homes command all the varieties of foods gathered from the four corners of the earth and sail for africa or alaska at their pleasure but the poverty-stricken man must walk or take a street car he does not have the choice of yacht auto or special train he must spend the most of his life in labor and be content with the staples of the food market monotony is poverty whether in speech or in life strive to increase the variety of your speech as the business man labors to augment his wealth bird songs forest glens and mountains are not monotonous it is the long rows of brown stone fronts and the miles of paved streets that are so terribly same nature in her wealth gives us endless variety man with his limitations is often monotonous get back to nature in your methods of speech making the power of variety lies in its pleasure-giving quality the great truths of the world have often been couched in fascinating stories les miserables for instance if you wish to teach or influence men you must please them first or last strike the same note on the piano over and over again this will give you some idea of the displeasing jarring effect monotony has on the ear the dictionary defines monotonous as being synonymous with wearisome that is putting it mildly it is maddening the department store prince does not disgust the public by playing only one tune come buy my wares he gives recitals on a one hundred and twenty five thousand dollar organ and the pleased people naturally slip into a buying mood how to conquer monotony we obviate monotony in dress by replenishing our wardrobes we avoid monotony in speech by multiplying our powers of speech we multiply our powers of speech by increasing our tools the carpenter has special implements with which to construct the several parts of a building the organist has certain keys and stops which he manipulates to produce his harmonies and effects in like manner the speaker has certain instruments and tools at his command 
by which he builds his argument plays on the feelings and guides the beliefs of his audience to give you a conception of these instruments and practical help in learning to use them are the purposes of the immediately following chapters why did not the children of israel whirl through the desert in limousines and why did not noah have moving picture entertainments and talking machines on the ark the laws that enable us to operate an automobile produce moving pictures or music on the victrola would have worked just as well then as they do today it was ignorance of law that for ages deprived humanity of our modern conveniences many speakers still use ox-cart methods in their speech instead of employing automobile or overland express methods they are ignorant of laws that make for efficiency in speaking just to the extent that you regard and use the laws that we are about to examine and learn how to use will you have efficiency and force in your speaking and just to the extent that you disregard them will your speaking be feeble and ineffective we cannot impress too thoroughly upon you the necessity for a real working mastery of these principles they are the very foundations of successful speaking get your principles right said napoleon and the rest is a matter of detail it is useless to shoe a dead horse and all the sound principles in christendom will never make a live speech out of a dead one so let it be understood that public speaking is not a matter of mastering a few dead rules the most important law of public speech is the necessity for truth force feeling and life forget all else but not this when you have mastered the mechanics of speech outlined in the next few chapters you will no longer be troubled with monotony the complete knowledge of these principles and the ability to apply them will give you great variety in your powers of expression but they cannot be mastered and applied by thinking or reading about them you must practice 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 if no one else will listen to you listen to yourself you must always be your own best critic and the severest one of all the technical principles that we lay down in the following chapters are not arbitrary creations of our own they are all founded on the practices that good speakers and actors adopt either naturally and unconsciously or under instruction in getting their effects it is useless to warn the student that he must be natural to be natural may be to be monotonous the little strawberry up in the arctics with a few tiny seeds and an acid tang is a natural berry but it is not to be compared with the improved variety that we enjoy here the dwarfed oak on the rocky hillside is natural but a poor thing compared with the beautiful tree found in the rich moist bottom lands be natural but improve your natural gifts until you have approached the ideal for we must strive after idealized nature in fruit tree and speech questions and exercises one what are the causes of monotony two cite some instances in nature three cite instances in man's daily life four describe some of the effects of monotony in both cases five read aloud some speech without paying particular attention to its meaning or force six now repeat it after you have thoroughly assimilated its matter and spirit what difference do you notice in its rendition? 7. Why is monotony one of the worst as well as one of the most common faults of speakers? End of section 2. Recording by Joe Mabry, IEVoice.com. Section 3 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joe Mabry. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Ezenvine. Section 3. Chapter 3. Efficiency Through Emphasis and Subordination. Quote, in a word, the principle of emphasis 
is followed best not by remembering particular rules but by being full of a particular feeling c.s baldwin writing and speaking the gun that scatters too much does not bag the birds the same principle applies to speech the speaker that fires his force and emphasis at random into a sentence will not get results not every word is of special importance therefore only certain words demand emphasis you say massachusetts and minneapolis you do not emphasize each syllable alike but hit the accented syllable with force and hurry over the unimportant ones now why do you not apply this principle in speaking a sentence to some extent you do in ordinary speech but do you in public discourse it is there that monotony caused by lack of emphasis is so painfully apparent so far as emphasis is concerned you may consider the average sentence as just one big word with the important word as the accented syllable note the following quote, destiny is not a matter of chance it is a matter of choice End quote. you might as well say massachusetts emphasizing every syllable equally as to lay equal stress on each word in the foregoing sentences speak it aloud and see of course you will want to emphasize destiny for it is the principal idea in your declaration and you will put some emphasis on not else your hearers may think you are affirming that destiny is a matter of chance by all means you must emphasize chance for it is one of the two big ideas in the statement another reason why chance takes emphasis is that it is contrasted with choice in the next sentence obviously the author has contrasted these ideas purposely so that they might be more emphatic and here we see that contrast is one of the very first devices to gain emphasis as a public speaker you can assist this emphasis of contrast with your voice if you say my horse is not black what color immediately comes into mind white naturally for that is the opposite of black if you wish to bring out the thought that destiny is a matter of choice you can do so more effectively by first saying that destiny is not a matter of chance is not the color of the horse impressed upon us more emphatically when you say my horse is not black he is white than it would be by hearing you assert merely that your horse is white in the second sentence of the statement there is only one important word choice it is the one word that positively defines the quality of the subject being discussed and the author of those lines desired to bring it out emphatically as he has shown by contrasting it with another idea these lines then would read like this destiny is not a matter of chance it is a matter of choice now read this over striking the words in capitals with a great deal of force in almost every sentence there are a few mountain peak words that represent the big important ideas when you pick up the evening paper you can tell at a glance which are the important news articles thanks to the editor he does not tell about a hold-up in hong kong in the same sized type as he uses to report the death of five firemen in your home city size of type is his device to show emphasis in bold relief he brings out sometimes even in red headlines the striking news of the day it would be a boon to speech making if speakers would conserve the attention of their audiences in the same way and emphasize only the words representing the important ideas the average speaker will deliver the foregoing line on destiny with about the same amount of emphasis on each word instead of saying it is a matter of choice he will deliver it it is a matter of choice or it is a matter of choice both equally bad charles dana the famous editor of the new york sun told one of his reporters that if he went up the street and saw a dog bite a man to pay no attention to it the sun could not afford to waste the time and attention of its readers on such unimportant happenings but said mr dana if you see a man bite a dog hurry back to the office and write the story of course that is news that is unusual now the speaker who says it is a matter of choice is putting too much emphasis upon things that are of no more importance to metropolitan readers than a dog bite 
and when he fails to emphasize choice he is like the reporter who passes up the man's biting a dog the ideal speaker makes his big words stand out like mountain peaks his unimportant words are submerged like stream beds his big thoughts stand like huge oaks his ideas of no especial value are merely like the grass around the tree from all this we may deduce this important principle emphasis is a matter of contrast and comparison Recently, the New York American featured an editorial by Arthur Brisbane. Note the following, printed in the same type as given here. We do not know what the President thought when he got that message, or what the elephant thinks when he sees the mouse, but we do know what the President did. The words thought and did immediately catch the reader's attention, because they are different from the others, not especially because they are larger. If all the rest of the words in this sentence were made ten times as large as they are, and did and thought were kept at their present size, they would still be emphatic, because different. Take the following from Robert Chambers' novel, The Business of Life. The words you, had, would, are all emphatic, because they have been made different. He looked at her in angry astonishment. Well, what do you call it if it isn't cowardice, to slink off and marry a defenseless girl like that? Did you expect me to give you a chance to destroy me and poison Jacqueline's mind? If I had been guilty of the thing with which you charge me, what I have done would have been cowardly. Otherwise, it is justified. A Fifth Avenue bus would attract attention up at Minisink Ford, New York, while one of the ox teams that frequently pass there would attract attention on Fifth Avenue. To make a word emphatic, deliver it differently from the manner in which the words surrounding it are delivered. If you have been talking loudly, utter the emphatic word in a concentrated whisper, and you have intense emphasis. If you have been going fast, go very slow on the emphatic word. If you have been talking on a low pitch, jump to a high one on the emphatic word. If you have been talking on a high pitch, take a low one on your emphatic ideas. Read the chapters on inflection, feeling, pause, change of pitch, change of tempo. Each of these will explain in detail how to get emphasis through the use of a certain principle. In this chapter, however, we are considering only one form of emphasis, that of applying force to the important word and subordinating the unimportant words. Do not forget, this is one of the main methods that you must continually employ in getting your effects. Let us not confound loudness with emphasis. To yell is not a sign of earnestness, intelligence, or feeling. The kind of force that we want applied to the emphatic word is not entirely physical. True, the emphatic word may be spoken more loudly, or it may be spoken more softly, but the real quality desired is intensity, earnestness. It must come from within, outward. Last night a speaker said, the curse of this country is not a lack of education, it's politics. He emphasized curse, lack, education, politics. The other words were hurried over and thus given no comparative importance at all. The word politics was flamed out with great feeling as he slapped his hands together indignantly. His emphasis was both correct and powerful. He concentrated all our attention on the words that meant something instead of holding it up on such words as of this a of its what would you think of a guide who agreed to show new york to a stranger and then took up his time by visiting chinese laundries and boot blacking parlors on the side streets there is only one excuse for a speaker's asking the attention of his audience he must have either truth or entertainment for them if he wearies their attention with trifles, they will have neither vivacity nor desire left when he reaches words of Wall Street and skyscraper importance. You do not dwell on these small words in your everyday conversation, because you are not a conversational bore. Apply the correct method of everyday speech to the platform. As we have noted elsewhere, public speaking is very much like conversation enlarged. Sometimes, for big emphasis, it is advisable to lay stress on every single syllable in a word, 
as absolutely in the following sentence i absolutely refuse to grant your demand now and then this principle should be applied to an emphatic sentence by stressing each word it is a good device for exciting special attention and it furnishes a pleasing variety patrick henry's notable climax could be delivered in that manner very effectively give me liberty or give me death the italicized part of the following might also be delivered with this every word emphasis of course there are many ways of delivering it this is only one of several good interpretations that might be chosen knowing the price we must pay the sacrifice we must make the burdens we must carry the assaults we must endure knowing full well the cost yet we enlist and we enlist for the war for we know the justice of our cause and we know too its certain triumph from pass prosperity around by albert j beveridge before the chicago national convention of the progressive party strongly emphasizing a single word has a tendency to suggest its antithesis notice how the meaning changes by merely putting the emphasis on different words in the following sentence the parenthetical expressions would really not be needed to supplement the emphatic words i intended to buy a house this spring even if you did not i intended to buy a house this spring but something prevented i intended to buy a house this spring instead of renting as heretofore i intended to buy a house this spring and not an automobile i intended to buy a house this spring instead of next spring i intended to buy a house this spring instead of in the autumn when a great battle is reported in the papers they do not keep emphasizing the same facts over and over again they try to get new information or a new slant the news that takes an important place in the morning edition will be relegated to a small space in the late afternoon edition we are interested in new ideas and new facts this principle has a very important bearing in determining your emphasis do not emphasize the same idea over and over again unless you desire to lay extra stress on it senator thurston desired to put the maximum amount of emphasis on force in his speech on page fifty note how force is emphasized repeatedly as a general rule however the new idea the new slant whether in a newspaper report of a battle or a speaker's enunciation of his ideas is emphatic in the following selection larger is emphatic for it is the new idea all men have eyes but this man asks for a larger eye this man with the larger eye says he will discover not rivers or safety appliances for airplanes but new stars and suns new stars and suns are hardly as emphatic as the word larger why because we expect an astronomer to discover heavenly bodies rather than cooking recipes the words republic needs in the next sentence are emphatic they introduce a new and important idea republics have always needed men but the author says they need new men new is emphatic because it introduces a new idea in like manner soil grain tools are also emphatic the most emphatic words are italicized in this selection are there any others you would emphasize why the old astronomer said give me a larger eye and i will discover new stars and suns that is what the republic needs today new men men who are wise toward the soil toward the grains toward the tools if god would only raise up for the people two or three men like watt fulton and mccormick they would be worth more to the state than that treasure box named california or mexico and the real supremacy of man is based upon his capacity for education man is unique in the length of his childhood which means the period of plasticity and education the childhood of a moth the distance that stands between the hatching of the robin and its maturity represent a few hours or a few weeks 
but twenty years for growth stands between man's cradle and his citizenship this protracted childhood makes it possible to hand over to the boy all the accumulated stores achieved by races and civilizations through thousands of years anonymous you must understand that there are no steel riveted rules of emphasis it is not always possible to designate which word must and which must not be emphasized one speaker will put one interpretation on a speech another speaker will use different emphasis to bring out a different interpretation no one can say that one interpretation is right and the other wrong this principle must be borne in mind in all our marked exercises here your own intelligence must guide and greatly to your profit questions and exercises one what is emphasis two describe one method of destroying monotony of thought presentation three what relation does this have to the use of the voice four which words should be emphasized which subordinated in a sentence five read the selections on pages fifty fifty one fifty two fifty three and fifty four devoting special attention to emphasizing the important words or phrases and subordinating the unimportant ones read again changing emphasis slightly what is the effect six read some sentence repeatedly emphasizing a different word each time and show how the meaning is changed as is done on page twenty two seven what is the effect of a lack of emphasis eight read the selections on pages thirty and forty eight emphasizing every word what is the effect on the emphasis nine when is it permissible to emphasize every single word in a sentence ten note the emphasis and subordination in some conversation or speech you have heard were they well made why can you suggest any improvement? 11. From a newspaper or a magazine, clip a report of an address or a biographical eulogy. Mark the passage for emphasis and bring it with you to class. 12. In the following passage, would you make any changes in the author's markings for emphasis? Where? Why? Bear in mind that not all words marked require the same degree of emphasis. In a wide variety of emphasis and in nice shading of the gradations lie the excellence of emphatic speech i would call him napoleon but napoleon made his way to empire over broken oaths and through a sea of blood this man never broke his word no retaliation was his great motto and the rule of his life and the last words uttered to his son in france were these quote, my boy you will one day go back to santo domingo forget that france murdered your father unquote. i would call him cromwell but cromwell was only a soldier and the state he founded went down with him into his grave i would call him washington but the great virginian held slaves this man risked his empire rather than permit the slave trade in the humblest village of his dominions you think me a fanatic tonight for you read history not with your eyes but with your prejudices but fifty years hence when truth gets a hearing the muse of history will put phocion for the greek and brutus for the roman hampton for england lafayette for france choose washington as the bright consummate flower of our earlier civilization and john brown the ripe fruit of our noonday then dipping her pen in the sunlight will write in the clear blue above them all the name of the soldier the statesman the martyr Toussaint Louverture Wendell Phillips Toussaint Louverture Practice on the following selections for emphasis Beecher's Abraham Lincoln page 76 Lincoln's Gettysburg speech page 50 Seward's irrepressible conflict page 67 and Bryan's Prince of Peace page 448 End of section 3 Recording by Joe Mabry at ievoice.com
Section 4 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joe Mabry. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Ezenvein. Section 4. Chapter 4. Efficiency Through Change of Pitch. Speech is simply a modified form of singing, the principal difference being in the fact that in singing the vowel sounds are prolonged and the intervals are short, whereas in speech the words are uttered in what may be called staccato tones, the vowels not being specifically prolonged and the intervals between the words being more distinct. The fact that in singing we have a larger range of tones does not properly distinguish it from ordinary speech in speech we have likewise a variation of tones and even in ordinary conversation there is a difference of from three to six semitones as i have found in my investigations and in some persons the range is as high as one octave william shepagrell popular science monthly by pitch as every one knows we mean the relative position of a vocal tone as high medium low or any variation between in public speech we apply it not only to a single utterance as an exclamation or a monosyllable o oh, or the but to any group of syllables words and even sentences that may be spoken in a single tone this distinction it is important to keep in mind for the efficient speaker not only changes the pitch of successive syllables see chapter seven efficiency through inflection but gives a different pitch to different parts or word groups of successive sentences it is this phase of the subject which we are considering in this chapter every change in the thought demands a change in the voice pitch whether the speaker follows the rule consciously unconsciously or subconsciously this is the logical basis upon which all good voice variation is made yet this law is violated more often than any other by public speakers a criminal may disregard a law of the state without detection and punishment but the speaker who violates this regulation suffers its penalty at once in his loss of effectiveness while his innocent hearers must endure the monotony for monotony is not only a sin of the perpetrator as we have shown but a plague on the victims as well change of pitch is a stumbling block for almost all beginners and for many experienced speakers also this is especially true when the words of the speech have been memorized if you wish to hear how pitch monotony sounds strike the same note on the piano over and over again you have in your speaking voice a range of pitch from high to low with a great many shades between the extremes with all these notes available there is no excuse for offending the ears and taste of your audience by continually using the one note true the reiteration of the same tone in music as in pedal point on an organ composition may be made the foundation of beauty for the harmony weaving about that one basic tone produces a consistent insistent quality not felt in pure variety of chord sequences in like manner the intoning voice in a ritual may though it rarely does possess a solemn beauty but the public speaker should shun the monotone as he would a pestilence continual change of pitch is nature's highest method in our search for the principles of efficiency we must continually go back to nature listen really listen to the birds sing which of these feathered tribes are most pleasing in their vocal efforts those whose voices though sweet have little or no range or those that like the canary the lark and the nightingale not only possess a considerable range but utter their notes in continual variety of combinations even a sweet-toned chirp when reiterated without change may grow maddening to the enforced listener the little child seldom speaks in a monotonous pitch observe the conversations of little folk that you hear on the street or in the home and note the continual changes of pitch the unconscious speech of most adults is likewise full of pleasing variations imagine someone speaking the following and consider if the effect would not be just about as indicated 
remember we are not now discussing the inflection of single words but the general pitch in which phrases are spoken high pitch i'd like to leave for my vacation tomorrow lower still i have so much to do higher yet i suppose if i wait till i have time i'll never go repeat this first in the pitches indicated and then all in the one pitch as many speakers would observe the difference in naturalness of effect the following exercise should be spoken in a purely conversational tone with numerous changes of pitch practice it until your delivery would cause a stranger in the next room to think you were discussing an actual incident with a friend instead of delivering a memorized monologue if you are in doubt about the effect you have secured repeat it to a friend and ask him if it sounds like memorized words if it does it is wrong a similar case jack i hear you've gone and done it yes i know most fellows will went and tried it once myself sir though you see i'm single still and you met her did you tell me down at newport last july and resolved to ask the question at a soiree so did i i suppose you left the ballroom with its music and its light for they say love's flame is brightest in the darkest of the night well you walked along together overhead the starlit sky and i'll bet old man confess it you were frightened so was i you strolled along the terrace saw the summer moonlight pour all its radiance on the waters as they rippled on the shore till at length you gathered courage when you saw that none was nigh did you draw her close and tell her that you loved her so did i well i needn't ask you further and i'm sure i wish you joy think i'll wander down and see you when you're married eh my boy when the honeymoon is over and you're settled down we'll try what the deuce you say rejected you rejected so was i anonymous the necessity for changing pitch is so self-evident that it should be grasped and applied immediately however it requires patient drill to free yourself from monotony of pitch in natural conversation you think of an idea first and then find words to express it in memorized speeches you are liable to speak the words and then think what they mean and many speakers seem to trouble very little even about that is it any wonder that reversing the process should reverse the result get back to nature in your methods of expression read the following selection in a nonchalant manner never pausing to think what the words really mean try it again carefully studying the thought you have assimilated believe the idea desire to express it effectively and imagine an audience before you look them earnestly in the face and repeat this truth if you follow directions you will note that you have made many changes of pitch after several readings it is not work that kills men it is worry work is healthy you can hardly put more upon a man than he can bear worry is rust upon the blade it is not the revolution that destroys the machinery but the friction henry ward beecher change of pitch produces emphasis this is a highly important statement Variety in pitch maintains the hearer's interest, but one of the surest ways to compel attention, to secure unusual emphasis, is to change the pitch of your voice suddenly and in a marked degree. A great contrast always arouses attention. White shows whiter against black. A cannon roars louder in the Sahara silence than in the Chicago hurly-burly. These are simple illustrations of the power of contrast what is congress going to do next high pitch i do not know low pitch by such sudden change of pitch during a sermon dr newell dwight hillis recently achieved great emphasis and suggested the gravity of the question he had raised the foregoing order of pitch change might be reversed with equally good effect though with a slight change in seriousness either method produces emphasis when used intelligently that is with a common-sense appreciation of the sort of emphasis to be attained in attempting these contrasts of pitch it is important to avoid unpleasant extremes most speakers pitch their voices too high one of the secrets of mr bryan's eloquence is his low bell-like voice 
shakespeare said that a soft gentle low voice was an excellent thing in a woman it is no less so in a man for a voice need not be blatant to be powerful and must not be to be pleasing in closing let us emphasize anew the importance of using variety of pitch you sing up and down the scale first touching one note and then another above or below it do likewise in speaking though thought and individual taste must generally be your guide as to where to use a low a moderate or high pitch questions and exercises one name two methods of destroying monotony and gaining force in speaking two why is a continual change of pitch necessary in speaking three notice your habitual tones in speaking are they too high to be pleasant four do we express the following thoughts and emotions in a low or a high pitch which may be expressed in either high or low pitch excitement victory defeat sorrow love earnestness fear five how would you naturally vary the pitch in introducing an explanatory or parenthetical expression like the following he started that is he made preparations to start on september third six speak the following lines with as marked variations in pitch as your interpretation of the sense may dictate try each line in two different ways which in each instance is the more effective and why what have i to gain from you nothing to engage our nation in such a compact would be an infamy note in the foregoing sentence experiment as to where the change in pitch would better be made once the flowers distilled their fragrance here but now see the devastations of war he had reckoned without one prime factor his conscience seven make a diagram of a conversation you have heard showing where high and low pitches were used were these changes in pitch advisable why or why not eight read the selections on pages thirty four thirty five thirty six thirty seven and thirty eight paying careful attention to the changes in pitch reread substituting low pitch for high and vice versa selections for practice note in the following selections those passages that may best be delivered in a moderate pitch are printed in ordinary roman type those which may be rendered in a high pitch do not make the mistake of raising the voice too high are printed in italics those which might well be spoken in a low pitch are printed in capitals these arrangements however are merely suggestive we cannot make it strong enough that you must use your own judgment in interpreting a selection before doing so however it is well to practice these passages as they are marked yes all men labor rufus choate and daniel webster labor say the critics but every man who reads of the labor question knows that it means the movement of the men that earn their living with their hands that are employed and paid wages are gathered under roofs of factories sent out on farms sent out on ships gathered on the walls in popular acceptation the working class means the men that work with their hands for wages so many hours a day employed by great capitalists that work for everybody else why do we move for this class why asks a critic don't you move for all working men because while daniel webster gets forty thousand dollars for arguing the mexican claims there is no need of anybody's moving for him because while rufus choate gets five thousand dollars for making one argument to a jury there is no need of moving for him or for the men that work with their brains that do highly disciplined and skilled labor invent and write books the reason why the labor movement confines itself to a single class is because that class of work does not get paid does not get protection mental labor is adequately paid and more than adequately protected it can shift its channels it can vary according to the supply and demand if a man fails as a minister why he becomes a railway conductor if that doesn't suit him he goes west and he becomes governor of a territory and if he finds himself incapable of either of these positions 
he comes home and gets to be a city editor. He varies his occupation as he pleases, and doesn't need protection. But the great mass chained to a trade, doomed to be ground up in the mill of supply and demand, that works so many hours a day, and must run in the great ruts of business, they are the men whose inadequate protection, whose unfair share of the general product, claims a movement in their behalf. Wendell Phillips Knowing the price we must pay, the sacrifice we must make, the burdens we must carry, the assaults we must endure, knowing full well the cost, yet we enlist, and we enlist for the war. For we know the justice of our cause, and we know, too, its certain triumph. Not reluctantly, then, but eagerly, not with faint hearts, but strong, do we now advance upon the enemies of the people, for the call that comes to us is the call that came to our fathers. As they responded, so shall we. He hath sounded forth a trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift our souls to answer him, be jubilant our feet. Our God is marching on. Albert J. Beveridge Remember that two sentences, or two parts of the same sentence, which contain changes of thought, cannot possibly be given effectively in the same key. Let us repeat, every big change of thought requires a big change of pitch. What the beginning student will think are big changes of pitch will be monotonously alike. Learn to speak some thoughts in a very high tone, others in a very, very low tone. Develop range. It is almost impossible to use too much of it. Happy am I that this mission has brought my feet at last to press New England's historic soil and my eyes to the knowledge of her beauty and her thrift. Here within touch of Plymouth Rock and Bunker Hill, where Webster thundered and Longfellow sang, Emerson thought and Channing preached, here in the cradle of American letters and almost of American liberty, I hasten to make the obeisance that every American owes New England when first he stands uncovered in her mighty presence. Strange apparition! This stern and unique figure, carved from the ocean and the wilderness, its majesty kindling and growing amid the storms of winter and of wars, until at last the gloom was broken, its beauty disclosed in the sunshine, and the heroic workers rested at its base while startled kings and emperors gazed and marveled that from the rude touch of this handful cast on a bleak and unknown shore should have come the embodied genius of human government and the perfected model of human liberty god bless the memory of those immortal workers and prosper the fortunes of their living sons and perpetuate the inspiration of their handiwork far to the south mr president separated from this section by a line once defined in irrepressible difference, once traced in fratricidal blood, and now, thank God, but a vanishing shadow, lies the fairest and richest domain of this earth. It is the home of a brave and hospitable people. There is centered all that can please or prosper humankind. A perfect climate above a fertile soil yields to the husbandman every product of the temperate zone. There, by night, the cotton whitens beneath the stars, and by day the wheat locks the sunshine in its bearded sheaf. In the same field the clover steals the fragrance of the wind, and tobacco catches the quick aroma of the rains. There are mountains stored with exhaustless treasures, forests vast and primeval, and rivers that, tumbling or loitering, run wanton to the sea. Of the three essential items of all industries, cotton iron and wood that region has easy control in cotton a fixed monopoly in iron proven supremacy in timber the reserve supply of the republic from this assured and permanent advantage against which artificial conditions cannot much longer prevail has grown an amazing system of industries not maintained by human contrivance of tariff or capital afar off from the fullest and cheapest source of supply, but resting in divine assurance, within touch of field and mine and forest, not set amid costly farms from which competition has driven the farmer in despair, but amid cheap and sunny lands, rich with agriculture, 
to which neither season nor soil has set a limit this system of industries is mounting to a splendor that shall dazzle and illumine the world that sir is the picture and the promise of my home a land better and fairer than i have told you and yet but fit setting in its material excellence for the loyal and gentle quality of its citizenship this hour little needs the loyalty that is loyal to one section and yet holds the other in enduring suspicion and estrangement give us the broad and perfect loyalty that loves and trusts georgia alike with massachusetts that knows no south no north no east no west but endears with equal and patriotic love every foot of our soil every state of our union a mighty duty sir and a mighty inspiration impels every one of us tonight to lose in patriotic consecration whatever estranges whatever divides we sir are americans and we stand for human liberty the uplifting voice of the american idea is under every throne on earth france brazil these are our victories to redeem the earth from kingcraft and oppression this is our mission and we shall not fail god has sown in our soil the seed of his millennial harvest and he will not lay the sickle to the ripening crop until his full and perfect day has come our history sir has been a constant and expanding miracle from plymouth rock and jamestown all the way ay even from the hour when from the voiceless and traceless ocean a new world rose to the sight of the inspired sailor as we approach the fourth centennial of that stupendous day when the old world will come to marvel and to learn amid our gathered treasures let us resolve to crown the miracles of our past with the spectacle of a republic compact united indissoluble in the bonds of love loving from the lakes to the gulf the wounds of war healed in every heart as on every hill serene and resplendent at the summit of human achievement and earth glory blazing out the path and making clear the way up which all the nations of the earth must come in god's appointed time henry w grady the race problem i would call him napoleon but napoleon made his way to empire over broken oaths and through a sea of blood this man never broke his word no retaliation was his great motto and the rule of his life and the last words uttered to his son in france were these my boy you will one day go back to santo domingo forget that france murdered your father i would call him cromwell but cromwell was only a soldier and the state he founded went down with him into his grave i would call him washington but the great virginian held slaves this man risked his empire rather than permit the slave trade in the humblest village of his dominions you think me a fanatic tonight for you read history not with your eyes but with your prejudices but fifty years hence when truth gets a hearing the muse of history will put phocion for the greek and brutus for the roman hampton for england lafayette for france choose washington as the bright consummate flower of our earlier civilization and john brown the ripe fruit of our noonday then dipping her pen in the sunlight will write in the clear blue above them all the name of the soldier the statesman the martyr to saint louverture wendell phillips to saint louverture drill on the following selections for change of pitch Beecher's Abraham Lincoln, page 76. Seward's Irrepressible Conflict, page 67. Everett's History of Liberty, page 78. Grady's The Race Problem, page 36. And Beveridge's Past Prosperity Around, page 470. End of section 4. Recording by Joe Mabry at ievoice.com. Section 5 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joe Mabry.
The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Eisenwein. Section 5. Chapter 5. Efficiency Through Change of Pace. Here how he clears the points of faith, we're rattling and thumpin', now meekly calm, now wild in wrath, he's stampin' and he's jumpin'. Robert Burns, Holy Fair. The Latins have bequeathed to us a word that has no precise equivalent in our tongue, therefore we have accepted it, body unchanged. It is the word tempo, and means rate of movement, as measured by the time consumed in executing that movement. Thus far its use has been largely limited to the vocal and musical arts, but it would not be surprising to hear tempo applied to more concrete matters, for it perfectly illustrates the real meaning of the word to say that an ox cart moves in slow tempo, an express train in a fast tempo. Our guns that fire six hundred times a minute shoot at a fast tempo. The old muzzle loader that required three minutes to load shot at a slow tempo. Every musician understands this principle. It requires longer to sing a half note than it does an eighth note. Now tempo is a tremendously important element in good platform work for when a speaker delivers a whole address at very nearly the same rate of speed he is depriving himself of one of his chief means of emphasis and power the baseball pitcher the bowler in cricket the tennis server all know the value of change of pace change of tempo in delivering their ball and so must the public speaker observe its power change of tempo lends naturalness to the delivery Naturalness, or at least seeming naturalness, as was explained in the chapter on monotony, is greatly to be desired, and a continual change of tempo will go a long way towards establishing it. Mr. Howard Lindsay, stage manager for Miss Margaret Anglin, recently said to the present writer that change of pace was one of the most effective tools of the actor. While it must be admitted that the stilted mouthings of many actors indicate cloudy mirrors, still the public speaker would do well to study the actor's use of tempo there is however a more fundamental and effective source at which to study naturalness a trait which once lost is shy of recapture that source is the common conversation of any well-bred circle this is the standard we strive to reach on both stage and platform with certain differences of course which will appear as we go on if speaker and actor were to reproduce with absolute fidelity every variation of utterance, every whisper, grunt, pause, silence, and explosion of conversation as we find it typically in everyday life, much of the interest would leave the public utterance. Naturalness in public address is something more than faithful reproduction of nature. It is the reproduction of those typical parts of nature's work which are truly representative of the whole. The realistic story writer understands this in writing dialogue, and we must take it into account in seeking for naturalness through change of tempo. Suppose you speak the first of the following sentences in a slow tempo, the second quickly, observing how natural is the effect. Then speak both with the same rapidity and note the difference. I can't recall what I did with my knife. Oh, now I remember I gave it to Mary. We see here that a change of tempo often occurs in the same sentence, for tempo applies not only to single words, groups of words, and groups of sentences, but to the major parts of a public speech as well. Questions and Exercises 1. In the following, speak the words long, long while, very slowly. The rest of the sentence is spoken in moderately rapid tempo. When you and I behind the veil are past, oh, but the long, long while the world shall last, which of our coming and departure heeds, as the seven seas should heed a pebble cast. Note, in the following selections, the passages that should be given a fast tempo are in italics. Those that should be given in a slow tempo are in small capitals. Practice these selections, and then try others, changing from fast to slow tempo on different parts, carefully noting the effect. 2. No Mirabeau, Napoleon, Burns, Cromwell, 
no man adequate to do anything but is first of all in right earnest about it what i call a sincere man i should say sincerity a great deep genuine sincerity is the first characteristic of a man in any way heroic not the sincerity that calls itself sincere ah no that is a very poor matter indeed a shallow braggart conscious sincerity oftenest self-conceit mainly the great man's sincerity is of a kind he cannot speak of is not conscious of thomas carlyle three true worth is in being not seeming in doing each day that goes by some little good not in dreaming of great things to do by and by for whatever men say in their blindness and in spite of the follies of youth there is nothing so kingly as kindness and nothing so royal as truth anonymous four to get a natural effect where would you use slow and wear fast tempo in the following fool's gold see him there cold and gray watch him as he tries to play no he doesn't know the way he began to learn too late she's a grim old hag is fate for she let him have his pile smiling to herself the while knowing what the cost would be when he'd found the golden key multimillionaire is he many times more rich than we but at that i wouldn't trade with the bargain that he made came here many years ago not a person did he know had the money hunger bad mad for money piggish mad didn't let a joy divert him didn't let a sorrow hurt him let his friends and kin desert him while he planned and plugged and hurried on his quest for gold and power every single wakeful hour with the money thought he'd dower all the while as he grew older and grew bolder he grew colder and he thought that some day he would take the time to play but say he was wrong life's a song in the spring youth can sing and can fling but joys wing when we're older like birds when it's colder the roses were red as he went rushing by and glorious tapestries hung in the sky and the clover was waving neath honey-bees slaving a bird over there round delayed a soft air but the man couldn't spare time for gathering flowers or resting in bowers or gazing at skies that gladdened the eyes so he kept on and swept on through mean sordid years now he's up to his ears in the choicest of stocks he owns endless blocks of houses and shops and the stream never stops pouring into his banks i suppose that he ranks pretty near to the top what i have wouldn't sop his ambition one tittle and yet with my little i don't care to trade with the bargain he made just watch him to-day see him trying to play he's come back for blue skies but they're in a new guise winter's here all is gray the birds are away the meadows are brown the leaves lie aground and the gay brook that wound with a swirling and whirling of waters is furling its bosom in ice and he hasn't the price with all of his gold to buy what he sold he knows now the cost of the springtime he lost of the flowers he tossed from his way and say he'd pay any price if the day could be made not so gray he can't play herbert kaufman used by permission of everybody's magazine change of tempo prevents monotony the canary in the cage before the window is adding to the beauty and charm of his singing by a continual change of tempo if king solomon had been an orator he undoubtedly would have gathered wisdom from the song of the wild birds as well as from the bees imagine a song written with but quarter notes imagine an auto with only one speed exercises one note the change of tempo indicated in the following and how it gives a pleasing variety read it aloud fast tempo is indicated by italics slow by small capitals and he thought that some day he would take the time to play but say he was wrong life's a song in the spring youth can sing and can fling but joys wing when we're older like the birds when it's colder 
the roses were red as he went rushing by and glorious tapestries hung in the sky two turn to fool's gold on page forty two and deliver it in an unvaried tempo note how monotonous is the result this poem requires a great many changes of tempo and is an excellent one for practice three use the changes of tempo indicated in the following noting how they prevent monotony where no change of tempo is indicated use a moderate speed too much of variety would really be a return to monotony the mob a mob kills the wrong man was flashed in the newspaper headline lately the mob is an irresponsible unthinking mass it always destroys but never constructs it criticizes but never creates utter a great truth and the mob will hate you see how it condemned dante to exile encounter the dangers of the unknown world for its benefit and the mob will declare you crazy it ridiculed columbus and for discovering a new world gave him prison and chains write a poem to thrill human hearts with pleasure and the mob will allow you to go hungry the blind homer begged bread through the streets invent a machine to save labor and the mob will declare you its enemy less than a hundred years ago a furious rabble smashed timonier's invention the sewing machine build a steamship to carry merchandise and accelerate travel and the mob will call you a fool a mob lined the shores of the hudson river to laugh at the maiden attempt of fulton's folly as they called his little steamboat emerson says a mob is a society of bodies voluntarily bereaving themselves of reason and traversing its work the mob is man voluntarily descended to the nature of the beast its fit hour of activity is night its actions are insane like its whole constitution it persecutes a principle it would whip a right it would tar and feather justice by inflicting fire and outrage upon the house and persons of those who have these the mob spirit stalks abroad in our land today. Every week gives a fresh victim to its malignant cry for blood. There were 48 persons killed by mobs in the United States in 1913, 64 in 1912, and 71 in 1911. Among the 48 last year were a woman and a child. Two victims were proven innocent after their death in 399 bc a demagogue appealed to the popular mob to have socrates put to death and he was sentenced to the hemlock cup fourteen hundred years afterward an enthusiast appealed to the popular mob and all europe plunged into the holy land to kill and mangle the heathen in the seventeenth century a demagogue appealed to the ignorance of men and twenty people were executed at salem mass within six months for witchcraft Two thousand years ago the mob yelled, Release unto us Barabbas, and Barabbas was a murderer. From an editorial by D.C. in Leslie's Weekly, by permission. Present-day business is as unlike old-time business as the old-time ox cart is unlike the present-day locomotive. Invention has made the whole world over again. The railroad, telegraph, telephone, have bound the people of modern nations into families to do the business of those closely knit millions in every modern country great business concerns came into being what we call big business is the child of the economic progress of mankind so warfare to destroy big business is foolish because it cannot succeed and wicked because it ought not to succeed warfare to destroy big business does not hurt big business which always comes out on top so much as it hurts all other business which in such a warfare never come out on top a j beveridge change of tempo produces emphasis any big change of tempo is emphatic and will catch the attention you may scarcely be conscious that a passenger train is moving when it is flying over the rails at ninety miles an hour but if it slows down very suddenly to a ten-mile gait your attention will be drawn to it very decidedly 
you may forget that you are listening to music as you dine but let the orchestra either increase or diminish its tempo in a very marked degree and your attention will be arrested at once this same principle will procure emphasis in a speech if you have a point that you want to bring home to your audience forcefully make a sudden and great change of tempo and they will be powerless to keep from paying attention to that point recently the present writer saw a play in which these lines were spoken quote, i don't want you to forget what i said i want you to remember it the longest day you i don't care if you've got six guns End quote. the part up to the dash was delivered in a very slow tempo the remainder was named out at lightning speed as the character who was spoken to drew a revolver the effect was so emphatic that the lines are remembered six months afterwards while most of the play has faded from memory the student who has powers of observation will see this principle applied by all our best actors in their efforts to get emphasis where emphasis is due but remember that the emotion in the matter must warrant the same intensity in the manner or the effect will be ridiculous too many public speakers are impressive over nothing thought rather than rules must govern you while practicing change of pace it is often a matter of no consequence which part of a sentence is spoken slowly and which is given in fast tempo the main thing to be desired is the change itself for example in the selection the mob on page forty six note the last paragraph reverse the instructions given delivering everything that is marked for slow tempo quickly and everything that is marked for quick tempo slowly you will note that the force or meaning of the passage has not been destroyed however many passages cannot be changed to a slow tempo without destroying their force instances the patrick henry speech on page one ten and the following passage from whittier's barefoot boy oh for boyhood's time of june crowding years in one brief moon when all things i heard or saw me their master waited for i was rich in flowers and trees hummingbirds and honey-bees for my sport the squirrel played plied the snouted mole his spade for my taste the blackberry cone purpled over hedge and stone laughed the brook for my delight through the day and through the night whispering at the garden wall talked with me from fall to fall mine the sand-rimmed pickerel pond mine the walnut slopes beyond mine and bending orchard trees apples of hesperides still as my horizon grew larger grew my riches too all the world i saw or knew seemed a complex chinese toy fashioned for a barefoot boy j g whittier be careful in regulating your tempo not to get your movement too fast this is a common fault with amateur speakers mrs siddons rule was take time a hundred years ago there was used in medical circles a preparation known as the shotgun remedy it was a mixture of about fifty different ingredients and was given to the patient in the hope that at least one of them would prove efficacious that seems a rather poor scheme for medical practice but it is good to use shotgun tempo for most speeches as it gives a variety tempo like diet is best when mixed Questions and Exercises 1. Define tempo. 2. What words come from the same root? 3. What is meant by a change of tempo? 4. What effects are gained by it? 5. Name three methods of destroying monotony and gaining force in speaking. 6. Note the changes of tempo in a conversation or speech that you hear. Were they well made? Why? Illustrate. 7. Read selections on pages 34, 35, 36, 37, and 38, paying careful attention to change of tempo. 8. As a rule, excitement, joy, or intense anger take a fast tempo while sorrow and sentiments of great dignity or solemnity tend to a slow tempo try to deliver lincoln's gettysburg speech page fifty in a fast tempo or patrick henry's speech page one ten in a slow tempo and note how ridiculous the effect will be 
Practice the following selections, noting carefully where the tempo may be changed to advantage. Experiment, making numerous changes. Which one do you like best? Dedication of Gettysburg Cemetery Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation, or any nation so conceived and so dedicated, can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We are met to dedicate a portion of it as the final resting place of those who have given their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But, in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it, far above our power to add or to detract. The world will very little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work that they have thus far so nobly carried on. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they here gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that the nation shall, under God, have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Abraham Lincoln A Plea for Cuba this deliberative oration was delivered by Senator Thurston in the United States Senate on March 24, 1898. It is recorded in full in the Congressional record of that date. Mrs. Thurston died in Cuba. As a dying request, she urged her husband, who was investigating affairs in the island, to do his utmost to induce the United States to intervene. Hence this oration. Mr. President, I am here by command of silent lips to speak once and for all upon the Cuban situation. I shall endeavor to be honest, conservative, and just. I have no purpose to stir the public passion to any action not necessary and imperative to meet the duties and necessities of American responsibility, Christian humanity, and national honor. I would shirk this task if I could, but I dare not. I cannot satisfy my conscience except by speaking and speaking now. I went to Cuba firmly believing that the condition of affairs there had been greatly exaggerated by the press, and my own efforts were directed in the first instance to the attempted exposure of these supposed exaggerations. There has undoubtedly been much sensationalism in the journalism of the time, but as to the condition of affairs in Cuba there has been no exaggeration, because exaggeration has been impossible. Under the inhuman policy of Weiler, not less than 400,000 self-supporting, simple, peaceable, defenseless country people were driven from their homes in the agricultural portions of the Spanish provinces to the cities, and imprisoned upon the barren waste outside the residence portions of these cities and within the lines of entrenchment established a little way beyond. Their humble homes were burned, their fields laid waste, their implements of husbandry destroyed their livestock and food supplies for the most part confiscated. Most of the people were old men, women, and children. They were thus placed in hopeless imprisonment, without shelter or food. There was no work for them in the cities to which they were driven. They were left with nothing to depend upon except the scanty charity of the inhabitants of the cities, and with slow starvation their inevitable fate. The pictures in the American newspapers of the starving reconcentrados are true. They can all be duplicated by the thousands. I never before saw, and please God I may never again see, so deplorable a sight as the reconcentrados in the suburbs of Matanzas. I can never forget to my dying day the hopeless anguish in their despairing eyes. Huddled about their little bark huts, they raised no voice of appeal to us for alms as we went among them. Men, women, and children stand silent, famishing with hunger. Their only appeal comes from their sad eyes, 
through which one looks as through an open window into their agonizing souls. The government of Spain has not appropriated and will not appropriate one dollar to save these people. They are now being attended and nursed and administered to by the charity of the United States. Think of the spectacle. We are feeding these citizens of Spain. We are nursing their sick. We are saving such as can be saved. And yet there are those who still say it is right for us to send food, but we must keep hands off. I say that the time has come when muskets ought to go with the food. We asked the governor if he knew of any relief for these people except through the charity of the United States. He did not. We asked him, When do you think the time will come that these people can be placed in a position of self-support? He replied to us with deep feeling, Only the good God or the great government of the United States will answer that question. I hope and believe that the good God by the great government of the United States will answer that question. I shall refer to these horrible things no further. They are there. God pity me, I have seen them. They will remain in my mind forever, and this is almost the twentieth century. Christ died nineteen hundred years ago, and Spain is a Christian nation. She has set up more crosses in more lands, beneath more skies, and under them has butchered more people than all the other nations of the earth combined. Europe may tolerate her existence as long as the people of the old world wish. God grant that before another Christmas morning the last vestige of Spanish tyranny and oppression will have vanished from the Western Hemisphere. The time for action has come. No greater reason for it can exist tomorrow than exists today. Every hour's delay only adds another chapter to the awful story of misery and death. Only one power can intervene, the United States of America. Ours is the one great nation in the world, the mother of American republics. She holds a position of trust and responsibility toward the peoples and affairs of the whole Western Hemisphere. It was her glorious example which inspired the patriots of Cuba to raise the flag of liberty in her eternal hills. We cannot refuse to accept this responsibility which the God of the universe has placed upon us as the one great power in the new world. We must act. What shall our action be? Against the intervention of the United States in this holy cause there is but one voice of dissent. That voice is the voice of the money-changers. They fear war. Not because of any Christian or ennobling sentiment against war and in favor of peace, but because they fear that a declaration of war, or the intervention which might result in war, would have a depressing effect upon the stock market. Let them go. They do not represent American sentiment, they do not represent American patriotism. Let them take their chances as they can. Their weal or woe is of but little importance to the liberty-loving people of the United States. They will not do the fighting, their blood will not flow. They will keep on dealing in options on human life. Let the men whose loyalty is to the dollar stand aside while the men whose loyalty is to the flag come to the front. Mr. President, there is only one action possible, if any is taken, that is, intervention for the independence of the island. But we cannot intervene and save Cuba without the exercise of force, and force means war. War means blood. The lowly Nazarene on the shores of Galilee preached the divine doctrine of love, peace on earth, good will toward men. Not peace on earth at the expense of liberty and humanity. Not good will toward men who despoil, enslave, degrade, and starve to death their fellow men. I believe in the doctrine of Christ. I believe in the doctrine of peace. But, Mr. President, men must have liberty before there can come abiding peace. Intervention means force. Force means war. War means blood. But it will be God's force. When has a battle for humanity and liberty ever been won except by force? What barricade of wrong, injustice, and oppression has ever been carried except by force? Force compelled the signature of unwilling royalty to the great Magna Carta. Force put life into the Declaration of Independence and made effective the Emancipation Proclamation. Force beat with naked hands upon the iron gateway of the Bastille and made reprisal in one awful hour for centuries of kingly crime. Force waved the flag of revolution over Bunker Hill and marked the snows of Valley Forge with blood-stained feet. Force held the broken line of Shiloh, 
climbed the flame-swept hill at chattanooga and stormed the clouds on lookout heights force marched with sherman to the sea rode with sheridan in the valley of the shenandoah and gave grant victory at appomattox force saved the union kept the stars in the flag made niggers men the time for god's force has come again let the impassioned lips of american patriots once more take up the song in the beauty of the lilies christ was born across the sea with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me as he died to make men holy let us die to make men free while god is marching on others may hesitate others may procrastinate others may plead for further diplomatic negotiation which means delay but for me i am ready to act now and for my action i am ready to answer to my conscience my country and my god james mellon thurston end of section five Recording by Joe Mabry at ievoice.com Section 6 of The Art of Public Speaking This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Reese the Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Eisenwein Section 6. Pause and Power The true business of the literary artist is to plate or weave his meaning, involving it around itself, so that each sentence by successive phrases shall first come into a kind of knot, and then, after a moment of suspended meaning, solve and clear itself. George Saintsbury on English Prose Style in miscellaneous essays pause has a distinctive value expressed in silence in other words while the voice is waiting the music of the movement is going on to manage it with its delicacies and compensations requires that same fineness of ear on which we must depend for all faultless prose rhythm when there is no compensation when the pause is inadvertent there is a sense of jolting and lack, as if some pin or fastening had fallen out. John Franklin Genung, The Working Principles of Rhetoric Pause in public speech is not mere silence. It is silence made designedly eloquent. When a man says, I, uh, it is with profound, uh, pleasure that, er, uh, I have been permitted to speak to you tonight and, uh, uh, I should say, er, that is not pausing, that is stumbling. It is conceivable that a speaker may be effective in spite of stumbling, but never because of it. On the other hand, one of the most important means of developing power in public speaking is to pause either before or after, or both before and after, an important word or phrase. No one who would be a forceful speaker can afford to neglect this principle one of the most significant that has ever been inferred from listening to great orators. Study this potential device until you have absorbed and assimilated it. It would seem that this principle of rhetorical pause ought to be easily grasped and applied, but a long experience in training both college men and maturer speakers has demonstrated that the device is no more readily understood by the average man when it is first explained to him than if it were spoken in Hindustani. Perhaps this is because we do not eagerly devour the fruit of experience when it is impressively set before us on the platter of authority. We like to pluck fruit for ourselves. It not only tastes better, but we never forget that tree. Fortunately, this is no difficult task in this instance, for the trees stand thick all about us. One man is pleading the cause of another. This man, my friends, has made this wonderful sacrifice for you and me. Did not the pause surprisingly enhance the power of this statement? See how he gathered up reserve force and impressiveness to deliver the words, for you and me. Repeat this passage without making a pause. Did it lose in effectiveness? Naturally enough, during a premeditated pause of this kind, the mind of the speaker is concentrated on the thought to which he is about to give expression. He will not dare to allow his thoughts to wander for an instant. 
he will rather supremely center his thought and his emotion upon the sacrifice whose service, sweetness, and divinity he is enforcing by his appeal. Concentration, then, is the big word here. No pause without it can perfectly hit the mark. Efficient pausing accomplishes one or all of four results. 1. Pause enables the mind of the speaker to gather his forces before delivering the final volley. It is often dangerous to rush into battle without pausing for preparation or waiting for recruits. Consider Custer's Massacre as an instance. You can light a match by holding it beneath a lens and concentrating the sun's rays. You would not expect the match to flame if you jerked the lens back and forth quickly. Pause, and the lens gathers heat. Your thoughts will not set fire to the minds of your hearers unless you pause to gather the force that comes by a second or two of concentration. Maple trees and gas wells are rarely tapped continually. When a stronger flow is wanted, a pause is made. Nature has time to gather her reserve forces, and when the tree or the well is reopened, a stronger flow is the result. Use the same common sense with your mind. If you would make a thought particularly effective, pause just before its utterance. Concentrate your mind energies, and then give it expression with renewed vigor. Carlyle was right. Speak not. I passionately entreat thee, till thy thought has silently matured itself. Out of silence comes thy strength. Speech is silvern, silence is golden. Speech is human, silence is divine. Silence has been called the father of speech. It should be. Too many of our public speeches have no fathers. They ramble along without pause or break. Like Tennyson's brook, they run on forever. Listen to little children, the policeman on the corner, the family conversation around the table, and see how many pauses they naturally use, for they are unconscious of effects. When we get before an audience, we throw most of our natural methods of expression to the wind, and strive after artificial effects. Get back to the methods of nature, and pause. 2. Pause prepares the mind of the auditor to receive your message. Herbert Spencer said that all the universe is in motion. So it is, and all perfect motion is rhythm. Part of rhythm is rest. Rest follows activity all through nature. Instances, day and night, spring, summer, autumn, winter. A period of rest between breaths, an instant of complete rest between heartbeats. Pause and give the attention powers of your audience a rest. What you say after such a silence will then have a great deal more effect. When your country cousins come to town, the noise of a passing car will awaken them, though it seldom affects a seasoned city dweller. By the continual passing of cars, his attention power has become deadened. In one who visits the city but seldom, attention value is insistent. To him the noise comes after a long pause, hence its power. To you, dweller in the city, there is no pause, hence the low attention value. After riding on a train several hours, you will become so accustomed to its roar that it will lose its attention value, unless the train should stop for a while and start again. If you attempt to listen to a clock tick that is so far away that you can barely hear it, you will find that at times you are unable to distinguish it, but in a few moments the sound becomes distinct again. Your mind will pause for rest, whether you desire it to or not. The attention of your audience will act in quite the same way. Recognize this law and prepare for it, by pausing. Let it be repeated, the thought that follows a pause is much more dynamic than if no pause had occurred. What is said to you of a night will not have the same effect on your mind as if it had been uttered in the morning, when your attention had been lately refreshed by the pause of sleep. We are told on the first page of the Bible that even the creative energy of God rested on the seventh day. You may be sure, then, that the frail, finite mind of your audience will likewise demand rest. Observe nature, study her laws, and obey them in your speaking. 3. Pause creates effective suspense. Suspense is responsible for a great share of our interest in life. It will be the same with your speech. A play or a novel is often robbed of much of its interest if you know the plot beforehand. We like to keep guessing as to the outcome. The ability to create suspense is part of woman's power to hold the other sex. 
The circus acrobat employs this principle when he fails purposely in several attempts to perform a feat, and then achieves it. Even the deliberate manner in which he arranges the preliminaries increases our expectation. We like to be kept waiting. In the last act of the play, Polly of the Circus, there is a circus scene in which a little dog turns a backward somersault on the back of a running pony. One night, when he hesitated, and had to be coaxed and worked with a long time before he would perform his feat, he got a great deal more applause than when he did his trick at once. We not only like to wait, but we appreciate what we wait for. If fish bite too readily, the sport soon ceases to be a sport. It is the same principle of suspense that holds you in a Sherlock Holmes story. You wait to see how the mystery is solved, and if it is solved too soon, you throw down the tale unfinished. Wilkie Collins' receipt for fiction writing well applies to public speech. Make them laugh, make them weep, make them wait. Above all else, make them wait. If they will not do that, you may be sure they will neither laugh nor weep. Thus pause is a valuable instrument in the hands of a trained speaker to arouse and maintain suspense. We once heard Mr. Bryan say in a speech, It was my privilege to hear. And he paused, while the audience wondered for a second whom it was his privilege to hear. The great evangelist. And he paused again. We knew a little more about the man he had heard, but still wondered to which evangelist he referred. And then he concluded. Dwight L. Moody. Mr. Bryan paused slightly again and continued. I came to regard him. Here he paused again, and held the audience in a brief moment of suspense as to how he had regarded Mr. Moody. Then continued. As the greatest preacher of his day. Let the dashes illustrate pauses, and we have the following. It was my privilege to hear. The great evangelist. Dwight L. Moody. I came to regard him as the greatest preacher of his day. The unskilled speaker would have rattled this off with neither pause nor suspense, and the sentences would have fallen flat upon the audience. It is precisely the application of these small things that makes much of the difference between the successful and the unsuccessful speaker. 4. Pausing after an important idea gives it time to penetrate. Any Missouri farmer will tell you that a rain that falls too fast will run off into the creeks and do the crops but little good. A story is told of a country deacon praying for rain in this manner. Lord, don't send us any chunk floater. Just give us a good old drizzle-drazzle. A speech, like a rain, will not do anybody much good if it comes too fast to soak in. The farmer's wife follows the same principle in doing her washing when she puts the clothes in water and pauses for several hours that the water may soak in. The physician puts cocaine on your turbinates, and pauses to let it take hold before he removes them. Why do we use this principle everywhere except in the communication of ideas? If you have given the audience a big idea, pause for a second or two, and let them turn it over. See what effect it has. After the smoke clears away, you may have to fire another 14-inch shell on the same subject before you demolish the citadel of error that you are trying to destroy. Take time. Don't let your speech resemble those tourists who try to do New York in a day. They spend 15 minutes looking at the masterpieces in the Metropolitan Museum of Arts, 10 minutes in the Museum of Natural History, take a peep into the aquarium, hurry across the Brooklyn Bridge, rush up to the zoo, and back by Grant's tomb, and call that seeing New York. If you hasten by your important points without pausing, your audience will have just about as adequate an idea of what you have tried to convey. Take time. You have just as much of it as our richest multimillionaire. Your audience will wait for you. It is a sign of smallness to hurry. The great redwood trees of California had burst through the soil five hundred years before Socrates drank his cup of hemlock poison, and are only in their prime today. Nature shames us with our petty haste. Silence is one of the most eloquent things in the world. Master it, and use it through pause. In the following selections, dashes have been inserted where pauses may be used effectively. Naturally, you may omit some of these and insert others without going wrong. One speaker would interpret a passage in one way, one in another. It is largely a matter of personal preference. 
a dozen great actors have played Hamlet well, and yet each has played the part differently. Which comes nearest to perfection is a question of opinion. You will succeed best by daring to follow your own course, if you are individual enough to blaze an original trail. A moment's halt. A momentary taste of being from the well amid the waste. And lo, the phantom caravan has reached the nothing it set out from. Oh, make haste. The worldly hope men set their hearts upon turns ashes or it prospers. And anon, like snow upon the desert's dusty face, lighting a little hour or two, is gone. The bird of time has but a little way to flutter, and the bird is on the wing. You will note that the punctuation marks have nothing to do with the pausing. You may run by a period very quickly, and make a long pause where there is no kind of punctuation. Thought is greater than punctuation. It must guide you in your pauses. A book of verses underneath the bough. A jug of wine, a loaf of bread. And thou beside me singing in the wilderness. Oh, wilderness were paradise now. You must not confuse the pause for emphasis with the natural pauses that come through taking breath and phrasing. For example, note the pauses indicated in this selection from Byron. But hush! Hark! That deep sound breaks in once more. And nearer! Clearer! Deadlier than before! Arm! Arm! It is! It is the cannon's opening roar! It is not necessary to dwell at length upon these obvious distinctions. You will observe that in natural conversation our words are gathered into clusters or phrases, and we often pause to take breath between them. So in public speech, breathe naturally, and do not talk until you must gasp for breath, nor until the audience is equally winded. A serious word of caution here must be uttered. Do not overwork the pause. To do so will make your speech heavy and stilted and do not think that pause can transmute commonplace thoughts into great and dignified utterance. A grand manner combined with insignificant ideas is like harnessing a Hamiltonian with an ass. You remember the farcical old school declamation, A Midnight Murder, that proceeded in grandiose manner to a thrilling climax and ended, and relentlessly murdered a mosquito. The pause, dramatically handled, always drew a laugh from the tolerant hearers. This is all very well in farce, but such anticlimax becomes painful when the speaker falls from the sublime to the ridiculous quite unintentionally. The pause, to be effective in some other manner than in that of the boomerang, must precede or follow a thought that is really worth while, or at least an idea whose bearing upon the rest of the speech is important. William Pittenger relates in his volume, Extempore Speech, an instance of the unconsciously farcical use of the pause by a really great American statesman and orator. He had visited Niagara Falls and was to make an oration at Buffalo the same day, but, unfortunately, he sat too long over the wine at dinner. When he arose to speak, the oratorical instinct struggled with difficulties, as he declared, Gentlemen, I have been to look upon your mag... mag... magnificent cataract, one hundred... and forty seven feet high. Gentlemen, Greece and Rome in their palmiest days never had a cataract one hundred and forty seven feet high. Questions and Exercises 1. Name four methods for destroying monotony and gaining power in speaking. 2. What are the four special effects of pause? 3. Note the pauses in a conversation, play, or speech. Were they the best that could have been used? Illustrate. 4. Read aloud selections on pages 50 through 54, paying special attention to pause. 
5. Read the following without making any pauses. Reread correctly and note the difference. Soon the night will pass, and when, of the sentinel on the ramparts of liberty, the anxious ask, Watchman, what of the night? His answer will be, Lo, the morn appeareth. Knowing the price we must pay, the sacrifice we must take, the burdens we must carry, the assaults we must endure. Knowing full well the cost, yet we enlist, and we enlist for the war. For we know the justice of our cause, and we know, too, its certain triumph. Not reluctantly, then, but eagerly, not with faint hearts, but strong, do we now advance upon the enemies of the people. For the call that comes to us is the call that came to our fathers. As they responded, so shall we. He hath sounded forth a trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. O oh, be swift, our souls, to answer him. Be jubilant, our feet. Our God is marching on. Albert J. Beveride, from his speech as temporary chairman of Progressive National Convention, Chicago, 1912. 6. Bring out the contrasting ideas in the following by using the pause. Contrast now the circumstances of your life and mine, gently and with temper, Aeschines, and then ask these people whose fortune they would each of them prefer. You taught reading. I went to school. You performed initiations. I received them. You danced in the chorus. I furnished it. You were assembly clerk. I was a speaker. You acted third parts. I heard you. You broke down, and I hissed. You have worked as a statesman for the enemy, I for my country. I passed by the rest, but this very day I am on my probation for a crown, and am acknowledged to be innocent of all offense, while you are already judged to be a pettifogger. And the question is whether you shall continue that trade, or, at once, be silenced by not getting a fifth part of the votes. A happy fortune, do you see, you have enjoyed, that you should denounce mine as miserable. Demosthenes 7. After careful study and practice, mark the pauses in the following. The past rises before me like a dream. Again we are in the great struggle for national life. We hear the sounds of preparation the music of the boisterous drums, the silver voices of heroic bugles. We see thousands of assemblages, and hear the appeals of orators. We see the pale cheeks of women and the flushed faces of men. And, in those assemblages, we see all the dead, whose dust we have covered with flowers. We lose sight of them no more. We are with them when they enlist in the great army of freedom. We see them part from those they love. Some are walking for the last time in quiet woody places with the maiden they adore. We hear the whisperings and the sweet vows of eternal love as they lingeringly part, forever. Others are bending over cradles, kissing babies that are asleep. Some are receiving the blessings of old men. Some are parting from those who hold them and press them to their hearts again and again and say nothing and some are talking with wives, and endeavoring with brave words spoken in the old tones to drive from their hearts the awful fear. We see them part. We see the wife standing in the door, with the babe in her arms, standing in the sunlight sobbing. At the turn of the road, a hand waves. She answers by holding high in her loving hands the child. He is gone, and forever. Robert J. Ingersoll, to the Soldiers of Indianapolis. 8. Where would you pause in the following selections? Try pausing in different places and note the effect it gives. The moving finger writes, and having writ moves on. Nor all your piety nor wit shall lure it back to cancel half a line, nor all your tears wash out a word of it. 
the history of womankind is a story of abuse. For ages men beat, sold, and abused their wives and daughters like cattle. The Spartan mother that gave birth to one of her own sex disgraced herself. The girl babies were often deserted in the mountains to starve. China bound and deformed their feet. Turkey veiled their faces. America denied them equal educational advantages with men. Most of the world still refuses them the right to participate in the government, and everywhere women bear the brunt of an unequal standard of morality. But the women are on the march. They are walking upward to the sunlit plains where the thinking people rule. China has ceased binding their feet. In the shadow of the harem, Turkey has opened a school for girls. America has given women equal educational advantages, and America, we believe, will enfranchise them. We can do little to help, and not much to hinder, this great movement. The thinking people have put their OK upon it. It is moving forward to its goal just as surely as this old earth is swinging from the grip of winter toward the spring's blossoms and the summer's harvest. From an editorial by D.C. in Leslie's Weekly, June 4, 1914. Used by permission. 9. Read aloud the following address, paying careful attention to pause wherever the emphasis may thereby be heightened. The Irrepressible Conflict At last, the Republican Party has appeared. It avows now, as the Republican Party of 1800 did, in one word, its faith and its works. Equal and exact justice to all men. Even when it first entered the field, only half organized, it struck a blow which only just failed to secure complete and triumphant victory. In this, its second campaign, it has already won advantages which render that triumph now both easy and certain. The secret of its assured success lies in that very characteristic which, in the mouth of scoffers, constitutes its great and lasting imbecility and reproach. It lies in the fact that it is a party of one idea, but that is a noble one, an idea that fills and expands all generous souls, the idea of equality of all men before human tribunals and human laws, as they are all equal before the divine tribunal and divine laws. I know, and you know, that a revolution has begun. I know, and all the world knows, that revolutions never go backward. Twenty senators and a hundred representatives proclaim boldly in Congress today sentiments and opinions and principles of freedom, which hardly so many men, even in this free state, dared to utter in their own homes twenty years ago. While the government of the United States, under the conduct of the Democratic Party, has been all that time surrendering one plain and castle after another to slavery, the people of the United States have been no less steadily and perseveringly gathering together the forces with which to recover back again all the fields and all the castles which have been lost, and to confound and overthrow, by one decisive blow, the betrayers of the Constitution and freedom, forever. W. H. Seward End of Section 6 Recording by Matthew Rees, Davenport, Iowa Section 7 of The Art of Public Speaking This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Eisenwein Section 7. Efficiency Through Inflection How soft the music of those village bells falling at intervals upon the ear in cadence sweet, now dying all away, now pealing loud again and louder still, clear and sonorous as the gale comes on, with easy force it opens all the cells where memory slept. William Cowper, The Task Herbert Spencer remarked that cadence, by which he meant the modulation of the tones of the voice in speaking, is the running commentary of the emotions 
upon the propositions of the intellect. How true this is will appear when we reflect that the little upward and downward shadings of the voice tell more truly what we mean than our words. The expressiveness of language is literally multiplied by this subtle power to shade the vocal tones and this voice shading we call inflection. The change of pitch within a word is even more important because more delicate than the change of pitch from phrase to phrase. Indeed, one cannot be practiced without the other. The bare words are only so many bricks. Inflection will make them a pavement, a garage, or a cathedral. It is the power of inflection to change the meaning of words that gave birth to the old saying, It is not so much what you say as how you say it. Mrs. Jameson, the Shakespearean commentator, has given us a penetrating example of the effect of inflection. In her impersonation of the part of Lady Macbeth, Mrs. Siddons adopted successively three different intonations in giving the words, We fail. At first, a quick, contemptuous interrogation. We fail? Afterwards, with the note of admiration. We fail. An accent of indignant astonishment laying the principal emphasis on the word we. We fail? Lastly, she fixed on what I am convinced is the true reading. We fail. With the simple period, modulating the voice to a deep, low, resolute tone, which settles the issue at once as though she had said, if we fail, why, then we fail, and all is over. This most expressive element in our speech is the last to be mastered in attaining to naturalness in speaking a foreign language, and its correct use is the main element in a natural, flexible utterance of our native tongue. Without varied inflections, speech becomes wooden and monotonous. There are but two kinds of inflection, the rising and the falling. Yet these two may be so shaded or so combined that they are capable of producing as many varieties of modulation as may be illustrated by either one or two lines, straight or curved, thus. Sharp rising long rising level long falling sharp falling sharp rising and falling sharp falling and rising hesitating these may be varied indefinitely and serve merely to illustrate what wide varieties of combination may be affected by these two simple inflections of the voice. It is impossible to tabulate the various inflections which serve to express various shades of thought and feeling. A few suggestions are offered here, together with abundant exercises for practice. But the only real way to master inflection is to observe, experiment, and practice. For example, take the common sentence. Oh, he's all right. Note how a rising inflection may be made to express faint praise, or polite doubt, or uncertainty of opinion. Then note how the same word, spoken with a generally falling inflection, may denote certainty, or good-natured approval, or enthusiastic praise, and so on. In general, then, we find that a bending upward of the voice will suggest doubt and uncertainty, 
while a decided falling inflection will suggest that you are certain of your ground. Students dislike to be told that their speeches are not so bad, spoken with a rising inflection. To enunciate these words with a long falling inflection would endorse the speech rather heartily. Not so bad. Say goodbye to an imaginary person whom you expect to see again tomorrow, then to a dear friend you never expect to meet again. Note the difference in inflection. I have had a delightful time when spoken at the termination of a formal tea by a frivolous woman takes altogether different inflection than the same words spoken between lovers who have enjoyed themselves. Mimic the two characters in repeating this, and observe the difference. Note how light and short the inflections are in the following brief quotation from Anthony the Absolute by Samuel Mervyn. At C. March 28th. This evening I told Sir Robert what's-his-name he was a fool. I was quite right in this. He is. Every evening since the ship left Vancouver he has presided over the round table in the middle of the smoking-room. There he sips his coffee and liqueur and holds forth on every subject known to the mind of man. Each subject is his subject. He is an elderly person with a bad face and a drooping left eyelid. They tell me that he is in the British service, a judge somewhere down in Malaysia where they drink more than is good for them. Deliver the two following selections with great earnestness, and note how the inflections differ from the foregoing. Then reread these selections in a light, superficial manner, noting that the change of attitude is expressed through a change of inflection. When I read a sublime fact in Plutarch, or an unselfish deed in a line of poetry, or thrill beneath some heroic legend, it is no longer fairyland. I have seen it matched. Wendell Phillips Thought is deeper than all speech, feeling deeper than all thought. Souls to souls can never teach what unto themselves was taught. Cranch It must be made perfectly clear that inflection deals mostly in subtle, delicate shading within single words and is not by any means accomplished by a general rise or fall in the voice in speaking a sentence. Yet certain sentences may be effectively delivered with just such inflection. Try this sentence in several ways, making no modulation until you come to the last two syllables, as indicated. And yet I told him distinctly, and yet I told him this Distinctly. And yet I told him distinctly. Now try this sentence by inflecting the important words so as to bring out various shades of meaning. The first forms illustrated show change of pitch within a single word. The forms you will work out for yourself should show a number of such inflections throughout the sentence. One of the chief means of securing emphasis is to employ a long falling inflection on the emphatic words, that is, to let the voice fall to a lower pitch on an interior vowel sound in a word. Try it on the words every elimocenary and destroy. 
use long falling inflections on the italicized words in the following selection noting their emphatic power are there any other words here that long falling inflections would help to make expressive address in the dartmouth college case this sir is my case it is the case not merely of that humble institution it is the case of every college in our land it is more it is the case of every elemosynary institution throughout our country of all those great charities founded by the piety of our ancestors to alleviate human misery and scatter blessings along the pathway of life sir you may destroy this little institution it is weak it is in your hands i know it is one of the lesser lights in the literary horizon of our country you may put it out but if you do you must carry through your work you must extinguish one after another all those great lights of science which for more than a century have thrown their radiance over our land it is sir as i have said a small college and yet there are those who love it sir i know not how others may feel but as for myself when i see my alma mater surrounded like caesar in the senate house by those who are reiterating stab after stab i would not for this right hand have her turn to me and say and thou too my son daniel webster be careful not to over inflect too much modulation produces an unpleasant effect of artificiality like a mature matron trying to be kittenish it is a short step between true expression and unintentional burlesque scrutinize your own tones take a single expression like oh no or oh i see or indeed and by patient self-examination see how many shades of meaning may be expressed by inflection this sort of common-sense practice will do you more good than a book of rules but don't forget to listen to your own voice questions and exercises one in your own words define a cadence b modulation c inflection d emphasis two name five ways of destroying monotony and gaining effectiveness in speech three what states of mind does falling inflection signify make as full a list as you can four do the same for rising inflection. 5. How does the voice bend in expressing A. Surprise B. Shame C. Hate D. Formality E. Excitement 6. Reread some sentence several times, and by using different inflections, change the meaning with each reading. 7. Note the inflections employed in some speech or conversation. Were they the best that could be used to bring out the meaning? Criticize and illustrate. 8. Render the following passages. Has the gentleman done has he completely done and god said let there be light and there was light nine invent an indirect question and show how it would naturally be inflected 
10. Does a direct question always require a rising inflection? Illustrate. 11. Illustrate how the complete ending of an expression or of a speech is indicated by inflection. 12. Do the same for incompleteness of idea. 13. Illustrate A. Trembling B. Hesitation and C. Doubt by means of inflection. 14. Show how contrast may be expressed. 15. Try the effects of both rising and falling inflections on the italicized words in the following sentences. State your preference. Gentlemen, I am persuaded. Nay, I am resolved to speak. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Selections for practice. In the following selections, secure emphasis by means of long falling inflections rather than loudness. Repeat these selections, attempting to put into practice all the technical principles that we have thus far had, emphasizing important words, subordinating unimportant words, variety of pitch, changing tempo, pause, and inflection. If these principles are applied, you will have no trouble with monotony. Constant practice will give great facility in the use of inflection and will render the voice itself flexible. Charles I. We charge him with having broken his coronation oath, and we are told that he kept his marriage vow. We accuse him of having given up his people to the merciless inflictions of the most hot-headed and hard hearted of prelates, and the defense is that he took his little son on his knee and kissed him. We censure him for having violated the articles of the Petition of Right, after having for good and valuable consideration promised to observe them, and we are informed that he was accustomed to hear prayer at six o'clock in the morning. It is to such considerations as these together with his Van Dyke dress, his handsome face, and his peaked beard, that he owes, we verily believe, most of his popularity with the present generation. T. B. Macaulay Abraham Lincoln We needed not that he should put on paper that he believed in slavery, who, with treason, with murder, with cruelty infernal, hovered around that majestic man to destroy his life. He was himself but the long sting with which slavery struck at liberty, and he carried the poison that belonged to slavery. As long as this nation lasts, it will never be forgotten that we have one martyred president. Never, never, while time lasts, while heaven lasts, while hell rocks and groans, will it be forgotten that slavery, by its minions, slew him, and in slaying him made manifest its whole nature and tendency. But another thing for us to remember is that this blow was aimed at the life of the government and of the nation. Lincoln was slain. America was meant. The man was cast down. The government was smitten at. It was the president who was killed. It was national life, breathing freedom and meaning beneficence, that was sought. He, the man of Illinois, the private man, divested of robes and the insignia of authority, 
representing nothing but his personal self, might have been hated, but that would not have called forth the murderer's blow. It was because he stood in the place of government, representing government, and a government that represented right and liberty, that he was singled out. This, then, is a crime against universal government. It is not a blow at the foundations of our government, more than at the foundations of the English government, of the French government, of every compact and well-organized government. It was a crime against mankind. The whole world will repudiate and stigmatize it as a deed without a shade of redeeming light. The blow, however, has signally failed. The cause is not stricken. It is strengthened. This nation has dissolved, but in tears only. It stands four square, more solid today than any pyramid in Egypt. This people are neither wasted, nor daunted, nor disordered. Men hate slavery and love liberty with stronger hate and love today than ever before. The government is not weakened, it is made stronger. And now the martyr is moving in triumphal march, mightier than when alive. The nation rises up at every stage of his coming. Cities and states are his pallbearers, and the cannon beats the hours with solemn progression. Dead, 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 he yet speaketh. Is Washington dead? Is Hampton dead? Is David dead? Is any man dead that ever was fit to live? Disenthralled of flesh? and risen to the unobstructed sphere where passion never comes, he begins his illimitable work. His life now is grafted upon the infinite, and will be fruitful as no earthly life can be. Pass on, thou that hast overcome. Your sorrows, O people, are his peace. Your bells and bands and muffled drums sound triumph in his ear. Wail and weep here. God makes it echo joy and triumph there. Pass on, Victor. Four years ago, O Illinois, we took from your midst an untried man, and from among the people we return him to you, a mighty conqueror. Not thine any more, but the nations, not ours, but the world's. Give him place, ye prairies. In the midst of this great continent his dust shall rest, a sacred treasure to myriads who shall make pilgrimage to that shrine to kindle anew their zeal and patriotism. Ye winds that move over the mighty places of the west, Chant his requiem. Ye people, behold a martyr whose blood, as so many inarticulate words, pleads for fidelity, for law, for liberty. Henry Ward Beecher The History of Liberty The event which we commemorate is all important not merely in our own annals, but in those of the world. The sententious English poet has declared that the proper study of mankind is man, and of all inquiries of a temporal nature. The history of our fellow beings is unquestionably among the most interesting, but not all the chapters of human history are alike important. The annals of our race have been filled up with incidents which concern not, or at least ought not to concern, the great company of mankind. 
history, as it has often been written, is the genealogy of princes, the field book of conquerors, and the fortunes of our fellow men have been treated only so far as they have been affected by the influence of the great masters and destroyers of our race. Such history is, I will not say a worthless study, for it is necessary for us to know the dark side as well as the bright side of our condition. But it is a melancholy study which fills the bosom of the philanthropist and the friend of liberty with sorrow. But the history of liberty, the history of men struggling to be free, the history of men who have acquired and are exercising their freedom, the history of those great movements in the world by which liberty has been established and perpetuated forms a subject which we cannot contemplate too closely. This is the real history of man, of the human family, of rational, immortal beings. The trial of adversity was theirs. The trial of prosperity is ours. Let us meet it as men who know their duty and prize their blessings. Our position is the most enviable, the most responsible, which men can fill. If this generation does its duty, the cause of constitutional freedom is safe. If we fail, if we fail, not only do we defraud our children of the inheritance which we receive from our fathers, but we blast the hopes of the friends of liberty throughout our continent, throughout Europe, throughout the world, to the end of time. History is not without her examples of hard-fought fields where the banner of liberty has floated triumphantly on the wildest storm of battle. She is without her examples of people by whom the dear-bought treasure has been wisely employed and safely handed down. The eyes of the world are turned for that example to us. Let us then, as we assemble on the birthday of the nation, as we gather upon the green turf, once wet with precious blood, let us devote ourselves to the sacred cause of constitutional liberty. Let us abjure the interests and passions which divide the great family of American freemen. Let the rage of party spirit sleep today. Let us resolve that our children shall have cause to bless the memory of their fathers as we have cause to bless the memory of ours. Edward Everett End of Section 7 Recording by Bill Mosley, Frelsburg, Texas, U.S.A. Section 8 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Reese. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Eisenwein. Section 8. Concentration in Delivery. Attention is the microscope of the mental eye. Its power may be high or low its field of view, narrow or broad. When high power is used, attention is confined within very circumscribed limits, but its action is exceedingly intense and absorbing. It sees but few things, but these few things are observed through and through. Mental energy and activity, whether of perception or of thought, thus concentrated, act like the sun's rays concentrated by the burning glass. The object is illumined, heated, set on fire. Impressions are so deep that they can never be effaced. Attention of this sort is the prime condition of the most productive mental labor. Daniel Putnam, Psychology Try to rub the top of your head forward and backward 
at the same time that you are patting your chest. Unless your powers of coordination are well developed, you will find it confusing, if not impossible. The brain needs special training before it can do two or more things efficiently at the same instant. It may seem like splitting a hair between its north and northwest corner, but some psychologists argue that no brain can think two distinct thoughts absolutely simultaneously. That what seems to be simultaneous is really very rapid rotation from the first thought to the second and back again, just as in the above-cited experiment the attention must shift from one hand to the other until one or the other movement becomes partly or wholly automatic. Whatever is the psychological truth of this contention, it is undeniable that the mind measurably loses grip on one idea the moment the attention is projected decidedly ahead to a second or a third idea. A fault in public speakers that is as pernicious as it is common is that they try to think of the succeeding sentence while still uttering the former, and in this way their concentration trails off. In consequence, they start their sentences strongly and end them weakly. In a well-prepared written speech, the emphatic word usually comes at one end of the sentence. But an emphatic word needs emphatic expression, and this is precisely what it does not get when concentration flags by leaping too soon to that which is next to be uttered. Concentrate all your mental energies on the present sentence. Remember that the mind of your audience follows yours very closely, and if you withdraw your attention from what you are saying to what you are going to say, your audience will also withdraw theirs. They may not do so consciously and deliberately, but they will surely cease to give importance to the things that you yourself slight. It is fatal to either the actor or the speaker to cross his bridges too soon. Of course, all this is not to say that in the natural pauses of your speech you are not to take swift forward surveys. These are as important as the forward look in driving a motor car. The caution is of quite another sort. While speaking one sentence, do not think of the sentence to follow. Let it come from its proper source, within yourself. You cannot deliver a broadside without concentrated force. That is what produces the explosion. In preparation, you store and concentrate thought and feeling. In the pauses during delivery, you swiftly look ahead and gather yourself for effective attack. During the moments of actual speech, speak. Don't anticipate. Divide your attention, and you divide your power. The matter of the effect of the inner man upon the outer needs a further word here, particularly as touching concentration. What do you read, my lord? Hamlet replied, Words, words, words. That is a world-old trouble. The mechanical calling of words is not expression by a long stretch. Did you ever notice how hollow a memorized speech usually sounds? You have listened to the ranting mechanical cadence of inefficient actors, lawyers, and preachers. Their trouble is a mental one. They are not concentratedly thinking thoughts that cause words to issue with sincerity and conviction, but are merely enunciating word sounds mechanically. Painful experience alike to audience and to speaker. A parrot is equally eloquent. Again, let Shakespeare instruct us, this time in the insincere prayer of the king, Hamlet's uncle. He laments thus pointedly, My words fly up, my thoughts remain below. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. The truth is that as a speaker your words must be born again every time they are spoken, then they will not suffer in their utterance, even though perforce committed to memory and repeated, like Dr. Russell Conwell's lecture, Acres of Diamonds, five thousand times. Such speeches lose nothing by repetition, for the perfectly patent reason that they arise from concentrated thought and feeling, and not a mere necessity for saying something, which usually means anything, and that, in turn, is tantamount to nothing. If the thought beneath your words is warm, fresh, spontaneous, a part of yourself, your utterance will have breath and life. Words are only a result. Do not try to get the result without stimulating the cause. Do you ask how to concentrate? Think of the word itself, and of its philological brother, concentric. Think of how a lens gathers and concenters the rays of light within a given circle. It centers them by a process of withdrawal. It may seem like a harsh saying, but the man who cannot concentrate is either weak of will, a nervous wreck, or has never learned what willpower is good for. You must concentrate by resolutely withdrawing your attention from everything else. 
if you concentrate your thought on a pain which may be afflicting you, that pain will grow more intense. Count your blessings, and they will multiply. Center your thought on your strokes, and your tennis play will gradually improve. To concentrate is simply to attend to one thing, and attend to nothing else. If you find that you cannot do that, there is something wrong. Attend to that first. Remove the cause and the symptom will disappear. Read the chapter on willpower. Cultivate your will by willing and then doing at all costs. Concentrate and you will win. Questions and Exercises 1. Select from any source several sentences suitable for speaking aloud. Deliver them first in the manner condemned in this chapter, and second with due regard for emphasis toward the close of each sentence. 2. Put into about 100 words your impression of the effect produced. 3. Tell of any peculiar methods you may have observed or heard of by which speakers have sought to aid their powers of concentration, such as looking fixedly at a blank spot in the ceiling, or twisting a watch charm. 4. What effect do such habits have on the audience? 5. What relation does pause bear to concentration? 6. Tell why concentration naturally helps a speaker to change pitch, tempo, and emphasis. 7. Read the following selection through to get its meaning and spirit clearly in your mind. Then read it aloud, concentrating solely on the thought that you are expressing. Do not trouble about the sentence or thought that is coming. Half the troubles of mankind arise from anticipating trials that never occur. Avoid this in speaking. Make the end of your sentences just as strong as the beginning. Concentrate. War. The last of the savage instincts is war. The caveman's club made law and procured food. Might decreed right. Warriors were saviors. In Nazareth, a carpenter laid down the saw and preached the brotherhood of man. Twelve centuries afterwards, his followers marched to the Holy Land to destroy all who differed with them in the worship of the God of love. Triumphantly they wrote, In Solomon's porch and in his temple our men rode in the blood of the Saracens up to the knees of their horses. History is an appalling tale of war. In the seventeenth century, Germany, France, Sweden, and Spain warred for thirty years. At Magdeburg, 30,000 out of 36,000 were killed regardless of sex or age. In Germany, schools were closed for a third of a century, homes burned, women outraged, towns demolished, and the untilled land became a wilderness. Two-thirds of Germany's property was destroyed, and 18 million of her citizens were killed, because men quarreled about the way to glorify the Prince of Peace. Marching through rain and snow, sleeping on the ground, eating stale food or starving, contracting diseases and facing guns that fire six hundred times a minute, for fifty cents a day. This is the soldier's life. At the window sits the widowed mother crying. Little children with tearful faces pressed against the pane watch and wait. Their means of livelihood, their home, their happiness, is gone. Fatherless children, broken-hearted women, sick, disabled, and dead men. This is the wage of war. We spend more money preparing men to kill each other than we do in teaching them to live. We spend more money building one battleship than in the annual maintenance of all our state universities. The financial loss resulting from destroying one another's homes in the Civil War would have built 15 million houses, each costing $2,000. We pray for love but prepare for hate. We preach peace, but equip for war. Were half the power that fills the world with terror, were half the wealth bestowed on camp and court, given to redeem this world from error, there would be no need of arsenal and fort. War only defers a question. No issue will ever really be settled until it is settled rightly. Like rival gun gangs in a back alley, the nations of the world through the bloody ages have fought over their differences. Denver cannot fight Chicago, and Iowa cannot fight Ohio. Why should Germany be permitted to fight France, or Bulgaria fight Turkey? When mankind rises above creeds, colors, and countries, when we are citizens not of a nation but of the world, the armies and navies of the earth 
will constitute an international police force to preserve the peace, and the dove will take the eagle's place. Our differences will be settled by an international court, with the power to enforce its mandates. In times of peace, prepare for peace. The wages of war are the wages of sin, and the wages of sin is death. Editorial by D.C. Leslie's Weekly Used by permission. End of section 8. Recording by Matthew Reese, Davenport, Iowa. Section 9 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Reese. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Eisenwein. Section 9. Force. However, tis expedient to be wary. Indifference, certes, don't produce distress. And rash enthusiasm in good society were nothing but a moral inebriety. Byron, Don Juan. You have attended plays that seemed fair, yet they did not move you, grip you. In theatrical parlance, they failed to get over, which means that their message did not get over the footlights to the audience. There was no punch, no jab to them. They had no force. Of course, all this spells disaster, in big letters, not only in a stage production, but in any platform effort. Every such presentation exists solely for the audience, and if it fails to hit them, and the expression is a good one, it has no excuse for living, nor will it live long. What is force? Some of our most obvious words open up secret meanings under scrutiny, and this is one of them. To begin with, we must recognize the distinction between inner and outer force. The one is cause, the other effect. The one is spiritual, the other physical. In this important particular, animate force differs from inanimate force. The power of man, coming from within and expressing itself outwardly, is of another sort from the force of Shimo's powder, which awaits some influence from without to explode it. However susceptive to outside stimuli, the true source of power in man lies within himself. This may seem like mere psychology, but it has an intensely practical bearing on public speaking, as will appear. Not only must we discern the difference between human force and mere physical force, but we must not confuse its real essence with some of the things that may, and may not, accompany it. For example, loudness is not force, though force at times may be attended by noise. Mere roaring never made a good speech, yet there are moments, moments, mind you, not minutes, when big voice power may be used with tremendous effect. Nor is violent motion force, yet force may result in violent motion. Hamlet counseled the players. Nor do not saw the air too much with your hand, thus, but use all gently, for in the very torrent, tempest, and, as I may say, whirlwind of your passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. Oh, it offends me to the soul to hear a robustious periwig-pated fellow tear a passion to tatters, to very rags, to split the ears of the groundlings, who, for the most part, are capable of nothing but inexplicable dumb show and noise. I would have such a fellow whipped for o'erdoing termagant. It out Herod's Herod. Pray you avoid it. Be not too tame, neither, but let your discretion be your tutor. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action, with this special observance that you o'erstep not the modesty of nature. For anything so overdone is from the purpose of playing, whose end, both at the first and now, was, and is, to hold, as twere, the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her own feature, scorn her own image, and the very age and body of the time his form and pressure. Now this overdone, or come tardy off, though it make the unskilful laugh, cannot but make the judicious grieve, the censure of the which one must, in your allowance, or weigh a whole theatre of others. Oh, there be players that I have seen play, and heard others praise, and that highly. 
not to speak it profanely, that, neither having the accent of Christians, nor the gait of Christian, pagan, or man, have so strutted and bellowed, that I have thought some of nature's journeymen had made men, and not made them well, they imitated humanity so abominably. Hamlet, Act Three, Scene Two. Force is both a cause and an effect. Inner force, which must precede outer force, is a combination of four elements, acting progressively. First of all, force arises from conviction. You must be convinced of the truth, or the importance, or the meaning of what you are about to say, before you can give it forceful delivery. It must lay strong hold upon your convictions before it can grip your audience. Conviction convinces. The Saturday Evening Post, in an article on England's T.R., Winston Spencer Churchill, attributed much of Churchill's and Roosevelt's public platform success to their forceful delivery. No matter what is in hand, these men make themselves believe for the time being that that one thing is the most important on earth. Hence they speak to their audience in a do-this-or-you-perish manner. That kind of speaking wins, and it is that virile, strenuous, aggressive attitude which both distinguishes and maintains the platform careers of our greatest leaders. But let us look a little closer at the origins of inner force. How does conviction affect the man who feels it? We have answered the inquiry in the very question itself. He feels it. Conviction produces emotional tension. Study the pictures of Theodore Roosevelt and of Billy Sunday in action. Action is the word. Note the tension of their jaw muscles, the taut lines of sinews in their entire bodies when reaching a climax of force. Moral and physical force are alike in being both preceded and accompanied by intensity, tension, tightness of the cords of power. It is this tautness of the bowstring, this knotting of the muscles, this contraction before the spring, that makes an audience feel, almost see, the reserve power in a speaker. In some really wonderful way, it is more what a speaker does not say and do that reveals the dynamo within. Anything may come from such stored-up force once it is let loose, and that keeps an audience alert, hanging on the lips of a speaker for his next word. After all, it is all a question of manhood, for a stuffed doll has neither convictions nor emotional tension. If you are upholstered with sawdust, keep off the platform, for your own speech will puncture you. Growing out of this conviction tension comes resolve to make the audience share that conviction tension. Purpose is the backbone of force. Without it, speech is flabby. It may glitter, but it is the iridescence of the spineless jellyfish. You must hold fast to your resolve if you would hold fast to your audience. Finally, all this conviction, tension, purpose is lifeless and useless unless it results in propulsion. You remember how Young, in his wonderful night thoughts, delineates the man who pushes his prudent purpose to resolve, resolves, and re-resolves, and dies the same. Let not your force die a borning. Bring it to full life in its conviction, emotional tension, resolve, and propulsive power. Can force be acquired? Yes, if the acquirer has any such capacities as we have just outlined. How to acquire this vital factor is suggested in its very analysis. Live with your subject until you are convinced of its importance. If your message does not of itself arouse you to tension, pull yourself together. When a man faces the necessity of leaping across a crevasse, he does not wait for inspiration, he wills his muscles into tensity for the spring. It is not without purpose that our English language uses the same word to depict a mighty though delicate steel contrivance and a quick leap through the air. Then resolve, and let it all end in actual punch. The truth is worth reiteration. The man within is the final factor. He must supply the fuel. The audience, or even the man himself, may add the match. It matters little which. Only so that there be fire. However skillfully your engine is constructed, however well it works, you will have no force if the fire has gone out under the boiler. It matters little how well you have mastered poise, pause, modulation, and tempo. If your speech lacks fire, it is dead. Neither a dead engine nor a dead speech will move anybody. Four factors of force are measurably within your control, and in that far may be acquired. Ideas, feeling about the subject, wording, and delivery. Each of these is more or less fully discussed in this volume, except wording, 
which really requires a fuller rhetorical study than can here be ventured. It is, however, of the utmost importance that you should be aware of precisely how wording bears upon force in a sentence. Study The Working Principles of Rhetoric by John Franklin Genung, or the rhetorical treatises of Adam Sherman Hill, of Charles Sears Baldwin, or any others whose names may easily be learned from any teacher. Here are a few suggestions on the use of words to attain force. Choice of words. Plain words are more forceful than words less commonly used. Juggle has more vigor than prestidigitate. Short words are stronger than long words. End has more directness than terminate. Saxon words are usually more forceful than Latinistic words. For force, use wars against rather than militate against. Specific words are stronger than general words. Pressman is more definite than printer. Connotative words, those that suggest more than they say, have more power than ordinary words. She let herself be married expresses more than she married. Epithets, figuratively descriptive words, are more effective than direct names. Go tell that old fox has more punch than go tell that sly fellow. Onomatopoetic words, words that convey the sense by the sound, are more powerful than other words. Crash is more effective than cataclysm. Arrangement of words. Cut out modifiers. Cut out connectives. Begin with words that demand attention. End with words that deserve distinction, says Professor Barrett Wendell. Set strong ideas over against weaker ones, so as to gain strength by the contrast. Avoid elaborate sentence structure. Short sentences are stronger than long ones. Cut out every useless word, so as to give prominence to the really important ones. Let each sentence be a condensed battering ram, swinging to its final blow on the attention. A familiar, homely idiom, if not worn by much use, is more effective than a highly formal, scholarly expression. Consider well the relative value of different positions in the sentence, so that you may give the prominent place to ideas you wish to emphasize. But, says someone, is it not more honest to depend on the inherent interest in a subject, its native truth, clearness and sincerity of presentation, and beauty of utterance to win your audience? Why not charm men instead of capturing them by assault? Why use force? There is much truth in such an appeal, but not all the truth. Clearness, persuasion, beauty, simple statement of truth, are all essential. Indeed, they are all definite parts of a forceful presentment of a subject, without being the only parts. Strong meat may not be as attractive as ices, but all depends on the appetite and the stage of the meal. You cannot deliver an aggressive message with caressing little strokes. No, jab it in with hard, swift solar plexus punches. You cannot strike fire from flint or from an audience with love taps. Say to a crowded theater in a lackadaisical manner, It seems to me that the house is on fire, and your announcement may be greeted with a laugh. If you flash out the words, The house is on fire! They will crush one another in getting to the exits. The spirit and the language of force are definite with conviction. No immortal speech in literature contains such expressions as It seems to me, I should judge, In my opinion, I suppose, Perhaps it is true. The speeches that will live have been delivered by men ablaze with the courage of their convictions, who uttered their words as eternal truth. Of Jesus it was said that the common people heard him gladly. Why? He taught them as one having authority. An audience will never be moved by what seems to you to be the truth, or what in your humble opinion may be so. If you honestly can, assert convictions as your conclusions. Be sure you are right before you speak your speech. Then utter your thoughts as though they were a Gibraltar of unimpeachable truth. Deliver them with the iron hand and confidence of a Cromwell. Assert them with the fire of authority. Pronounce them as an ultimatum. If you cannot speak with conviction, be silent. What force did that young minister have who, fearing to be too dogmatic, thus exhorted his hearers? 
my friends, as I assume that you are, it appears to be my duty to tell you that if you do not repent, so to speak, forsake your sins, as it were, and turn to righteousness, if I may so express it, you will be lost in a measure. Effective speech must reflect the era. This is not a rose-water age, and a tepid, half-hearted speech will not win. This is the century of trip-hammers, of overland expresses that dash under cities and through mountain tunnels, and you must instill this spirit into your speech if you would move a popular audience. From a front seat, listen to a first-class company present a modern Broadway drama. Not a comedy, but a gripping, thrilling drama. Do not become absorbed in the story. Reserve all your attention for the technique and the force of the acting. There is a kick and a crash as well as an infinitely subtle intensity in the big climax speeches that suggest this lesson. The same well-calculated, restrained, delicately shaded force would simply rivet your ideas in the minds of your audience. An air gun will rattle birdshot against a window pane. It takes a rifle to wing a bullet through plate glass and the oaken walls beyond. When to use force. An audience is unlike the kingdom of heaven. The violent do not always take it by force. There are times when beauty and serenity should be the only bells in your chime. Force is only one of the great extremes of contrast. Use neither it nor quiet utterance to the exclusion of other tones. Be various, and in variety find even greater force than you could attain by attempting its constant use. If you are reading an essay on the beauties of the dawn, talking about the dainty bloom of a honeysuckle, or explaining the mechanism of a gas engine, a vigorous style of delivery is entirely out of place. But when you are appealing to wills and consciences for immediate action, forceful delivery wins. In such cases, consider the minds of your audience as so many safes that have been locked and the keys lost. Do not try to figure out the combinations. Pour a little nitroglycerin into the cracks and light the fuse. As these lines are being written, a contractor down the street is clearing away the rocks with dynamite to lay the foundations for a great building. When you want to get action, do not fear to use dynamite. The final argument for the effectiveness of force in public speech is the fact that everything must be enlarged for the purposes of the platform. That is why so few speeches read well in the reports on the morning after. Statements appear crude and exaggerated because they are unaccompanied by the forceful delivery of a glowing speaker before an audience heated to attentive enthusiasm. So, in preparing your speech, you must not err on the side of mild statement. Your audience will inevitably tone down your words in the cold gray of afterthought. When Phidias was criticized for the rough, bold outlines of a figure he had submitted in competition, he smiled, and asked that his statue and the one wrought by his rival should be set upon the column for which the sculpture was destined. When this was done, all the exaggerations and crudities, toned by distances, melted into exquisite grace of line and form. Each speech must be a special study in suitability and proportion. Omit the thunder of delivery, if you will, but like Wendell Phillips, put silent lightning into your speech. Make your thoughts breathe and your words burn. Birrell said, Emerson writes like an electrical cat emitting sparks and shocks in every sentence. Go thou and speak likewise. Get the big stick into your delivery. Be forceful. Questions and Exercises 1. Illustrate by repeating a sentence from memory what is meant by employing force in speaking. 2. Which, in your opinion, is the most important of the technical principles of speaking that you have studied so far? Why? 3. What is the effect of too much force in a speech? Too little. 4. Note some uninteresting conversation or ineffective speech and tell why it failed. 5. Suggest how it might be improved. 6. Why do speeches have to be spoken with more force than do conversations? 7. Read aloud the selection on page 84, using the technical principles outlined in chapters 3 to 8, but neglect to put any force behind the interpretation. What is the result? 8. Reread several times, doing your best to achieve force. 9. Which parts of the selection on page 84 require the most force? 10. 
write a five-minute speech not only discussing the errors of those who exaggerate and those who minimize the use of force, but by imitation show their weaknesses. Do not burlesque, but closely imitate. 11. Give a list of ten themes for public addresses, saying which seem most likely to require the frequent use of force in delivery. 12. In your own opinion, do speakers usually err from the use of too much or too little force? 13. Define A. Bombast B. Bathos C. Sentimentality D. Squeamish 14. Say how the foregoing words describe weaknesses in public speech. 15. Recast in 20th century English Hamlet's directions to the players, page 88. 16. Memorize the following extracts from Wendell Phillips' speeches, and deliver them with the of Wendell Phillips' silent lightning delivery. We are for a revolution. We say, in behalf of these hunted lyings, whom God created, and who law-abiding Webster and Winthrop have sworn shall not find shelter in Massachusetts, we say that they may make their little motions, and pass their little laws in Washington, but that Fanwell Hall repeals them in the name of humanity and the old bay state. My advice to working men is this. If you want power in this country, if you want to make yourselves felt, if you do not want your children to wait long years before they have the bread on the table they ought to have, the leisure in their lives they ought to have, the opportunities in life they ought to have, if you don't want to wait yourselves, write on your banner so that every political trimmer can read it, so that every politician, no matter how short-sighted he may be, can read it, we never forget. If you launch the arrow of sarcasm at labor, we never forget. If there is a division in Congress, and you throw your vote in the wrong scale, we never forget. You may go down on your knees and say, I am sorry I did the act. But we will say, it will avail you in heaven to be sorry, but on this side of the grave, never so that a man in taking up the labor question will know he is dealing with a hair-trigger pistol, and will say, I am to be true to justice and to man, otherwise I am a dead duck. In Russia there is no press, no debate, no explanation of what government does, no remonstrance allowed, no agitation of public issues. Dead silence, like that which reigns at the summit of Mount Blanc, freezes the whole empire long ago described as a despotism tempered by assassination. Meanwhile, such despotism has unsettled the brains of the ruling family, as unbridled power doubtless made some of the twelve Caesars insane, a madman, sporting with the lives and comfort of a hundred millions of men. The young girl whispers in her mother's ear, under a sealed roof, her pity for a brother knouted and dragged half-dead into exile for his opinions. The next week she is stripped naked and flogged to death in the public square. No inquiry, no explanation, no trial, no protest, one dead uniform silence. The law of the tyrant. Where is the ground for any hope of peaceful change? No, no. In such a land, dynamite and the dagger are the necessary and proper substitutes for Fanwell Hall. Anything that will make the madman quake in his bedchamber and rouse his victims into reckless and desperate resistance. This is the only view an American the child of 1620 and 1776, can take of nihilism. Any other unsettles and perplexes the ethics of our civilization. Born within sight of Bunker Hill, son of Harvard, whose first pledge was truth, citizen of a republic based on the claim that no government is rightful unless resting on the consent of the people, and which assumes to lead in asserting the rights of humanity. I at least can say nothing else and nothing less, no, not if every tile on Cambridge roofs were a devil hooting my words. For practice on forceful selections, use The Irrepressible Conflict, page 67. Abraham Lincoln, page 76. Pass Prosperity Around, page 470. A Plea for Cuba, page 50. End of section 9. Recording by Matthew Reese, Davenport, Iowa.
Section 10 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Reese. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Eisenwein. Section 10 Feeling and Enthusiasm. Enthusiasm is that secret and harmonious spirit that hovers over the production of genius. Isaac Disraeli, Literary Character If you are addressing a body of scientists on such a subject as the veins in a butterfly's wings, or on road structure, naturally your theme will not arouse much feeling in either you or your audience. These are purely mental subjects. But if you want men to vote for a measure that will abolish child labor, or if you would inspire them to take up arms for freedom, you must strike straight at their feelings. We lie on soft beds, sit near the radiator on a cold day, eat cherry pie, and devote our attention to one of the opposite sex, not because we have reasoned out that it is the right thing to do, but because it feels right. No one but a dyspeptic chooses his diet from a chart. Our feelings dictate what we shall eat, and generally how we shall act. Man is a feeling animal, hence the public speaker's ability to arouse men to action depends almost wholly on his ability to touch their emotions. Negro mothers on the auction block, seeing their children sold away from them into slavery, have flamed out some of America's most stirring speeches. True, the mother did not have any knowledge of the technique of speaking, but she had something greater than all technique, more effective than reason. Feeling. The great speeches of the world have not been delivered on tariff reductions or post office appropriations. The speeches that will live have been charged with emotional force. Prosperity and peace are poor developers of eloquence. When great wrongs are to be righted, when the public heart is flaming with passion, that is the occasion for memorable speaking. Patrick Henry made an immortal address, for in an epochal crisis he pleaded for liberty. He had roused himself to the point where he could honestly and passionately exclaim, Give me liberty, or give me death. His fame would have been different if he had lived today, and argued for the recall of judges. THE POWER OF ENTHUSIASM Political parties hire bands and pay for applause. They argue that, for vote-getting, to stir up enthusiasm is more effective than reasoning. How far they are right depends on the hearers, but there can be no doubt about the contagious nature of enthusiasm. A watch manufacturer in New York tried out two series of watch advertisements. One argued the superior construction, workmanship, durability, and guarantee offered with the watch. The other was headed, a watch to be proud of, and dwelt upon the pleasure and pride of ownership. The latter series sold twice as many as the former. A salesman for a locomotive works informed the writer that in selling railroad engines, emotional appeal was stronger than an argument based on mechanical excellence. Illustrations without number might be cited to show that in all our actions we are emotional beings. The speaker who would speak efficiently must develop the power to arouse feeling. Webster, great debater that he was, knew that the real secret of a speaker's power was an emotional one. He eloquently says of eloquence, Affected passion, intense expression, the pomp of declamation, all may aspire after it, they cannot reach it. It comes, if it comes at all, like the outbreak of a fountain from the earth, or the bursting forth of volcanic fires with spontaneous, original, native force. The graces taught in the schools, the costly ornaments and studied contrivances of speech shock and disgust men, when their own lives and the fate of their wives, their children, and their country hang on the decision of the hour. Then words have lost their power, rhetoric is in vain, and all elaborate oratory contemptible. Even genius itself then feels rebuked and subdued, as in the presence of higher qualities. Then patriotism is eloquent, then self-devotion is eloquent. The clear conception outrunning the deductions of logic, the high purpose, the firm resolve, the dauntless spirit, speaking on the tongue, beaming from the eye, informing every feature, and urging the whole man onward, right onward to his subject. This, this is eloquence. Or rather, it is something greater and higher than all eloquence. It is action, noble, sublime, godlike action. When traveling through the Northwest some time ago, one of the present writers, 
strolled up a village street after dinner and noticed a crowd listening to a faker speaking on a corner from a goods box. Remembering Emerson's advice about learning something from every man we meet, the observer stopped to listen to this speaker's appeal. He was selling a hair tonic which he claimed to have discovered in Arizona. He removed his hat to show what this remedy had done for him, washed his face in it to demonstrate that it was as harmless as water, and enlarged on its merits in such an enthusiastic manner that the half-dollars poured in on him in a silver flood. When he had supplied the audience with hair tonic, he asked why a greater proportion of men than women were bald. No one knew. He explained that it was because women wore thinner-soled shoes, and so made a good electrical connection with Mother Earth, while men wore thick, dry-soled shoes that did not transmit the Earth's electricity to the body. Men's hair, not having a proper amount of electrical food, died and fell out. Of course he had a remedy, a little copper plate that should be nailed on the bottom of the shoe. He pictured in enthusiastic and vivid terms the desirability of escaping baldness, and paid tributes to his copper plates. Strange as it may seem when the story is told in cold print, the speaker's enthusiasm had swept his audience with him, and they crushed around his stand with outstretched quarters in their anxiety to be the possessors of these magical plates. Emerson's suggestion had been well taken. The observer had seen again the wonderful, persuasive power of enthusiasm. Enthusiasm sent millions crusading into the Holy Land to redeem it from the Saracens. Enthusiasm plunged Europe into a thirty years' war over religion. Enthusiasm sent three small ships plying the unknown sea to the shores of a new world. When Napoleon's army were worn out and discouraged in their ascent of the Alps, the little corporal stopped them and ordered the bands to play the Marseillaise. Under its soul-stirring strains, there were no Alps. Listen. Emerson said, Nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. Carlyle declared that every great movement in the annals of history has been the triumph of enthusiasm. It is as contagious as measles. Eloquence is half inspiration. Sweep your audience with you in a pulsation of enthusiasm. Let yourself go. A man, said Oliver Cromwell, never rises so high as when he knows not whither he is going. How are we to acquire and develop enthusiasm? It is not to be slipped on like a smoking jacket. A book cannot furnish you with it. It is a growth, an effect. But an effect of what? Let us see. Emerson wrote, A painter told me that nobody could draw a tree without in some sort becoming a tree, or draw a child by studying the outlines of his form merely, but by watching for a time his motion and plays, the painter enters his nature, and then can draw him at will in every attitude. So Roos entered into the inmost nature of his sheep. I knew a draftsman employed in a public survey, who found that he could not sketch the rocks until their geological structure was first explained to him. When Sarah Bernhardt plays a difficult role, she frequently will speak to no one from four o'clock in the afternoon until after the performance. From the hour of four she lives her character. Booth, it is reported, would not permit anyone to speak to him between the acts of his Shakespearean roles, for he was Macbeth then, not Booth. Dante, exiled from his beloved Florence, condemned to death, lived in caves half-starved. Then Dante wrote out his heart in the Divine Comedy. Bunyan entered into the spirit of his pilgrim's progress so thoroughly that he fell down on the floor of Bedford Jail and wept for joy. Turner, who lived in a garret, arose before daybreak and walked over the hills nine miles to see the sun rise on the ocean, that he might catch the spirit of its wonderful beauty. Wendell Phillips' sentences were full of silent lightning, because he bore in his heart the sorrow of five million slaves. There is only one way to get feeling into your speaking, and whatever else you forget, forget not this. You must actually enter into the character you impersonate, the cause you advocate, the case you argue. Enter into it so deeply that it clothes you, enthralls you, possesses you wholly. Then you are, in the true meaning of the word, in sympathy with your subject, for its feeling is your feeling, you feel with it, and therefore your enthusiasm is both genuine and contagious. The carpenter, who spoke as never man spake, uttered words born out of a passion of love for humanity. He had entered into humanity, and thus became man. But we must not look upon the foregoing words as a facile prescription for decocting a feeling, which may then be ladled out to a complacent audience in quantities to suit the need of the moment. Genuine feeling in a speech is bone and blood of the speech itself, 
and not something that may be added to it or subtracted at will. In the ideal address theme, speaker and audience become one, fused by the emotion and thought of the hour. The Need of Sympathy for Humanity It is impossible to lay too much stress on the necessity for the speaker's having a broad and deep tenderness for human nature. One of Victor Hugo's biographers attributes his power as an orator and writer to his wide sympathies and profound religious feelings. Recently we heard the editor of Collier's Weekly speak on short story writing, and he so often emphasized the necessity for this broad love of humanity, this truly religious feeling, that he apologized twice for delivering a sermon. Few, if any, of the immortal speeches were ever delivered for a selfish or a narrow cause. They were born out of a passionate desire to help humanity. Instances, Paul's address to the Athenians on Mars Hill, Lincoln's Gettysburg speech, the Sermon on the Mount, Henry's address before the Virginia Convention of Delegates. The seal and sign of greatness is a desire to serve others. Self-preservation is the first law of life but self-abnegation is the first law of greatness, and of art. Selfishness is the fundamental cause of all sin. It is the thing that all great religions, all worthy philosophies, have struck at. Out of a heart of real sympathy and love comes the speeches that move humanity. Former United States Senator Albert J. Beveridge, in an introduction to one of the volumes of Modern Eloquence, says, The profoundest feeling among the masses, the most influential element in their character, is the religious element. It is as instinctive and elemental as the law of self-preservation. It informs the whole intellect and personality of the people, and he who would greatly influence the people by uttering their unformed thoughts must have this great and unanalyzable bond of sympathy with them. When the men of Ulster armed themselves to oppose the passage of the Home Rule Act, one of the present writers assigned to a hundred men Home Rule as the topic for an address to be prepared by each. Among this group were some brilliant speakers, several of them experienced lawyers and political campaigners. Some of their addresses showed a remarkable knowledge and grasp of the subject. Others were clothed in the most attractive phrases. But a clerk, without a great deal of education and experience, arose and told how he spent his boyhood days in Ulster, how his mother, while holding him on her lap, had pictured to him Ulster's deeds of valor. He spoke of a picture in his uncle's home that showed the men of Ulster conquering a tyrant and marching on to victory. His voice quivered, and with a hand pointing upward, he declared that if the men of Ulster went to war, they would not go alone. A great God would go with them. The speech thrilled and electrified the audience. It thrills yet, as we recall it. The high-sounding phrases, the historical knowledge, the philosophical treatment of the other speakers largely failed to arouse any deep interest, while the genuine conviction and feeling of the modest clerk, speaking on a subject that lay deep in his heart, not only electrified his audience, but won their personal sympathy for the cause he advocated. As Webster said, it is of no use to try to pretend to sympathy or feelings. It cannot be done successfully. Nature is forever putting a premium on reality. What is false is soon detected as such. The thoughts and feelings that create and mold the speech in the study must be born again when the speech is delivered from the platform. Do not let your words say one thing and your voice and attitude another. There is no room here for half-hearted, nonchalant methods of delivery. Sincerity is the very soul of eloquence. Carlyle was right. No Mirabeau, Napoleon, Burns, Cromwell, no man adequate to do anything, but is first of all in right earnest about it, what I call a sincere man. I should say, sincerity, a great, deep, genuine sincerity, is the first characteristic of all men in any way heroic. Not the sincerity that calls itself sincere, Ah, no, that is a very poor matter indeed, a shallow braggart, conscious sincerity, oftenest self-conceit mainly. The great man's sincerity is of the kind he cannot speak of, is not conscious of. QUESTIONS AND EXERCISES It is one thing to convince the would-be speaker that he ought to put feeling into his speeches. Often it is quite another thing for him to do it. The average speaker is afraid to let himself go, and continually suppresses his emotions. When you put enough feeling into your speeches, they will sound overdone to you, unless you are an experienced speaker. They will sound too strong if you are not used to enlarging for platform or stage, for the delineation of the emotions must be enlarged for public delivery. 1. Study the following speech, going back in your imagination to the time and circumstances that brought it forth. 
make it not a memorized historical document, but feel the emotions that gave it birth. The speech is only an effect. Live over in your own heart the causes that produced it, and try to deliver it at white heat. It is not possible for you to put too much real feeling into it, though, of course, it would be quite easy to rant and fill it with false emotion. This speech, according to Thomas Jefferson, started the ball of the revolution rolling. Men were then willing to go out and die for liberty. Patrick Henry's Speech Before the Virginia Convention of Delegates Mr. President, it is natural to man to indulge in the illusions of hope. We are apt to shut our eyes against a painful truth, and listen to the song of that siren till she transforms us to beasts. Is this the part of wise men, engaged in a great and arduous struggle for liberty? Are we disposed to be the number of those who, having eyes, see not, and having ears, hear not the things which so nearly concern our temporal salvation? For my part, whatever anguish of spirit it may cost, I am willing to know the whole truth, to know the worst, and to provide for it. I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided, and that is the lamp of experience. I know of no way of judging of the future, but by the past. And judging by the past, I wish to know what there has been in the conduct of the British ministry for the last ten years, to justify those hopes with which gentlemen have been pleased to solace themselves, and the house. Is it that insidious smile with which our petition has been lately received? Trust it not, sir, it will prove a snare to your feet. Suffer not yourselves to be betrayed with a kiss. Ask yourselves how this gracious reception of our petition comports with those warlike preparations which cover our waters and darken our land. Are fleets and armies necessary to a work of love and reconciliation? Have we shown ourselves so unwilling to be reconciled that force must be called in to win back our love? Let us not deceive ourselves, sir. These are the implements of war and subjugation, the last arguments to which kings resort. I ask, gentlemen, sir, what means this martial array, if its purpose be not to force us to submission? Can gentlemen assign any other possible motive for it? Has Great Britain any enemy in this quarter of the world to call for all this accumulation of navies and armies? No, sir, she has none. They are meant for us, they can be meant for no other. They are sent over to bind and to rivet upon us those chains which the British ministry have been so long forging. And what have we to oppose to them? Shall we try argument? Sir, we have been trying that for the last ten years. Have we anything new to offer upon the subject? Nothing. We have held the subject up in every light of which it is capable, but it has been all in vain. Shall we resort to entreaty and humble supplication? What terms shall we find which have not been already exhausted? Let us not, I beseech you, sir, deceive ourselves longer. Sir, we have done everything that could be done to avert the storm which is now coming on. We have petitioned, we have remonstrated, we have supplicated, we have prostrated ourselves before the throne, and have implored its interposition to arrest the tyrannical hands of the ministry and parliament. Our petitions have been slighted, our remonstrances have produced additional violence and insult, our supplications have been disregarded, and we have been spurned with contempt from the foot of the throne. In vain, after these things, may we indulge in the fond hope of peace and reconciliation. There is no longer any room for hope. If we wish to be free, if we mean to preserve inviolate those inestimable privileges for which we have been so long contending, if we mean not basely to abandon the noble struggle in which we have been so long engaged, and which we have pledged ourselves never to abandon until the glorious object of our contest shall be obtained, we must fight. I repeat it, sir, we must fight. An appeal to arms, and to the God of hosts, is all that is left us. They tell us, sir, that we are weak, unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. But when shall we be stronger? Will it be the next week, or the next year? Will it be when we are totally disarmed, and when a British guard shall be stationed in every house? Shall we gather strength by irresolution and inaction? Shall we acquire the means of effectual resistance by laying supinely on our backs, and hugging the delusive phantom of hope, until our enemies have bound us hand and foot? Sir, we are not weak, if we make a proper use of those means which the God of nature hath placed in our power. Three millions of people, armed in the holy cause of liberty, and in such country as that which we possess, 
are invincible by any force which our enemy can send against us. Besides, sir, we shall not fight our battles alone. There is a just power who presides over the destinies of nations, and who will raise up friends to fight our battles for us. The battle, sir, is not to the strong alone. It is to the vigilant, the active, the brave. Besides, sir, we have no election. If we were base enough to desire it, it is now too late to retire from the contest. There is no retreat but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged. Their clanking may be heard on the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable, and let it come. I repeat it, sir, let it come. It is in vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace. But there is no peace. The war is actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear, or peace so sweet, as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty powers. I know not what course others may take. But as for me, give me liberty, or give me death. 2. Live over in your imagination all the solemnity and sorrow that Lincoln felt at the Gettysburg Cemetery. The feeling in this speech is very deep, but it is quieter and more subdued than the preceding one. The purpose of Henry's address was to get action. Lincoln's speech was meant only to dedicate the last resting place of those who had acted. Read it over and over, see page 50, until it burns in your soul. Then commit it and repeat it for emotional expression. 3. Beecher's speech on Lincoln, page 76, Thurston's speech on a plea for Cuba, page 50, and the following selection are recommended for practice in developing feeling in delivery. A living force that brings to itself all the resources of imagination, all the inspirations of feeling, all that is influential in body, in voice, in eye, in gesture, in posture, in the whole animated man, is in strict analogy with a divine thought and the divine arrangement, and there is no misconstruction more utterly untrue and fatal than this, that oratory is an artificial thing, which deals with baubles and trifles for the sake of making bubbles of pleasure for transient effect on mercurial audiences. So far from that, it is the consecration of the whole man to the noblest purposes to which one can address himself, the education and inspiration of his fellow men by all that there is in learning, by all that there is in thought, by all that there is in feeling, by all that there is in all of them, sent home through the channels of taste and beauty. Henry Ward Beecher 4. What, in your opinion, are the relative values of thought and feeling in a speech? 5. Could we dispense with either? 6. What kinds of selections or occasions require much feeling and enthusiasm, which require little, 7. Invent a list of ten subjects for speeches, saying which would give the most room for pure thought, and which for feeling. 8. Prepare and deliver a ten-minute speech denouncing the imaginary, unfeeling plea of an attorney. He may be either the counsel for the defense or the prosecuting attorney, and the accused may be assumed to be either guilty or innocent, at your option. 9. Is feeling more important than the technical principles expounded in chapters 3 to 7? Why? 10. Analyze the secret of some effective speech or speaker. To what is the success due? 11. Give an example from your own observation of the effect of feeling and enthusiasm on listeners. 12. Memorize Carlyle's and Emerson's remarks on enthusiasm. 13. Deliver Patrick Henry's address, page 110, and Thurston's speech, page 50, without show of feeling or enthusiasm. What is the result? 14. Repeat, with all the feeling these selections demand. What is the result? 15. What steps do you intend to take to develop the power of enthusiasm and feeling in speaking? 16. Write and deliver a five-minute speech ridiculing a speaker who uses bombast, pomposity, and over-enthusiasm. Imitate him. End of section 10. 
Recording by Matthew Reese, Davenport, Iowa. Section 11 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roseanne Schmidt. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Eisenwein. Section 11. Chapter 11. Fluency Through Preparation. Omnimus opibisque parity ready in mind and resources motto of south carolina in omnibus negotus prius quam agredier abhibenda est propratio diligens in all matters before beginning a diligent preparation should be made cicero de officis take your dictionary and look up the words that contain the latin stem flu the results will be suggestive at first blush it would seem that fluency consists in a ready easy use of words not so the flowing quality of speech is much more for it is a composite effect with each of its prior conditions deserving of careful notice the sources of fluency speaking broadly fluently is almost entirely a matter of preparation certainly native gifts figure largely here as in every art but even natural facility is dependent on the very same laws of preparation that hold good for the man of supposedly small native endowment let this encourage you if like moses you are prone to complain that you are not a ready speaker have you ever stopped to analyze that expression a ready speaker readiness in its prime sense is preparedness and they are most ready who are best prepared quick firing depends more on the alert finger than on the hair trigger your fluency will be in direct ratio to two important conditions your knowledge of what you are going to say and your being accustomed to telling what you know to the audience this gives us the second great element of fluency to preparation must be added the ease that arises from practice of which more presently knowledge is essential mr bryan is a most fluent speaker when he speaks on political problems tendencies of the time and questions of morals it is to be supposed however that he would not be so fluent in speaking on the bird life of the florida everglades mr john burroughs might be at his best on this last subject yet entirely lost in talking about international law do not expect to speak fluently on a subject that you know little or nothing about Sisyphon, boasted that he could speak all day a sin in itself on any subject that an audience would suggest he was banished by the spartans but preparation goes beyond the getting of the facts in the case you are to present it includes also the ability to think and arrange your thoughts a full and precise vocabulary an easy manner of speech and breathing absence of self-consciousness and the several other characteristics of efficient delivery that have deserved special attention in other parts of this book rather than in this chapter preparation may be either general or specific usually it should be both a lifetime of reading of companionship with stirring thoughts of wrestling with the problems of life this constitutes a general preparation of inestimable worth out of a well-sorted mind and richer still a broad experience and best of all a warmly sympathetic heart the speaker will have to draw much material that no immediate study could provide general preparation consists of all that a man has put into himself all that heredity and environment have instilled into him and that other rich source of preparedness for speech the friendship of wise companions when schiller returned home after a visit with Gioth, a friend remarked i am amazed by the progress schiller can make within a single fourth night it was the progressive influence of a new friendship proper friendships form one of the best means for the formation of ideas and ideals for they enable one to practice in giving expression to thought the speaker who would speak fluently before an audience should learn to speak fluently and entertainly with a friend clarify your ideas by putting them into words the talker gains as much from his conversation as the listener you sometimes begin to converse on a subject thinking you have very little to say but one idea gives birth to another and you are surprised to learn that the more you give the more you have to give this give and take of friendly conversation develops mentality and fluency in expression 
longfellow said a single conversation across the table with a wise man is better than ten years study of books and holmes whimsically yet none the less truthfully declared that half the time he talked to find out what he thought but that method must not be applied on the platform after all this enrichment of life by storage must come the special preparation for the particular speech this is of so definite a sort that it warrants separate chapter treatment later practice but preparation must also be of another sort than the gathering organizing and shaping of materials it must include practice which like mental preparation must be both general and special do not feel surprised or discouraged if practice on the principles of delivery herein laid down seems to retard your fluency for a time this will be inevitable while you are working for proper inflection for instance inflection will be demanding your first thoughts and the flow of your speech for the time being will be secondary this warning however is strictly for the closet for your practice at home do not carry any thoughts of inflection with you to the platform there you must think only of your subject there is an absolute telepathy between the audience and the speaker if your thought goes to your gesture their thought will too if your interest goes to quality of your voice they will be regarding that instead of what your voice is uttering you have doubtless been abjured to forget everything but your subject this advice says either too much or too little the truth is that while on the platform you must not forget a great many things that are not in your subject but you must not think of them your attention must consciously go only to your message but subconsciously you will be attending to the points of technique which have become more or less habitual by practice a nice balance between these two kinds of attention is important you can no more escape this law than you can live without air your platform gestures your voice your inflection will all be just as good as your habit of gesture voice and inflection makes them no better even the thought of whether you are speaking fluently or not will have the effect of marring your flow of speech return to the opening chapter on self-confidence and again lay its precepts to heart learn by rules to speak without thinking of rules that is not or ought not to be necessary for you to stop to think how to say the alphabet correctly as a matter of fact it is slightly more difficult for you to repeat z y x than it is to say x y z habit has established the order just so you must master the laws of efficiency in speaking until it is a second nature for you to speak correctly rather than otherwise a speaker at the piano has a great deal of trouble with the mechanics of playing but as time goes on his fingers become trained and almost instinctively wander over the keys correctly as an inexperienced speaker you will find a great deal of difficulty at first in putting principles into practice for you will be scared like the young swimmer and make some crude strokes but if you persevere you will win out thus to sum up the vocabulary you have enlarged by study the ease of speaking you have developed by practice the economy of your well-studied emphasis all will subconsciously come to your aid on the platform then the habits you have formed will be earning you a splendid dividend the fluency of your speech will be at the speed of flow your practice has made habitual but this means work what good habit does not no philosopher's stone that will act as a substitute for laborious practice has ever been found if it were it would be thrown away because it would kill our greatest joy the delight of acquisition if public speaking means to you a fuller life you will know no greater happiness than a well-spoken speech the time you have spent in gathering ideas and in private practice of speaking you will find amply rewarded questions and exercises one what advantages has the fluent speaker over the hesitating talker two what influences within and without the man himself work against fluency three select from the daily paper some topic for an address and make a three-minute address on it do your words come freely and your sentences flow out rhythmically practice on the same topic until they do four select some subject with which you are familiar and test your fluency by speaking extemporaneously five take one of the sentiments given below and following the advice given on pages one eighteen through one nineteen construct a short speech beginning with the last word in the sentence machinery has created a new economic world the socialist party is a strenuous worker for peace he was a crushed and broken man when he left prison war must ultimately give way to worldwide arbitration 
the labor unions demand a more equal distribution of the wealth than labor creates six put the sentiments of mr bryan's prince of peace on page four forty eight into your own words honestly criticize your own effort seven take any of the following quotations and make a five-minute speech on it without pausing to prepare the first efforts may be very lame but if you want speed on a typewriter a record of a hundred yard dash or facility in speaking you must practice 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 there lives more faith in honest doubt believe me than in half the creeds tennyson in memoriam however it be it seems to me tis only noble to be good kind hearts are more than caronets and simple faith than norman blood tennyson lady clara vera de vera tis distance lends enchantment to the view and robes the mountain in its azure hue campbell pleasures of hope his best companions innocence and health and his best riches ignorance of wealth goldsmith the desert village beware of desperate steps the darkest day live till to-morrow will have passed away cowper needless alarm the country is the world and my religion is too do good pain rights of man trade it may help society extend but lures the pirate and corrupts the friend it raises armies in a nation's aid and bribes a senate and the lands betrayed pope moral essays o god that men should put an enemy in their mouths to steal away their brains shakespeare othello it matters not how straight the gate how charged with punishment the stroll i am the master of my fate i am the captain of my soul henley invictus the world is so full of a number of things i am sure we should all be happy as kings stevenson a child's garden of verses if your morals are dreary depend upon it they are wrong stevenson essays every advantage has its tax i learn to be content emerson essays eight make a two-minute speech on any of the following general subjects but you will find that your ideas will come more readily if you narrow your subject by taking some specific phrase of it for instance instead of trying to speak on law in general take the proposition the poor man cannot afford to prosecute or instead of dwelling on leisure show how modern speed is creating more leisure in this way you may expand this subject list indefinitely general themes law politics women's suffrage initiative and referendum a larger navy war peace foreign immigration the liquor traffic labor unions strikes socialism single tax tariff honesty courage hope love mercy kindness justice progress machinery invention wealth poverty architecture science surgery haste leisure happiness health business america the far east mobs colleges sports matrimony divorce child labor education books the theatre literature electricity achievement failure public speaking ideals conversation the most dramatic moment of my life my happiest days things worth while what i hope to achieve my greatest desire what i would do with a million dollars is mankind progressing our greatest need End of section 11. Recording by Roseanne Schmidt. Section 12 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roseanne Schmidt. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Essenwine section twelve chapter twelve the voice oh there is something in that voice that reaches the innermost recesses of my spirit longfellow 
Christus. The dramatic critic of the London Times once declared that acting is nine-tenths voice work. Leaving the message aside, the same may justly be said of public speaking. A rich, correctly used voice is the greatest physical factor of persuasiveness and power, often overtopping the effects of reason. But a good voice, well handled, is not only an effective possession for the professional speaker, it is a mark of the personal culture as well, and even a distinct commercial as asset. Gladstone himself, the predecessor of a deep musical voice, has said, Ninety men in every hundred in the crowded profession will probably never rise above mediocrity, because the training of the voice is entirely neglected and considered of no importance. These are words worth pondering. There are three fundamental requisites for a good voice. 1. Ease. Signor Bonchi of the Metropolitan Opera Company says that the secret of good voice is relaxation. And this is true, for relaxation is the basis of ease. The airwaves that produce voice result in a different kind of tone when striking against relaxed muscles than when striking constricted muscles. Try this for yourself. Contract your muscles of your face and throat as you do in hate, and flame out, I HATE YOU! Now relax, as you do when thinking gentle, tender thoughts, and say, I love you. How different the voice sounds. In practicing voice exercises and in speaking, never force your tones. Ease must be your watchword. The voice is a delicate instrument, and you must not handle it with hammer and tongs. Don't make your voice go. Let it go. Don't work. Let the yoke of speech be easy and its burden light. Your throat should be free from strain during speech, therefore it is necessary to avoid muscular contraction. The throat must act as a sort of chimney or funnel for the voice. Hence, an unnatural constriction will not only harm its tones, but injure its health. Nervousness and mental strain are common sources of mouth and throat constriction. So make the battle for poise and self-confidence for which we pleaded in the opening chapter. But how can I relax, you ask, by simply willing to relax? Hold your arm out straight from your shoulder. Now, withdraw all power and let it fall. Practice relaxation of the muscles of the throat by letting your neck and head fall forward. Roll the upper part of your body around, with the waistline acting as a pivot. Let your head fall and roll around as you shift the torso to different positions. Do not force your head around. Simply relax your neck and let gravity pull it around as your body moves. Again, let your head fall forward on your breast. Raise your head, letting your jaw hang. Relax until your jaw feels heavy, as though it were a weight hung to your face. Remember, you must relax the jaw to obtain command of it. It must be free and flexible for the molding of tone, and to let the tone pass out unobstructed. The lips also must be made flexible, to aid in the molding of clear and beautiful tones. For flexibility of lips, repeat the syllables, mo, mi. In saying mo, bring the lips up to resemble the shape of the letter O. In repeating mi, draw them back as you do in a grin. Repeat this exercise rapidly, giving the lips as much exercise as possible. Try the following exercise in the same manner. Mo, e, o, e, u, a. After this exercise has been mastered, the following will also be found excellent for the flexibility of lips. Memorize these sounds indicated, not the expressions, so that you can repeat them rapidly. A as in may, e as in met, u as in use, a as in ah, i as in ice, oi as in oil. A as an at, I as an it, U as an hour, O as an no, O as an no, O as an ooze, A as an all, U as an foot, A as an ah, E as an eat, U as an ooze, E as an eat. All the activity of breathing must be centered not in the throat but in the middle of the body. You must breathe from the diaphragm. 
Note the way you breathe when lying flat on the back, undressed in bed. You will observe that all the activity then centers around the diaphragm. This is the natural and correct method of breathing. By constant watchfulness, make this your habitual manner, for it will enable you to relax more perfectly the muscles of the throat. The next fundamental requisite for good voice is openness. If the muscles of the throat are constricted, the tone passage partially closed, and the mouth kept half shut, how can you expect the tone to come out bright and clear, or even to come out at all? Sound is a series of waves, and if you make a prison of your mouth, holding the jaws and lips rigidly, it will be very difficult for the tone to squeeze through, and even when it does escape, it will lack the force and carrying power. Open your mouth wide, relax all the organs of speech, and let the tone flow out easily. Start to yawn, but instead of yawning, speak while your throat is open. Make this open feeling habitual when speaking. We say make because it is a matter of resolution and of practice. If your vocal organs are healthy, your tone passages may be partially closed by enlarged tonsils, adenoids, or enlarged turbinate bones of the nose. If so, a skilled physician should be consulted. The nose is an important tone passage and should be kept open and free for perfect tones. What we call talking through the nose is not talking through the nose, as you can easily demonstrate by holding your nose as you talk. If you are bothered with nasal tones caused by growths or swellings in the nasal passages, a slight painless operation will remove the obstruction. This is quite important, aside from voice. For the general health will be much lowered if the lungs are continually starved for air. The final fundamental requisite for good voice is forwardness. The voice that is pitched back in the throat is dark, somber, and unattractive. The tone must be pitched forward, but do not force it forward. You will recall that our first principle was ease. Think the tone forward and out. Believe it is going forward and allow it to flow easily. You can tell whether you are placing your tone forward or not by inhaling a deep breath and saying ah with the mouth wide open trying to feel the little delicate sound waves strike the bony arch of the mouth just above the front teeth the sensation is so slight that you will probably not be able to detect it at once but persevere in your practice always thinking the tone forward and you will be rewarded by feeling your voice strike the roof of your mouth a correct forward placing of the tone will do away with the dark throaty tones that are so unpleasant inefficient and harmful to the throat close the lips humming ng m and an think the tone forward do you feel it strike the lips hold the palm of your hand in front of your face and say vigorously crash dash whirl buzz can you feel the forward tone strike against your hand practice until you can Remember, the only way to get your voice forward is to put it forward. How to develop the carrying power of the voice. It is not necessary to speak loudly in order to be heard at a distance. It is necessary only to speak correctly. Edith Wynne Matheson's voice will carry in a whisper throughout a large theater. A paper rustling on the stage of a large auditorium can be heard distinctly in the furthermost seat in the gallery. If you will only use your voice correctly, you will not have much difficulty in being heard. Of course, it is always well to address your speech to the furthest auditors. If they get it, those nearer will have no trouble. But aside from this obvious suggestion, you must observe these laws of voice production. Remember to apply the principles of ease, openness, and forwardness. They are the prime factors in enabling your voice to be heard at a distance. Do not gaze at the floor as you talk. This habit not only gives the speaker an amateurish appearance, but if the head is hung forward the voice will be directed towards the ground instead of floating out over the audience. Voice is a series of air vibrations. To strengthen it, two things are necessary, more air or breath, and more vibration. Breath is the very basis of voice. As a bullet with little powder behind it will not have force and carrying power, so the voice that has little breath behind it will be weak. Not only will deep breathing, breathing from the diaphragm, give the voice a better support, but it will make it a stronger resonance by improving the general health. Usually, ill health means a weak voice. 
while abundant physical vitality is shown through a strong vibrant voice therefore anything that improves the general vitality is an excellent voice strengthener provided you use the voice properly authorities differ on most of the rules of hygiene but on one point they all agree vitality and longevity are increased by deep breathing practice this until it becomes second nature whenever you are speaking take in deep breaths but in such a manner that the inhalations will be silent do not try to speak too long without renewing your breath nature cares for this pretty well unconsciously in conversation and she will do the same for you in platform speaking if you do not interfere with her premonitions a certain very successful speaker developed a voice carrying power by running across country practicing his speech as he went the vigorous exercise forced him to take deep breaths and developed lung power a hard-fought basketball or tennis game is an efficient way of practicing deep breathing when these methods are not convenient we recommend the following place your hands at your sides on the waistline by trying to encompass your waist with your fingers and thumb force all the air out of your lungs take a deep breath remember all the activity is to be centered in the middle of the body do not raise your shoulders as the breath is taken your hands will be forced out repeat the exercise placing your hands on the small of the back and forcing them out as you inhale many methods for deep breathing have been given by various authorities get the air into your lungs that is the important thing the body acts as a sounding board for the voice just as the body of the violin acts as a sounding board for its tones you can increase its vibrations by practice place your fingers on your lips and hum the musical scale thinking and placing the voice forward on the lips do you feel the lips vibrate after a little practice they will vibrate giving a tickling sensation repeat this exercise throwing the humming sound into the nose hold the upper part of the nose between the thumb and forefinger can you feel the nose vibrate placing the palm of your hand on top of your head repeat this humming exercise think the voice there as you hum in head tones can you feel the vibration there now place the palm of your hand on the back of your head repeating the foregoing process then try it on the chest always remember to think your tone where you desire to feel the vibrations the mere act of thinking about any portion of your body will tend to make it vibrate repeat the following after a deep inhalation endeavoring to feel all portions of your body vibrate at the same time when you have attained this you will find that it is a pleasant sensation what ho my jovial mates come on we will frolic it like fairies frisking in the merry moonshine purity of voice this quality is sometimes destroyed by wasting the breath carefully control the breath using only as much as is necessary for the production of tone utilize all that you give out failure to do this results in a breathy tone take in breath like a prodigal in speaking give it out like a miser voice suggestions never attempt to force your voice when hoarse do not drink cold water when speaking the sudden shock to the heated organs of speech will injure the voice avoid pitching your voice too high it will make it raspy this is a common fault when you find your voice is too high a range lower it do not wait until you get to the platform to try this practice it in your daily conversation repeat the alphabet beginning a on the lowest scale possible and going up a note on each succeeding letter for the development of range a wide range will give you facility in making numerous changes of pitch do not form the habit of listening to your voice when speaking you will need your brain to think of what you are saying reserve your observation for private practice questions and exercises one what are the prime requisites for good voice two tell why each one is necessary for good voice production three give some exercises for development of these conditions four why is range of voice desirable five tell how range of voice may be cultivated six how much daily practice do you consider necessary for the proper development of your voice seven how can resonance and carrying power be developed eight what are your voice faults nine how are you trying to correct them end of section twelve recording by roseanne schmidt section thirteen of the art of public speaking this is a librivox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Rees. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Eisenwein. Section 13. Voice Charm. A cheerful temper, joined with innocence, will make beauty attractive, knowledge delightful, and wit good-natured. Joseph Addison, The Tattler. Poe said that the tone of beauty is sadness, but he was evidently thinking from cause to effect, not contrariwise, for sadness is rarely a producer of beauty. That is peculiarly the province of joy. The exquisite beauty of a sunset is not exhilarating, but tends to a sort of melancholy that is not far from delight. The haunting beauty of deep, quiet music holds more than a tinge of sadness. The lovely minor cadences of birdsong at twilight are almost depressing. The reason we are affected to sadness by certain forms of placid beauty is twofold. Movement is stimulating and joy-producing, while quietude leads to reflection, and reflection in turn often brings out the tone of regretful longing for that which is past. Secondly, quiet beauty produces a vague aspiration for the relatively unattainable, yet does not stimulate to the tremendous effort necessary to make the dimly desired state or object ours. We must distinguish for these reasons between the sadness of beauty and the joy of beauty. True joy is a deep inner thing, and takes in much more than the idea of bounding sanguine spirits, for it includes a certain active contentedness of heart. In this chapter, however, the word will have its optimistic, exuberant connotation. We are thinking now of vivid, bright-eyed, laughing joy. Musical joyous tones constitute voice charm, a subtle magnetism that is delightfully contagious. Now it might seem to the desultory reader that to take the lancet and cut into this alluring voice quality would be to dissect a butterfly wing and so destroy its charm. Yet, how can we induce an effect if we are not certain as to the cause? Nasal resonance produces the bell tones of the voice. The tone passages of the nose must be kept entirely free for the bright tones of the voice. And, after our warning in the preceding chapter, you will not confuse what is popularly and erroneously called a nasal tone with the true nasal quality, which is so well illustrated by the voice work of trained French singers and speakers. To develop nasal resonance, sing the following, dwelling as long as possible on the ng mm sounds. Pitch the voice in the nasal cavity. Practice both in high and low registers, and develop range with brightness. Sing, song. Ding, dong. Hong, kong. Long, thong. Practice in the falsetto voice develops a bright quality in the normal speaking voice. Try the following, and any other selections you choose, in a falsetto voice. A man's falsetto voice is extremely high and womanish, so men should not practice in falsetto after the exercise becomes tiresome. She perfectly scorned the best of his clan, and declared the ninth of any man a perfectly vulgar fraction. The actress, Mary Anderson, asked the poet Longfellow what she could do to improve her voice. He replied, Read aloud daily. Joyous lyric poetry. The joyous tones are the bright tones. Develop them by exercise. Practice your voice exercises in an attitude of joy. Under the influence of pleasure, the body expands, the tone passages open, the action of heart and lungs is accelerated, and all the primary conditions for good tone are established. More songs float out from the broken windows of the negro cabins in the south than from the palatial homes on Fifth Avenue. Henry Ward Beecher said the happiest days of his life were not when he had become an international character, but when he was an unknown minister out in Lawrenceville, Ohio, sweeping his own church and working as a carpenter to help pay the grocer. Happiness is largely an attitude of mind, of viewing life from the right angle. 
the optimistic attitude can be cultivated, and it will express itself in voice charm. A telephone company recently placarded this motto in their booths. The voice with the smile wins. It does. Try it. Reading joyous prose or lyric poetry will help put smile and joy of soul into your voice. The following selections are excellent for practice. Remember that when you first practice these classics, you are to give sole attention to two things, a joyous attitude of heart and body, and bright tones of the voice. After these ends have been attained to your satisfaction, carefully review the principles of public speaking laid down in the preceding chapters, and put them into practice as you read these passages again and again. It would be better to commit each selection to memory. Selections for Practice From Milton's L'Allegro Haste thee, nymph, and bring with thee jest, and youthful jollity, quips and cranks and wanton wiles, nods and becks and wreathed smiles, such as hang on Heba's cheek, and love to live in dimple sleek, sport that wrinkled care derides, and laughter holding both his sides. Come and trip it as ye go on the light fantastic toe, and in thy right hand lead with thee the mountain nymph, sweet liberty. And if I give thee honour due, mirth, admit me of thy crew, to live with her and live with thee in unreproved pleasures free. To hear the lark begin his flight, and singing, startle the dull night from his watch-tower in the skies, till the dappled dawn doth rise, then to come in spite of sorrow, and at my window bid good morrow through the sweet briar, or the vine, or the twisted eglantine while the cock with lively din scatters the rear of darkness thin, and to the stack or the barn door stoutly struts his dames before. Oft listening how the hounds and horn cheerly rouse the slumbering morn from the side of some hoar hill, through the high wood echoing shrill, sometime walking not unseen by hedgerow elms on hillocks green, right against the eastern gate where the great sun begins his state. Robed in flames and amber light, the clouds in thousand liveries dight, while the ploughman near at hand whistles o'er the furrowed land, and the milkmaid singing blithe, and the mower wets his scythe, and every shepherd tells his tale under the hawthorn in the dale. The Sea The sea, the sea, the open sea, the blue, the fresh, the fever-free, Without a mark, without a bound, it runneth the earth's wide regions round. It plays with the clouds, it mocks the skies, or like a cradled creature lies. I'm on the sea. I'm on the sea. I am where I would ever be. With the blue above and the blue below, and silence wheresoe'er I go. If a storm should come and awake the deep, what matter? I shall ride and sleep. I love, oh, how I love to ride on the fierce, foaming, bursting tide, where every mad wave drowns the moon, and whistles aloft its tempest tune, and tells how goeth the world below, and why the southwest wind doth blow. I never was on the dull, tame shore, but I loved the great sea more and more, and backward flew to her billowy breast like a bird that seeketh her mother's nest, and a mother she was and is to me, for I was born. On the open sea. The waves were white, and red the morn in the noisy hour when I was born. The whale it whistled, the porpoise rolled, and the dolphins bared their backs of gold, and never was heard such an outcry wild as welcome to life the ocean child. I have lived since then in calm and strife, full fifty summers a rover's life, with wealth to spend and a power to range, but never have sought or sighed for change. And death, whenever he comes to me, shall come on the wide, unbounded sea. Barry Cornwall The sun does not shine for a few trees and flowers, but for the wide world's joy. The lonely pine upon the mountain top waves its somber boughs and cries, Thou art my sun. And the little meadow violet lifts its cup of blue and whispers with its perfumed breath, Thou art my son, and the grain in a thousand fields rustles in the wind, 
and makes answer, Thou art my son. And so God sits effulgent in heaven, not for a favored few, but for the universe of life, and there is no creature so poor or so low that he may not look up with childlike confidence and say, My father, thou art mine. Henry Ward Beecher The Lark Bird of the wilderness, blithesome and cumberless, sweet be thy matin o'er moorland and lea. Emblem of happiness, blessed is thy dwelling place, O oh, to abide in the desert with thee. Wild is thy lay and loud, far in the downy cloud, love gives it energy, love gave it birth. Where on thy dewy wing, where art thou journeying? Thy lay is in heaven, thy love is on earth. O'er fell and fountain sheen, o'er moor and mountain green, O'er the red streamer that heralds the day, Over the cloudlet dim, over the rainbow's rim, Musical cherub soar, singing away. Then when the gloaming comes, low in the heather blooms, Sweet will thy welcome and bed of love be. Emblem of happiness, blessed is thy dwelling place, O oh, to abide in the desert with thee. James Hogg in joyous conversation there is an elastic touch, a delicate stroke upon the central ideas, generally following a pause. This elastic touch adds vivacity to the voice. If you try repeatedly, it can be sensed by feeling the tongue strike the teeth. The entire absence of elastic touch in the voice can be observed in the thick tongue of the intoxicated man. Try to talk with the tongue lying still in the bottom of the mouth, and you will obtain largely the same effect. Vivacity of utterance is gained by using the tongue to strike off the emphatic idea with a decisive, elastic touch. Deliver the following with decisive strokes on the emphatic ideas. Deliver it in a vivacious manner, noting the elastic touch action of the tongue. A flexible, responsive tongue is absolutely essential to good voice work. From Napoleon's Address to the Directory on His Return from Egypt what have you done with that brilliant France which I left you? I left you at peace, and I find you at war. I left you victorious, and I find you defeated. I left you the millions of Italy, and I find only spoliation and poverty. What have you done with a hundred thousand Frenchmen, my companions in glory? They are dead. This state of affairs cannot last long, in less than three years, it would plunge us into depotism. Practice the following selection for the development of elastic touch. Say it in a joyous spirit, using the exercise to develop voice charm in all the ways suggested in this chapter. The Brook I come from haunts of coot and hern, I make a sudden sally, And sparkle out among the fern, To bicker down a valley. By thirty hills I hurry down, or slip between the ridges, By twenty thorps, a little town, and half a hundred bridges, Till last by Philip's farm I flow to join the brimming river, For men may come, and men may go, but I go on forever. I chatter over stony ways in little sharps and trebles, I bubble into eddying bays, I babble on the pebbles. With many a curve my banks I fret, by many a field and fallow, And many a fairy foreland set With willow-weed and mallow. I chatter, chatter, as I flow To join the brimming river, For men may come, and men may go, But I go on forever. I wind about, and in and out, With here a blossom sailing, And here and there a lusty trout, And here and there a grayling. And here and there a foamy flake upon me as I travel, With many a silvery water-break above the golden gravel, And draw them all along, and flow to join the brimming river, For men may come, and men may go, but I go on for ever. I steal by lawns and grassy plots, I slide by hazel covers, I move the sweet forget-me-nots that grow for happy lovers. I slip, I slide, I gloom, I glance, among my skimming swallows. I make the netted sunbeam dance against my sandy shallows. 
I murmur under moon and stars in brambly wildernesses. I linger by my shingly bars. I loiter round my cresses. And out again I curve and flow to join the brimming river, for men may come and men may go, but I go on for ever. Alfred Tennyson The children at play on the street, glad from sheer physical vitality, display a resonance and charm in their voices quite different from the voices that float through the silent halls of the hospitals. A skilled physician can tell much about his patient's condition from the mere sound of the voice. Failing health, or even physical weariness, tells through the voice. It is always well to rest, and be entirely refreshed before attempting to deliver a public address. As to health, neither scope nor space permits us to discuss here the laws of hygiene. There are many excellent books on this subject. In the reign of Roman Emperor Tiberius, one senator wrote to another, To the wise, a word is sufficient. The apparel oft proclaims the man. The voice always does. It is one of the greatest revealers of character. The superficial woman, the brutish man, the reprobate, the person of culture, often discloses inner nature in the voice for even the cleverest dissembler cannot entirely prevent its tones and qualities being affected by the slightest change of thought or emotion. In anger it becomes high, harsh, and unpleasant. In love, low, soft, and melodious. The variations are as limitless as they are fascinating to observe. Visit a theatrical hotel in a large city, and listen to the buzz-saw voices of the chorus girls from some burlesque attraction. The explanation is simple. Buzzsaw lives. Emerson said, When a man lives with God, his voice shall be as sweet as the murmur of the brook, or the rustle of the corn. It is impossible to think selfish thoughts, and have either an attractive personality, a lovely character, or a charming voice. If you want to possess voice charm, cultivate a deep, sincere sympathy for mankind. Love will shine out through your eyes, and proclaim itself in your tones. One secret of the sweetness of the canary's song may be his freedom from tainted thoughts. Your character beautifies or mars your voice. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is his voice. Questions and Exercises 1. Define A. Charm B. Joy C. Beauty 2. Make a list of all the words related to joy. 3. Write a three-minute eulogy of the joyful man. 4. Deliver it without the use of notes. Have you carefully considered all the qualities that go to make up voice charm in its delivery? 5. Tell briefly, in your own words, what means may be employed to develop a charming voice. 6. Discuss the effect of voice on character. 7. Discuss the effect of character on voice. 8. Analyze the voice charm of any speaker or singer you choose. 9. Analyze the defects of any given voice. 10. Make a short humorous speech imitating certain voice defects, pointing out reasons. 11. Commit to the following stanza, and interpret each phrase of delight, suggested or expressed, by the poet. An infant when it gazes on a light. A child the moment when it drains the breast. A devotee when soars the host in sight. An Arab with a stranger for a guest. A sailor when the prize has struck in fight. A miser filling his most hoarded chest. Feel rapture, but not such true joy are reaping as they who watch o'er what they love while sleeping. Byron Don Juan End of section thirteen Recording by Matthew Rees Section fourteen of the Art of Public Speaking 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Eisenwein. Section 14 distinctness and precision of utterance in man speaks god hesiod words and days and endless are the modes of speech and far extends from side to side the field of words homer iliad in popular usage, the terms pronunciation, enunciation, and articulation are synonymous. But real pronunciation includes three distinct processes and may therefore be defined as the utterance of a syllable or a group of syllables with regard to articulation, accentuation, and enunciation. Distinct and precise utterance is one of the most important considerations of public speech. How preposterous it is to hear a speaker making sounds of inarticulate earnestness under the contented delusion that he is telling something to his audience. Telling? Telling means communicating. And how can he actually communicate without making every word distinct slovenly pronunciation results from either physical deformity or habit a surgeon or a surgeon dentist may correct a deformity but your own will working by self-observation and resolution in drill will break a habit all depends on whether you think it worth while Defective speech is so widespread that freedom from it is the exception. It is painfully common to hear public speakers mutilate the king's English. If they do not actually murder it, as Curran once said, they often knock an eye out, the letter I. A Canadian clergyman, writing in the homiletic review, relates that in his student days, Quote, a classmate who was an Englishman supplied a country church for a Sunday. On the following Monday, he conducted a missionary meeting. In the course of his address, he said, Some farmers thought they were doing their duty toward missions when they gave their hods and hens to the work, but the Lord required more. At the close of the meeting, a young woman seriously said to a friend, I am sure the farmers do well if they give their hogs and hens to missions. It is more than most people can afford. It is insufferable effrontery for any man to appear before an audience who persists in driving the H out of happiness, home, and heaven. And to paraphrase, Waldo Massaros will not let it rest in hell. He who does not show enough self-knowledge to see in himself such glaring faults, nor enough self-mastery to correct them, has no business to instruct others. If he can do no better, he should be silent. If he will do no better, he should also be silent. Barring incurable physical defects, and few are incurable nowadays, the whole matter is one of will. The catalogue of those who have done the impossible by faithful work is as inspiring as a roll call of warriors. The less there is of you, says Nathan Shepard, the more need for you to make the most of what there is of you. Articulation Articulation is the forming and joining of the elementary sounds of speech. It seems an appalling task to utter articulately 
the third of a million words that go to make up our English vocabulary. But the way to make a beginning is really simple. Learn to utter correctly and with easy change from one to the other each of the 44 elementary sounds in our language. The reasons why articulation is so painfully slurred by a great many public speakers are four. Ignorance of the elemental sounds. Failure to discriminate between sounds nearly alike. A slovenly, lazy use of the vocal organs and a torpid will. Anyone who is still master of himself will know how to handle each of these defects. The vowel sounds are the most vexing source of errors, especially where diphthongs are found. Who has not heard such errors as are hit off in this inimitable verse by Oliver Wendell Holmes? Learning condemns beyond the reach of hope the careless lips that speak of sop for soap. Her edict exiles from her fair abode the clownish voice that utters rod for road, less stern to him who calls his coat a caught, and steers his boat believing it a bought. She pardoned one, our classic city's boast, who said at Cambridge, most instead of most, but knit her brows and stamped her angry foot to hear a teacher call a root a root. The foregoing examples are all monosyllables, but bad articulation is frequently the result of joining sounds that do not belong together. For example, no one finds it difficult to say beauty, but may persist in pronouncing duty as though it were spelled either duty or duty. It is not only from untaught speakers that we hear such slovenly articulations as colium for column and pretty for pretty, but even great orators occasionally offend quite as unblushingly as less noted mortals. Nearly all such errors are of carelessness, not of pure ignorance, of carelessness, because the ear never tries to hear what the lips articulate. It must be exasperating to a foreigner to find that the elemental sound, oo, gives him no hint for the pronunciation of bow, cough, rough, thorough, and through, and we can well forgive even a man of culture who occasionally loses his way amidst the intricacies of English articulation. But there can be no excuse for the slovenly utterance of the simple vowel sounds which form at once the life and the beauty of our language. He who is too lazy to speak distinctly should hold his tongue. The consonant sounds occasion serious trouble only for those who do not look with care at the spelling of words about to be pronounced. Nothing but carelessness can account for saying Jacob, Baptist, Sevem, Always, or Satisfy. He that hath yaws to yaw, let him yaw, is the rendering which an Anglophobiac clergyman gave to the familiar scripture. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. After hearing the name of Sir Humphrey Davy pronounced, a Frenchman, who wished to write to the eminent Englishman, thus addressed the letter, Sirum Fridavy. Accentuation Accentuation is the stressing of the proper syllables in words. This it is that is properly called pronunciation. For instance, we properly say that a word is mispronounced when it is accented invite instead of invite. 
though it is really an offense against only one form of pronunciation, accentuation. It is the work of a lifetime to learn the accents of a large vocabulary and to keep pace with changing usage. But an alert ear, the study of word origins, and the dictionary habit will prove to be mighty helpers in a task that can never be finally completed. Enunciation. Correct enunciation is the complete utterance of all the sounds of a syllable or a word. Wrong articulation gives the wrong sound to the vowel or vowels of a word or a syllable, as do for do, or unites two sounds improperly, as holy for holy. Wrong enunciation is the incomplete utterance of a syllable or a word, the sound omitted or added being usually consonantal. To say necessity instead of necessity is a wrong articulation. To say doing for doing is improper enunciation. The one articulates that is, joints, two sounds that should not be joined, and thus gives the word a positively wrong sound. The other fails to touch all the sounds in the word, and in that particular way also sounds the word incorrectly. My text may be found in the fifth and sixth verses of the second chapter of Titus, and the subject of my discourse is the government of our homes. Footnote number six. School and college speaker, Mitchell. What did this preacher do with his final consonants? This slovenly dropping of essential sounds is as offensive as the common habit of running words together so that they lose their individuality and distinctness. Light and dark, up and down, don't you know, particular, examination, are all too common to need comment. Imperfect enunciation is due to lack of attention and to lazy lips. It can be corrected by resolutely attending to the formation of syllables as they are uttered. Flexible lips will enunciate difficult combinations of sounds without sliding any of them. But such flexibility cannot be attained except by habitually uttering words with distinctness and accuracy. A daily exercise in enunciating a series of sounds will in a short time give flexibility to the lips and alertness to the mind so that no word will be uttered without receiving its due complement of sound. Returning to our definition, we see that when the sounds of a word are properly articulated, the right syllables accented, and full value given to each sound in its enunciation, we have correct pronunciation. Perhaps one word of caution is needed here, lest any one anxious to bring out clearly every sound should overdo the matter and neglect the unity and smoothness of pronunciation. Be careful not to bring syllables into so much prominence as to make words seem long and angular. The joints must be kept decently dressed. Before delivery, do not fail to go over your manuscript and note every sound that may possibly be mispronounced. Consult the dictionary and make assurance doubly sure. If the arrangement of words is unfavorable to clear enunciation, change either words or order, and do not rest until you can follow Hamlet's directions to the players. Questions and Exercises 1. Practice repeating the following rapidly, paying particular attention to the consonants. 
foolish flavius flushing feverishly fiercely found fault with flora's frivolity footnote number seven school and college speaker mitchell mary's matchless mimicry makes much mischief seated on shining shale she sells sea-shells you youngsters yielded your youthful yuletide yearnings yesterday two sound the l in each of the following words repeated in sequence blue black blinkers blocked black blondin's eyes three did you say a blue or a blue sky four compare the u sound in few and in new say each aloud and decide which is correct new york new york or new york five pay careful heed to the directions of this chapter in reading the following from hamlet after the interview with the ghost of his father hamlet tells his friends horatio and marcellus that he intends to act a part horatio o oh, day and night but this is wondrous strange hamlet and therefore as a stranger give it welcome there are more things in heaven and earth horatio than are dreamt of in your philosophy but come here as before never so help your mercy how strange or odd so e'er i bear myself as i perchance hereafter i shall think meet to put an antic disposition on that you at such times seeing me never shall with arms encumbered thus or this head shake or by pronouncing of some doubtful phrase as well well we know or we could and if we would or if we list to speak or there be an if there might or such ambiguous giving out to note that you know aught of me this not to do so grace and mercy at your most need help you swear act one scene five six make a list of common errors of pronunciation saying which are due to faulty articulation wrong accentuation and incomplete enunciation in each case make the correction seven criticize any speech you may have heard which displayed these faults eight explain how the false shame of seeming to be too precise may hinder us from cultivating perfect verbal utterance nine over precision is likewise a fault to bring out any syllable unduly is to caricature the word be moderate in reading the following the last speech of maximilian de robespierre the enemies of the republic call me tyrant were i such they would grovel at my feet i should gorge them with gold i should grant them immunity for their crimes and they would be grateful were i such the kings we have vanquished far from denouncing robespierre would lend me their guilty support there would be a covenant between them and me tyranny must have tools but the enemies of tyranny whither does their path end to the tomb and to immortality what tyrant is my protector to what faction do i belong yourselves what faction since the beginning of the revolution has crushed and annihilated so many detected traitors you the people 
our principles are that faction a faction to which i am devoted and against which all the scandalism of the day is banded the confirmation of the republic has been my object and i know that the republic can be established only on the eternal basis of morality against me and against those who hold kindred principles the league is formed my life oh my life i abandon without a regret i have seen the past and i foresee the future what friend of this country would wish to survive the moment when he could no longer serve it when he could no longer defend innocence against oppression wherefore should i continue in an order of things where intrigue eternally triumphs over truth where justice is mocked where passions the most abject or fears the most absurd override the sacred interests of humanity in witnessing the multitude of vices which the torrent of the revolution has rolled in turbid communion with its civic virtues i confess that i have sometimes feared that i should be sullied in the eyes of posterity by the impure neighborhood of unprincipled men who had thrust themselves into association with the sincere friends of humanity and i rejoice that these conspirators against my country have now by their reckless rage traced deep the line of demarcation between themselves and all true men question history and learn how all the defenders of liberty in all times have been overwhelmed by calumny but their traducers died also the good and the bad disappear alike from the earth but in very different conditions o oh, frenchman o oh, my countrymen let not your enemies with their desolating doctrines degrade your souls and enervate your virtues no chalmet no death is not an eternal sleep citizens efface from the tomb that motto graven by sacrilegious hands which spreads over all nature a funereal crape takes from oppressed innocence its support and affronts the beneficent dispensation of death inscribe rather thereon these words death is the commencement of immortality i leave to the oppressors of the people a terrible testament which i proclaim with the independence befitting one whose career is so nearly ended it is the awful truth thou shalt die end of section fourteen recording by bill mosley frelsberg texas u s a Section 15 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Ezenwein. Section 15 The Truth About Gesture. When Whitefield acted an old blind man advancing by slow steps toward the edge of the precipice, Lord Chesterfield started up and cried, Good God, he is gone! Nathan Shepard, Before an Audience Gesture is really a simple matter that requires observation and common sense rather than a book of rules. Gesture is an outward expression of an inward condition. 
it is merely an effect the effect of a mental or an emotional impulse struggling for expression through physical avenues you must not however begin at the wrong end if you are troubled by your gestures or a lack of gestures attend to the cause not the effect it will not in the least help matters to tack on to your delivery a few mechanical movements if the tree in your front yard is not growing to suit you fertilize and water the soil and let the tree have sunshine obviously it will not help your tree to nail on a few branches if your cistern is dry wait till it rains or bore a well why plunge a pump into a dry hole the speaker whose thoughts and emotions are welling within him like a mountain spring will not have much trouble to make gestures it will be merely a question of properly directing them if his enthusiasm for his subject is not such as to give him a natural impulse for dramatic action it will avail nothing to furnish him with a long list of rules he may tack on some movements but they will look like the wilted branches nailed to a tree to simulate life gestures must be born not built a wooden horse may amuse the children but it takes a live one to go somewhere it is not only impossible to lay down definite rules on this subject but it would be silly to try for everything depends on the speech the occasion the personality and feelings of the speaker and the attitude of the audience it is easy enough to forecast the result of multiplying seven by six but it is impossible to tell any man what kind of gestures he will be impelled to use when he wishes to show his earnestness we may tell him that many speakers close the hand with the exception of the forefinger and pointing that finger straight at the audience pour out their thoughts like a volley or that others stamp one foot for emphasis or that mr bryan often slaps his hands together for great force holding one palm upward in an easy manner or that gladstone would sometimes make a rush at the clerk's table in parliament and smite it with his hand so forcefully that disraeli once brought down the house by grimly congratulating himself that such a barrier stood between himself and the honourable gentleman all these things and a book full more may we tell the speaker but we cannot know whether he can use these gestures or not any more than we can decide whether he could wear mr bryan's clothes the best that can be done on this subject is to offer a few practical suggestions and let personal good taste decide as to where effective dramatic action ends and extravagant motion begins any gesture that merely calls attention to itself is bad the purpose of a gesture is to carry your thought and feeling into the minds and hearts of your hearers this it does by emphasizing your message by interpreting it by expressing it in action by striking its tone in either a physically descriptive a suggestive or a typical gesture and let it be remembered all the time that gesture includes all physical movement from facial expression and the tossing of the head to the expressive movements of hand and foot a shifting of the pose may be a most effective gesture what is true of gesture is true of all life if the people on the street turn around and watch you walk your walk is more important than you are change it if the attention of your audience is called to your gestures they are not convincing because they appear to be what they have a doubtful right to be in reality studied have you ever seen a speaker use such grotesque gesticulations that you were fascinated by their frenzy of oddity but could not follow his thought do not smother ideas with gymnastics savonarola would rush down from the high pulpit among the congregation in the duomo at florence and carry the fire of conviction to his hearers billy sunday slides to base on the platform carpet in dramatizing one of his baseball illustrations yet in both instances the message has somehow stood out bigger than the gesture it is chiefly in calm afterthought that men have remembered the form of dramatic expression when sir henry irving made his famous exit as shylock the last thing the audience saw was his pallid avaricious hand extended skinny and claw-like against the background at the time every one was overwhelmed by the tremendous typical quality of this gesture now we have time to think of its art and discuss its realistic power 
only when gesture is subordinated to the absorbing importance of the idea a spontaneous living expression of living truth is it justifiable at all and when it is remembered for itself as a piece of unusual physical energy or as a poem of grace it is a dead failure as dramatic expression there is a place for a unique style of walking it is the circus or the cakewalk there is a place for surprisingly rhythmical evolutions of arms and legs it is on the dance floor or the stage don't let your agility and grace put your thoughts out of business one of the present writers took his first lessons in gesture from a certain college president who knew far more about what had happened at the diet of worms than he did about how to express himself in action his instructions were to start the movement on a certain word continue it on a precise curve and unfold the fingers at the conclusion ending with the forefinger just so plenty and more than plenty has been published on this subject giving just such silly directions gesture is a thing of mentality and feeling not a matter of geometry remember whenever a pair of shoes a method of pronunciation or a gesture calls attention to itself it is bad when you have made really good gestures in a good speech your hearers will not go away saying what beautiful gestures he made but they will say i'll vote for that measure he is right i believe in that gestures should be born of the moment the best actors and public speakers rarely know in advance what gestures they are going to make they make one gesture on certain words tonight and none at all tomorrow night at the same point their various moods and interpretations govern their gestures it is all a matter of impulse and intelligent feeling with them don't overlook that word intelligent nature does not always provide the same kind of sunsets or snowflakes and the movements of a good speaker vary almost as much as the creations of nature now all this is not to say that you must not take some thought for your gestures if that were meant why this chapter when the sergeant despairingly besought the recruit in the awkward squad to step out and look at himself he gave splendid advice and worthy of personal application particularly while you are in the learning days of public speaking you must learn to criticize your own gestures recall them see where they were useless crude awkward what not and do better next time there is a vast deal of difference between being conscious of self and being self-conscious it will require your nice discrimination in order to cultivate spontaneous gestures and yet give due attention to practice while you depend upon the moment it is vital to remember that only a dramatic genius can effectively accomplish such feats as we have related of whitefield savonarola and others and doubtless the first time they were used they came in a burst of spontaneous feeling yet whitefield declared that not until he had delivered a sermon forty times was its delivery perfected what spontaneity initiates let practice complete every effective speaker and every vivid actor has observed considered and practiced gesture until his dramatic actions are a subconscious possession just like his ability to pronounce correctly without especially concentrating his thought every able platform man has possessed himself of a dozen ways in which he might depict in gesture any given emotion in fact the means for such expression are endless and this is precisely why it is both useless and harmful to make a chart of gestures and enforce them as the ideals of what may be used to express this or that feeling practice descriptive suggestive and typical movements until they come as naturally as a good articulation and rarely forecast the gestures you will use at a given moment leave everything to that moment avoid monotony in gesture Roast beef is an excellent dish, but it would be terrible as an exclusive diet. No matter how effective one gesture is, do not overwork it. Put variety into your actions. Monotony will destroy all beauty and power. The pump handle makes one effective gesture, and on hot days that one is very eloquent, but it has its limitations. Any movement that is not significant weakens. Do not forget that. 
restlessness is not expression. A great many useless movements will only take the attention of the audience from what you are saying. A widely noted man introduced the speaker of the evening one Sunday lately to a New York audience. The only thing remembered about that introductory speech is that the speaker played nervously with the covering of the table as he talked. We naturally watch moving objects. A janitor putting down a window can take the attention of the hearers from Mr. Roosevelt. By making a few movements at one side of the stage, a chorus girl may draw the interest of the spectators from a big scene between the leads. When our forefathers lived in caves, they had to watch moving objects, for movements meant danger. We have not yet overcome the habit. Advertisers have taken advantage of it. Witness the moving electric light signs in any city. A shrewd speaker will respect this law and conserve the attention of his audience by eliminating all unnecessary movements. Gesture should either be simultaneous with or precede the words, not follow them. Lady Macbeth says, Bear welcome in your eye, your hand, your tongue. Reverse this order and you get comedy. Say, There he goes, pointing at him after you have finished your words, and see if the result is not comical. Do not make short, jerky movements. Some speakers seem to be imitating a waiter who has failed to get a tip. Let your movements be easy and from the shoulder, as a rule, rather than from the elbow. But do not go to the other extreme and make too many flowing motions. That savors of the lackadaisical. Put a little punch and life into your gestures. You cannot, however, do this mechanically. The audience will detect it if you do. They may not know just what is wrong, but the gesture will have a false appearance to them. Facial expression is important. Have you ever stopped in front of a Broadway theater and looked at the photographs of the cast? Notice the row of chorus girls who are supposed to be expressing fear. Their attitudes are so mechanical that the attempt is ridiculous. Notice the picture of the star expressing the same emotion. His muscles are drawn, his eyebrows lifted, he shrinks, and fear shines through his eyes. That actor felt fear when the photograph was taken. The chorus girls felt that it was time for a rare bit, and more nearly expressed that emotion than they did fear. Incidentally, that is one reason why they stay in the chorus. The movements of the facial muscles may mean a great deal more than the movements of the hand. The man who sits in a dejected heap with a look of despair on his face is expressing his thoughts and feelings just as effectively as the man who is waving his arms and shouting from the back of a dray wagon. The eye has been called the window of the soul. Through it shines the light of our thoughts and feelings. Do not use too much gesture. As a matter of fact, in the big crises of life, we do not go through many actions. When your closest friend dies, you do not throw up your hands and talk about your grief. You are more likely to sit and brood in dry-eyed silence. The Hudson River does not make much noise on its way to the sea. It is not half so loud as the little creek up in Bronx Park that a bullfrog could leap across. The barking dog never tears your trousers. At least they say he doesn't. Do not fear the man who waves his arms and shouts his anger, but the man who comes up quietly with eyes flaming and face burning may knock you down. Fuss is not force. Observe these principles in nature and practice them in your delivery. The writer of this chapter once observed an instructor drilling a class in gesture. They had come to the passage from Henry the Eighth, in which the humbled cardinal says, Farewell, a long farewell to all my greatness. It is one of the pathetic passages of literature. A man uttering such a sentiment would be crushed, and the last thing on earth he would do would be to make flamboyant movements. Yet this class had an elocutionary manual before them that gave an appropriate gesture for every occasion, from paying the gas bill to deathbed farewells. So they were instructed to throw their arms out at full length on each side and say, Farewell, a long farewell to all my greatness. Such a gesture might possibly be used in an after-dinner speech at the convention of a telephone company whose lines extended from the Atlantic to the Pacific, 
but to think of Wolsey's using that movement would suggest that his fate was just. Posture. The physical attitude to be taken before the audience really is included in gesture. Just what that attitude should be depends, not on rules, but on the spirit of the speech and the occasion. Senator La Follette stood for three hours with his weight thrown on his forward foot as he leaned out over the footlights, ran his fingers through his hair, and flamed out a denunciation of the trusts. It was very effective. But imagine a speaker taking that kind of position to discourse on the development of road-making machinery. If you have a fiery, aggressive message, and will let yourself go, nature will naturally pull your weight to your forward foot. A man in a hot political argument or a street brawl never has to stop to think upon which foot he should throw his weight. You may sometimes place your weight on your back foot if you have a restful and calm message. But don't worry about it. Just stand like a man who genuinely feels what he is saying. Do not stand with your heels close together like a soldier or a butler. No more should you stand with them wide apart like a traffic policeman. Use simple good manners and common sense. Here a word of caution is needed. We have advised you to allow your gestures and postures to be spontaneous and not woodenly prepared beforehand, but do not go to the extreme of ignoring the importance of acquiring mastery of your physical movements. A muscular hand made flexible by free movement is far more likely to be an effective instrument in gesture than a stiff pudgy bunch of fingers. If your shoulders are lithe and carried well, while your chest does not retreat from association with your chin, the chances of using good extemporaneous gestures are so much the better. Learn to keep the back of your neck touching your collar, hold your chest high, and keep down your waist measure. So attention to strength, poise, flexibility, and grace of body are the foundations of good gesture, for they are expressions of vitality, and without vitality no speaker can enter the kingdom of power. When an awkward giant like Abraham Lincoln rose to the sublimest heights of oratory, he did so because of the greatness of his soul. His very ruggedness of spirit and artless honesty were properly expressed in his gnarly body. The fire of character, of earnestness, and of message swept his hearers before him when the tepid words of an insincere Apollo would have left no effect but be sure you are a second Lincoln before you despise the handicap of physical awkwardness. Ty Cobb has confided to the public that when he was in a batting slump he even stands before a mirror, bat in hand, to observe the swing and follow-through of his batting form. If you would learn to stand well before an audience, look at yourself in a mirror, but not too often. Practice walking and standing before the mirror, so as to conquer awkwardness, not to cultivate a pose. Stand on the platform in the same easy manner that you would use before guests in a drawing-room. If your position is not graceful, make it so by dancing, gymnasium work, and by getting grace and poise in your mind. Do not continually hold the same position. Any big change of thought necessitates a change of position. Be at home, there are no rules, it is all a matter of taste. While on the platform, forget that you have any hands until you desire to use them, then remember them effectively. Gravity will take care of them. Of course, if you want to put them behind you or fold them once in a while, it is not going to ruin your speech. Thought and feeling are the big things in speaking, not the position of a foot or a hand. Simply put your limbs where you want them to be, you have a will, so do not neglect to use it. Let us reiterate, do not despise practice. Your gestures and movements may be spontaneous and still be wrong. No matter how natural they are, it is possible to improve them. It is impossible for anyone, even yourself, to criticize your gestures until after they are made. You can't prune a peach tree until it comes up. Therefore speak much, and observe your own speech. While you are examining yourself, do not forget to study statuary and paintings, to see how the great portrayers of nature have made their subjects express ideas through action. Notice the gestures of the best speakers and actors. Observe the physical expression of life everywhere. 
the leaves on the tree respond to the slightest breeze the muscles of your face the light of your eyes should respond to the slightest change of feeling emerson says every man that i meet is my superior in some way in that i learn of him illiterate italians make gestures so wonderful and beautiful that booth or barrett might have sat at their feet and been instructed open your eyes emerson says again we are immersed in beauty but our eyes have no clear vision toss this book to one side go out and watch one child plead with another for a bite of apple see a street brawl observe life in action do you want to know how to express victory watch the victor's hands go high on election night do you want to plead a cause make a composite photograph of all the pleaders in daily life you constantly see beg borrow and steal the best you can get but don't give it out as theft assimilate it until it becomes a part of you then let the expression come out questions and exercises one from what source do you intend to study gesture two what is the first requisite of good gestures why three why is it impossible to lay down steel-clad rules for gesturing? 4. Describe a. A graceful gesture that you have observed. b. A forceful one. c. An extravagant one. d. An inappropriate one. 5. What gestures do you use for emphasis? Why? 6. How can grace of movement be acquired? 7. When in doubt about a gesture, what would you do? 8. What, according to your observations before a mirror, are your faults in gesturing? 9. How do you intend to correct them? 10. What are some of the gestures, if any, that you might use in delivering Thurston's speech, page 50, Grady's speech, page 36? Be specific. 11. Describe some particularly appropriate gesture that you have observed. Why was it appropriate? 12. Cite at least three movements in nature that might well be imitated in gesture. 13. What would you gather from the expressions descriptive gesture, suggestive gesture, and typical gesture? 14. Select any elemental emotion, such as fear, and try, by picturing in your mind at least five different situations that might call forth this emotion, to express its several phases by gesture, including posture, movement, and facial expression. 15. Do the same thing for such other emotions as you may select. 16. Select three passages from any source, only being sure that they are suitable for public delivery, memorize each, and then devise gestures suitable for each say why 17 criticize the gestures in any speech you have heard recently 18 practice flexible movement of the hand what exercises did you find useful 19 carefully observe some animal then devise several typical gestures 20 write a brief dialogue between any two animals read it aloud and invent expressive gestures 21. Deliver with appropriate gestures the quotation that heads this chapter. 22. Read aloud the following incident using dramatic gestures. Quote, when Voltaire was preparing a young actress to appear in one of his tragedies, he tied her hands to her sides with pack thread in order to check her tendency toward exuberant gesticulation. Under this condition of compulsory immobility, she commenced to rehearse and for some time she bore herself calmly enough, but at last, completely carried away by her feelings, she burst her bonds and flung up her arms. Alarmed at her supposed neglect of his instructions, she began to apologize to the poet. He smilingly reassured her, however, the gesture was then admirable, because it was irrepressible. End quote. Redway, The Actor's Art. 23. Render the following with suitable gestures. Quote, One day while preaching, Whitefield, quote, 
suddenly assumed a nautical air and manner that were irresistible with him, end quote, and broke forth in these words, quote, Well, my boys, we have a clear sky and are making fine headway over a smooth sea before a light breeze, and we shall soon lose sight of land. But what means this sudden lowering of the heavens, and that dark cloud arising from beneath the western horizon? Hark! Don't you hear distant thunder? Don't you see those flashes of lightning? There is a storm gathering, every man to his duty. The air is dark, the tempest rages, our masts are gone, the ship is on her beam ends. What next? End quote. At this, a number of sailors in the congregation, utterly swept away by the dramatic description, leaped to their feet and cried, The longboat! Take to the longboat! End quote. Nathan Shepard, Before an Audience. End of section 15. Recording by Tricia G. Section 16 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Eisenwein. Section 16. Chapter 16. Methods of Delivery. The crown, the consummation of the discourse, is its delivery. Toward it all preparation looks. For it the audience waits. By it the speaker is judged. All the forces of the orator's life converge in his oratory. The logical acuteness with which he marshals the facts around his theme. The rhetorical facility with which he orders his language the control to which he has attained in the use of his body as a single organ of expression, whatever richness of acquisition and experience are his, these are all now incidents. The fact is the sending of his message home to his hearers. The hour of delivery is the supreme inevitable hour for the orator. It is this fact that makes lack of adequate preparation such an impertinence and it is this that sends such thrills of indescribable joy through the orator's whole being when he has achieved a success it is like the mother forgetting her pangs for the joy of bringing a son into the world j b e how to attract and hold an audience there are four fundamental methods of delivering an address. All others are modifications of one or more of these. Reading from manuscript. Committing the written speech and speaking from memory. Speaking from notes. And extemporaneous speech. It is impossible to say which form of delivery is best for all speakers in all circumstances. In deciding for yourself, you should consider the occasion, the nature of the audience, the character of your subject, and your own limitations of time and ability. However, it is worth while warning you not to be lenient in self-exaction. Say to yourself courageously, what others can do, I can attempt. A bold spirit conquers where others flinch, and a trying task challenges pluck. Reading from Manuscript This method really deserves short shrift in a book on public speaking, for, delude yourself as you may, public reading is not public speaking. Yet, there are so many who grasp this broken reed for support that we must here discuss the red speech apologetic misnomer as it is certainly there are occasions among them the opening of congress 
the presentation of a sore question before a deliberative body, or a historical commemoration, when it may seem not alone to the orator, but to all those interested, that the chief thing is to express certain thoughts in precise language, in language that must not be either misunderstood or misquoted. At such times, oratory is unhappily elbowed to a back bench. The manuscript is solemnly withdrawn from the capacious inner pocket of the new frock coat, and every one settles himself resignedly with only a feeble flicker of hope that the so-called speech may not be as long as it is thick. The words may be golden, but the hearer's eyes are prone to be leaden, and in about one instance out of a hundred does the perpetrator really deliver an impressive address. His excuse is his apology. He is not to be blamed, as a rule, for someone decreed that it would be dangerous to cut loose from manuscript moorings and take his audience with him on a really delightful sail. One great trouble on such great occasions is that the essayist, for such he is, has been chosen not because of his speaking ability, but because his grandfather fought in a certain battle, or his constituents sent him to Congress, or his gifts in some line of endeavor other than speaking have distinguished him. As well choose a surgeon from his ability to play golf. To be sure, it always interests an audience to see a great man. Because of his eminence, they are likely to listen to his words with respect, perhaps with interest, even when droned from a manuscript. But how much more effective such a deliverance would be if the papers were cast aside. Nowhere is the red address so common as in the pulpit. The pulpit, that in these days least of all can afford to invite a handicap. Doubtless many clergymen prefer finish to fervor. Let them choose... They are rarely men who sway the masses to acceptance of their message. What they gain in precision and elegance of language, they lose in force. There are just four motives that can move a man to read his address or sermon. 1. Laziness is the commonest. Enough said. Even heaven cannot make a lazy man efficient. 2. A memory so defective that he really cannot speak without reading. Alas, he is not speaking when he is reading, so his dilemma is painful, and not to himself alone. But no man has a right to assume that his memory is utterly bad until he has buckled down to memory culture and failed. A weak memory is oftener an excuse than a reason. 3. A genuine lack of time to do more than write the speech. There are such instances, but they do not occur every week. The disposition of your time allows more flexibility than you realize. Motive 3 too often harnesses up with motive 1. 4. A conviction that the speech is too important to risk forsaking the manuscript. But if it is vital that every word should be so precise, the style so polished, and the thoughts so logical, that the preacher must write a sermon entire, is not the message important enough to warrant extra effort in perfecting its delivery? It is an insult to a congregation and disrespectful to Almighty God to put the phrasing of a message above the message itself. To reach the hearts of the hearers, the sermon must be delivered. It is only half delivered when the speaker cannot utter it with original fire and force, when he merely repeats words that were conceived hours or weeks before 
and hence are like champagne that has lost its fizz. The reading preacher's eyes are tied down to his manuscript. He cannot give the audience the benefit of his expression. How long would a play fill a theater if the actors held their cue books in hand and read their parts? Imagine Patrick Henry reading his famous speech. Peter the Hermit, manuscript in hand, exhorting the Crusaders. Napoleon, constantly looking at his papers, addressing the army at the pyramids. Or Jesus, reading the Sermon on the Mount. These speakers were so full of their subjects, their general preparation had been so richly adequate, that there was no necessity for a manuscript either to refer to or to serve as an outward and visible sign of their preparedness. No event was ever so dignified that it required an artificial attempt at speech-making. Call an essay by its right name, but never call it a speech. Perhaps the most dignified of events is a supplication to the Creator. If you ever listen to the reading of an original prayer, you must have felt its superficiality. Regardless of what the theories may be about manuscript delivery, the fact remains that it does not work out with efficiency. Avoid it whenever at all possible. Committing the Written Speech and Speaking from Memory This method has certain points in its favor. If you have time and leisure, it is possible to polish and rewrite your ideas until they are expressed in clear, concise terms. Pope sometimes spent a whole day in perfecting one couplet. Gibbon consumed twenty years gathering material for and rewriting the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Although you cannot devote such painstaking preparation to a speech, you should take time to eliminate useless words, crowd whole paragraphs into a sentence, and choose proper illustrations. Good speeches, like plays, are not written, they are rewritten. The National Cash Register Company follows this plan with their most efficient selling organization. They require their salesmen to memorize verbatim a selling talk. They maintain that there is one best way of putting their selling arguments, and they insist that each salesman use this ideal way rather than employ any haphazard phrases that may come to his mind at the moment. The method of writing and committing has been adopted by many noted speakers. Julius Caesar, Robert Ingersoll, and on some occasions Wendell Phillips, were distinguished examples. The wonderful effects achieved by some famous actors were, of course, accomplished through the delivery of memorized lines. The inexperienced speaker must be warned before attempting this method of delivery that it is difficult and trying, it requires much skill to make it efficient. The memorized lines of the young speaker will usually sound like memorized words, and repel. If you want to hear an example, listen to a department store demonstrator repeat her memorized lingo about the newest furniture polish or breakfast food. It requires training to make a memorized speech sound fresh and spontaneous, and unless you have a fine native memory, in each instance the finished product necessitates much labor. Should you forget a part of your speech or miss a few words, you are liable to be so confused that, like Mark Twain's guide in Rome, you will be compelled to repeat your lines from the beginning. On the other hand, you may be so taken up with trying to recall your written words that you will not abandon yourself to the spirit of your address and so fail to deliver it with that spontaneity which is so vital to forceful delivery. But do not let these difficulties frighten you. If committing seems best to you, give it a faithful trial. Do not be deterred by its pitfalls, but by resolute practice avoid them. 
one of the best ways to rise superior to these difficulties is to do as dr wallace radcliffe often does commit without writing the speech making practically all the preparation mentally without putting pen to paper a laborious but effective way of cultivating both mind and memory you will find it excellent practice both for memory and delivery to commit the specimen speeches found in this volume and declaim them with all attention to the principles we have put before you william ellery channing himself a distinguished speaker years ago had this to say of practice in declamation is there not an amusement having an affinity with the drama which might be usefully introduced among us i mean recitation a work of genius recited by a man of fine taste enthusiasm and powers of elocution is a very pure and high gratification were this art cultivated and encouraged great numbers now insensible to the most beautiful compositions might be waked up to their excellence and power speaking from notes the third and most popular method of delivery is probably also the best one for the beginner speaking from notes is not ideal delivery but we learn to swim in shallow water before going out beyond the ropes make a definite plan for your discourse for a fuller discussion see chapter eighteen and set down the points somewhat in the fashion of a lawyer's brief or a preacher's outline here is a sample of very simple notes attention roman numeral one introduction attention indispensable to the performance of any great work anecdote roman numeral two defined and illustrated arabic one from common observation arabic two from the lives of great men carlyle robert e lee roman numeral three its relation to other mental powers arabic one reason arabic two imagination arabic three memory arabic four will anecdote roman numeral four attention may be cultivated arabic one involuntary attention arabic two voluntary attention examples roman numeral five conclusion the consequences of inattention and of attention few briefs would be so precise as this one for with experience a speaker learns to use little tricks to attract his eye he may underscore a catchword heavily draw a red circle around a pivotal idea enclose the keyword of an anecdote in a wavy lined box and so on indefinitely these points are worth remembering for nothing so eludes the swift glancing eye of the speaker as the sameness of typewriting or even a regular pen script so unintentional a thing as a blot on the page may help you to remember a big point in your brief perhaps by association of ideas an inexperienced speaker would probably require fuller notes than the specimen given yet that way lies danger for the complete manuscript is but a short remove from the copious outline use as few notes as possible they may be necessary for the time being but do not fail to look upon them as a necessary evil and even when you lay them before you refer to them only when compelled to do so make your notes as full as you please in preparation but by all means condense them for platform use.
extemporaneous speech. Surely this is the ideal method of delivery. It is far and away the most popular with the audience, and the favorite method of the most efficient speakers. Extemporaneous speech has sometimes been made to mean unprepared speech, and indeed it is too often precisely that, but in no such sense do we recommend it strongly to speakers old and young. On the contrary, to speak well without notes requires all the preparation which we discuss so fully in the chapter on fluency. While yet relying upon the inspiration of the hour for some of your thoughts and much of your language, you had better remember, however, that the most effective inspiration of the hour is the inspiration you yourself bring to it, bottled up in your spirit and ready to infuse itself into the audience. If you extemporize, you can get much closer to your audience. In a sense, they appreciate the task you have before you and send out their sympathy. Extemporize, and you will not have to stop and fumble around amidst your notes. You can keep your eye afire with your message and hold your audience with your very glance. You yourself will feel their response as you read the effects of your warm, spontaneous words written on their countenances. Sentences written out in the study are liable to be dead and cold when resurrected before the audience. When you create as you speak, you conserve all the native fire of your thought. You can enlarge on one point or omit another, just as the occasion or the mood of the audience may demand. It is not possible for every speaker to use this. The most difficult of all methods of delivery, and least of all can it be used successfully without much practice, but it is the ideal towards which all should strive. One danger in this method is that you may be led aside from your subject into bypaths. To avoid this peril, firmly stick to your mental outline. Practice speaking from a memorized brief until you gain control. Join a debating society. Talk, 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 and always extemporize. You may make a fool of yourself once or twice, but is that too great a price to pay for success? Notes, like crutches, are only a sign of weakness. Remember that the power of your speech depends to some extent upon the view your audience holds of you. General Grant's words as president were more powerful than his words as a Missouri farmer. If you would appear in the light of an authority, be one. Make notes on your brain instead of on paper. Joint Methods of Delivery A modification of the second method has been adopted by many great speakers, particularly lecturers who are compelled to speak on a wide variety of subjects day after day. Such speakers often commit their addresses to memory, but keep their manuscripts in flexible book form before them, turning several pages at a time. They feel safer for having a sheet anchor to windward but it is an anchor nevertheless and hinders rapid free sailing though it drag never so slightly other speakers throw out a little lighter anchor by keeping before them a rather full outline of their written and committed speech others again write and commit a few important parts of the address the introduction the conclusion some vital argument some pat illustration, and depend on the hour for the language of the rest. This method is well adapted to speaking, either with or without notes. Some speakers read from manuscript the most important parts of their speeches, and utter the rest extemporaneously. Thus, what we have called joint methods of delivery are open to much personal variation. You must decide for yourself 
which is best for you, for the occasion, for your subject, for your audience. For these four factors all have their individual claims. Whatever form you choose, do not be so weakly indifferent as to prefer the easy way. Choose the best way, whatever it costs you in time and effort. And of this, be assured, only the practice speaker can hope to gain both conciseness of argument and conviction in manner, polish of language and power in delivery, finish of style and fire in utterance. Questions and Exercises 1. Which in your judgment is the most suitable of delivery for you? Why? 2. What objections can you offer to A. Memorizing the entire speech B. Reading from manuscript C. Using notes D. Speaking from memorized outline or notes E. Any of the joint methods 3. What is there to commend in delivering a speech in any of the foregoing methods? 4. Can you suggest any combination of methods that you have found efficacious? 5. What methods, according to your observation, do most successful speakers use? 6. Select some topic from the list at the end of chapter 11. Narrow the theme so as to make it specific. And deliver a short address utilizing the four methods mentioned in four different deliveries of the speech. 7. Select one of the joint methods and apply it to the delivery of the same address. 8. Which method do you prefer? and why. 9. From the list of subjects in the appendix, select a theme and deliver a five-minute address without notes, but make careful preparation without putting your thoughts on paper. Note. It is earnestly hoped that instructors will not pass this stage of the work without requiring of their students much practice in the delivery of original speeches in the manner that seems, after some experiment, to be best suited to the student's gifts. Students who are studying alone should be equally exacting in demand upon themselves. One point is most important. It is easy to learn to read a speech. Therefore, it is much more urgent that the pupil should have much practice in speaking from notes and speaking without notes. At this stage, pay more attention to manner than to matter. The succeeding chapters take up the composition of the address. Be particularly insistent upon frequent and thorough review of the principles of delivery discussed in the preceding chapters. End of section 16. Recording by Bill Mosley, Frelsberg, Texas. U.S.A. Section 17 of The Art of Public Speaking This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joe Mabry the Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Eisenwein Section 17 Chapter 17 Thought and Reserve Power Providence is always on the side of the last reserve. Napoleon Bonaparte So mightiest powers by deepest calms are fed, and sleep how oft in the things that gentlest be. Barry Cornwall, The Sea in Calm What would happen if you should overdraw your bank account? 
as a rule the check would be protested but if you were on friendly terms with the bank your check might be honored and you would be called upon to make good the overdraft nature has no such favorites therefore extends no credits she is as relentless as a gasoline tank when the gas is all used the machine stops it is as reckless for a speaker to risk going before an audience without having something in reserve as it is for the motorist to essay a long journey in the wilds without enough gasoline in sight but in what does a speaker's reserve power consist in a well-founded reliance on his general and particular grasp of his subject in the quality of being alert and resourceful in thought particularly in the ability to think while on his feet and in that self-possession which makes one the captain of all his own forces bodily and mental the first of these elements adequate preparation and the last self-reliance were discussed fully in the chapters on self-confidence and fluency so they will be touched only incidentally here besides the next chapter will take up specific methods of preparation for public speaking therefore the central theme of this chapter is the second of the elements of reserve power thought the mental storehouse an empty mind like an empty larder may be a serious matter or not all will depend on the available resources if there is no food in the cupboard the housewife does not nervously rattle the empty dishes she telephones the grocer if you have no ideas do not rattle your empty errs and ahs but get some ideas and don't speak until you do get them this however is not being what the old new england housekeeper used to call forehanded the real solution of the problem of what to do with an empty head is never to let it become empty in the artesian wells of dakota the water rushes to the surface and leaps a score of feet above the ground the secret of this exuberant flow is of course the great supply below crowding to get out what is the use of stopping to prime a mental pump when you can fill your life with the resources for an artesian well it is not enough to have merely enough you must have more than enough then the pressure of your mass of thought and feeling will maintain your flow of speech and give you the confidence and poise that denote reserve power to be away from home with only the exact return fare leaves a great deal to circumstances reserve power is magnetic it does not consist in giving the idea that you are holding something in reserve but rather in the suggestion that the audience is getting the cream of your observation reading experience feeling thought to have reserve power therefore you must have enough milk of material on hand to supply sufficient cream but how shall we get the milk there are two ways the one is first hand from the cow the other is second hand from the milkman the seeing eye some sage has said for a thousand men who can speak there is only one who can think for a thousand men who can think there is only one who can see to see and to think is to get your milk from your own cow when the one man in a million who can see comes along we call him master old mr holbrook of cranford asked his guests what color ash buds were in march she confessed she did not know to which the old gentleman answered i knew you didn't no more did i an old fool that i am till this young man comes and tells me black as ash buds in march and i've lived all my life in the country more shame for me not to know black they are jet black madam this young man referred to by mr holbrook was tennyson henry ward beecher said quote, I do not believe that I have ever met a man on the street that I did not get from him some element for a sermon. I never see anything in nature which does not work towards that for which I give the strength of my life. The material for my sermons is all the time following me and swarming up around me." End quote. Instead of saying only one man in a million can see, it would strike nearer the truth to say that none of us sees with perfect understanding more than a fraction of what passes before our eyes yet this faculty of acute and accurate observation is so important that no man ambitious to lead can neglect it the next time you are in a car look at those who sit opposite you and see what you can discover of their habits occupations ideals 
nationalities, environments, education, and so on. You may not see a great deal the first time, but practice will reveal astonishing results. Transmute every incident of your day into a subject for a speech or an illustration. Translate all that you see into terms of speech. When you can describe all that you have seen in definite words, you are seeing clearly. You are becoming the millionth man. De Maupassant's description of an author should also fit the public speaker. Quote, His eye is like a suction pump, absorbing everything, like a pickpocket's hand, always at work. Nothing escapes him. He is constantly collecting material, gathering up glances, gestures, intentions, everything that goes on in his presence, the slightest look, the least act, the merest trifle. End quote. De Maupassant was himself a millionth man, a master. Ruskin took a common rock crystal and saw hidden within its stolid heart lessons which have not yet ceased to move men's lives. Beecher stood for hours before the window of a jewelry store, thinking out analogies between jewels and the souls of men. Go saw in a single drop of water enough truth wherewith to quench the thirst of five thousand souls. Thoreau sat so still in the shadowy woods that birds and insects came and opened up their secret lives to his eye. Emerson observed the soul of a man so long that at length he could say, I cannot hear what you say, for seeing what you are. Prior for three years studied the life of his babe and so became an authority upon the child mind. Observation. Most men are blind. There are a thousand times as many hidden truths and undiscovered facts about us today as have made discoverers famous, facts waiting for someone to pluck out the heart of their mystery. But so long as men go about the search with eyes that see not, so long will these hidden pearls lie in their shells. Not an orator, but who could more effectively point and feather his shafts were he to search nature rather than libraries. Too few can see sermons in stones and books in the running brooks, because they are so used to seeing merely sermons in books and only stones in running brooks. Sir Philip Sidney had a saying, Look in thy heart and write. Massillon explained his astute knowledge of the human heart by saying, I learned it by studying myself. Byron says of John Locke that all his knowledge of the human understanding was derived from studying his own mind. Since multiform nature is all about us, originality ought not to be so rare. How to Attract and Hold an Audience, J. Berg Eisenwein. The Thinking Mind Thinking is doing mental arithmetic with facts. Add this fact to that, and you reach a certain conclusion. Subtract this truth from another, and you have a definite result. Multiply this fact by another, and have a precise product. See how many times this occurrence happens in that space of time, and you have reached a calculable dividend. In thought processes, you perform every known problem of arithmetic and algebra. That is why mathematics are such excellent mental gymnastics. But by the same token, thinking is work. Thinking takes energy. Thinking requires time, and patience, and broad information, and clear-headedness. Beyond a miserable little surface scratching, few people really think at all. Only one in a thousand, according to the pundit already quoted. So long as the present system of education prevails, and children are taught through the ear rather than through the eye, so long as they are expected to remember thoughts of others rather than think for themselves, this proportion will continue. One man in a million will be able to see, and one in a thousand to think. But however thoughtless a mind has been, there is promise of better things so soon as the mind detects its own lack of thought power. The first step is to stop regarding thought as the magic of the mind, to use Byron's expression, and see it as thought truly is, a weighing of ideas and a placing of them in relationships to each other. Ponder this definition and see if you have learned to think efficiently. 
habitual thinking is just that a habit habit comes of doing a thing repeatedly the lower habits are acquired easily the higher ones require deeper grooves if they are to persist so we find that the thought habit comes only with resolute practice yet no effort will yield richer dividends persist in practice and whereas you have been able to think only an inch deep into a subject, you will soon find that you can penetrate it afoot. Perhaps this homely metaphor will suggest how to begin the practice of consecutive thinking, by which we mean welding a number of separate thought links into a chain that will hold. Take one link at a time, see that each naturally belongs with the ones you link to it, and remember that a single missing link means no chain. Thinking is the most fascinating and exhilarating of all mental exercises. Once realize that your opinion on a subject does not represent the choice you have made between what Dr. Cerebrum has written and Professor Cerebellum has said, but is the result of your own earnestly applied brain energy, and you will gain a confidence in your ability to speak on that subject that nothing will be able to shake. Your thought will have given you both power and reserve power. Someone has condensed the relation of thought to knowledge in these pungent, homely lines. Don't give me the man who thinks he thinks. Don't give me the man who thinks he knows. But give me the man who knows he thinks, and I have the man who knows he knows. Reading as a Stimulus to Thought No matter how dry the cow, however, nor how poor our ability to milk, there is still the milkman. We can read what others have seen and felt and thought. Often, indeed, such records will kindle within us that pre-essential and vital spark, the desire to be a thinker. The following selection is taken from one of Dr. Newell Dwight Hillis's lectures, as given in A Man's Value to Society. Dr. Hillis is a most fluent speaker. He never refers to notes. He has reserve power. His mind is a veritable treasure house of facts and ideas. See how he draws from a knowledge of fifteen different general or special subjects. Geology, plant life, Palestine, chemistry, Eskimos, mythology, literature, the Nile, history, law, wit, evolution, religion, biography, and electricity. Surely it needs no sage to discover that the secret of this man's reserve power is the old secret of our artesian well whose abundance surges from unseen depths. The Uses of Books and Reading Used by Permission each Kingsley approaches a stone as a jeweler approaches a casket to unlock the hidden gems. Geike causes the bit of hard coal to unroll the juicy bud, the thick odorous leaves, the pungent boughs, until the bit of carbon enlarges into the beauty of a tropic forest. That little book of Grant Allen's, called How Plants Grow, exhibits trees and shrubs as eating, drinking, and marrying. We see certain date groves in Palestine, and other date groves in the desert a hundred miles away, and the pollen of the one carried upon the trade winds to the branches of the other. We see the tree with its strange system of waterworks pumping the sap up through pipes and mains. We see the chemical laboratory in the branches mixing flavor for the orange in one bough, mixing the juices of the pineapple in another. We behold the tree as a mother making each infant acorn ready against the long winter, rolling it in swaths soft and warm as wool blankets, wrapping it around with garments impervious to the rain, and finally slipping the infant acorn into a sleeping bag, like those the Eskimos gave Dr. Kane. At length we come to feel that the Greeks were not far wrong in thinking each tree had a dryad in it, animating it protecting it against destruction, dying when the tree withered. Some Faraday shows us that each drop of water is a sheath for electrical forces sufficient to charge 800,000 Leyden jars, or drive an engine from Liverpool to London. 
some sir william thompson tells us how hydrogen gas will chew up a large iron spike as a child's molars will chew off the end of a stick of candy thus each new book opens up some new and hitherto unexplored realm of nature thus books fulfill for us the legend of the wondrous glass that showed its owner all things distant and all things hidden through books our world becomes as a bud from the bower of god's beauty the sun as a spark from the light of his wisdom the sky as a bubble on the sea of his power therefore mrs browning's words no child can be called fatherless who has god and his mother no youth can be called friendless who has god and the companionship of good books books also advantage us in that they exhibit the unity of progress the solidarity of the race and the continuity of history authors lead us back along the pathway of law of liberty or religion and set us down in front of the great man in whose brain the principle had its rise as the discoverer leads us from the mouth of the nile back to the headwaters of nianza so books exhibit great ideas and institutions as they move forward ever widening and deepening like some nile feeding many civilizations for all the reforms of today go back to some reform of yesterday man's art goes back to athens and thebes man's laws go back to blackstone and justinian man's reapers and ploughs go back to the savage scratching the ground with his forked stick drawn by the wild bullock the heroes of liberty march forward in a solid column lincoln grasps the hand of washington washington received his weapons at the hands of hampton and cromwell the great puritans lock hands with luther and savonarola the unbroken procession brings us at length to him whose sermon on the mount was the very charter of liberty it puts us under a divine spell to perceive that we are all co-workers with the great men and yet single threads in the warp and woof of civilization and when books have related us to our own age and related all the epics to god whose providence is the gulf stream of history these teachers go on to stimulate us to new and greater achievements alone man is an unlighted candle the mind needs some book to kindle its faculties before byron began to write he used to give half an hour to reading some favorite passage the thought of some great writer never failed to kindle byron into a creative glow even as a match lights the kindlings upon the grate in these burning luminous moods byron's mind did its best work the true book stimulates the mind as no wine can ever quicken the blood it is reading that brings us to our best and rouses each faculty to its most vigorous life we recognize this as pure cream and if it seems at first to have its secondary source in the friendly milkman let us not forget that the theme is the uses of books and reading dr hillis both sees and thinks it is fashionable just now to decry the value of reading we read we are told to avoid the necessity of thinking for ourselves books are for the mentally lazy though this is only a half-truth the element of truth it contains is large enough to make us pause put yourself through a good old presbyterian soul-searching self-examination and if reading from thought laziness is one of your sins confess it no one can shrive you of it but yourself do penance for it by using your own brains for it is a transgression that dwarfs the growth of thought and destroys mental freedom at first the penance will be trying but at the last you will be glad in it reading should entertain give information or stimulate thought here however we are chiefly concerned with information and stimulation of thought what shall i read for information the ample page of knowledge as gray tells us is rich with the spoils of time and these are ours for the price of a theatre ticket you may command socrates and marcus aurelius to sit beside you and discourse of their choicest hear lincoln at gettysburg and pericles at athens storm the bastille with hugo and wander through paradise with dante 
you may explore darkest africa with stanley penetrate the human heart with shakespeare chat with carlyle about heroes and delve with the apostle paul into the mysteries of faith the general knowledge and the inspiring ideas that men have collected through ages of toil and experiment are yours for the asking the sage of chelsea was right the true university of these days is a collection of books to master a worthwhile book is to master much else besides few of us however make perfect conquest of a volume without first owning it physically to read a borrowed book may be a joy but to assign your own book a place of its own on your own shelves be they few or many to love the book and feel of its worn cover to thumb it over slowly page by page to pencil its margins in agreement or in protest to smile or thrill with its remembered pungencies no mere book borrower could ever sense all that delight the reader who possesses books in this double sense finds also that his books possess him and the volumes which most firmly grip his life are likely to be those it has cost him some sacrifice to own these lightly come by titles which mr fatpurse selects perhaps by proxy can scarcely play the guide philosopher and friend in crucial moments as do the books long coveted joyously attained that are welcomed into the lives and not merely the libraries of us others who are at once poorer and richer so it is scarcely too much to say that of all the many ways in which an owned a mastered book is like to a human friend the truest ways are these a friend is worth making sacrifices for both to gain and to keep and our loves go out most dearly to those into whose inmost lives we have sincerely entered when you have not the advantage of the test of time by which to judge books investigate as thoroughly as possible the authority of the books you read much that is printed and passes current is counterfeit i read it in a book is to many a sufficient warranty of truth but not to the thinker what book asks the careful mind who wrote it what does he know about the subject and what right has he to speak on it who recognizes him as authority with what other recognized authorities does he agree or disagree being caught trying to pass counterfeit money even unintentionally is an unpleasant situation beware lest you circulate spurious coin above all seek reading that makes you use your own brains such reading must be alive with fresh points of view packed with special knowledge and deal with subjects of vital interest do not confine your reading to what you already know you will agree with opposition wakes one up the other road may be the better but you will never know it unless you give it the once over do not do all your thinking and investigating in front of given q e d s merely assembling reasons to fill in between your theorem and what you want to prove will get you nowhere approach each subject with an open mind and once sure that you have thought it out thoroughly and honestly have the courage to abide by the decision of your own thought but don't brag about it afterward no book on public speaking will enable you to discourse on the tariff if you know nothing about the tariff knowing more about it than the other man will be your only hope for making the other man listen to you take a group of men discussing a governmental policy of which someone says it is socialistic that will commend the policy to mr a who believes in socialism but condemn it to mr b who does not it may be that neither had considered the policy beyond noticing that its surface color was socialistic the chances are furthermore that neither mr a nor mr b has a definite idea of what socialism really is for as robert louis stevenson says man lives not by bread alone but chiefly by catchwords if you are of this group of men and have observed this proposed government policy and investigated it and thought about it what you have to say cannot fail to command their respect and approval 
for you will have shown them that you possess a grasp of your subject and to adopt an exceedingly expressive bit of slang then some questions and exercises one robert houdin trained his son to give one swift glance at a shop window in passing and be able to report accurately a surprising number of its contents try this several times on different windows and report the result two what effect does reserve power have on an audience three what are the best methods for acquiring reserve power four what is the danger of too much reading five analyze some speech that you have read or heard and notice how much real information there is in it compare it with dr hillis's speech on brave little belgium page 394 six write out a three-minute speech on any subject you choose how much information and what new ideas does it contain compare your speech with the extract on page 191 from dr hillis's the uses of books and reading seven have you ever read a book on the practice of thinking if so give your impressions of its value note there are a number of excellent books on the subject of thought and the management of thought the following are recommended as being especially helpful thinking and learning to think nathan c schaefer talks to students on the art of study kramer as a man thinketh allen eight define a logic b mental philosophy or mental science c psychology d abstract end of section 17 recording by joe mabry at www.ievoice.com Section 18 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joe Mabry. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Eisenwein. Section 18. Chapter 18 Subject and Preparation suit your topics to your strength and ponder well your subject and its length nor lift your load before you're quite aware what weight your shoulders will or will not bear byron hints from horace look to this day for it is life the very life of life in its brief course lie all the verities and realities of your existence the bliss of growth the glory of action the splendor of beauty for yesterday is already a dream, and tomorrow is only a vision. But today, well lived, makes every yesterday a dream of happiness, and every tomorrow a vision of hope. Look well, therefore, to this day. Such is the salutation of the dawn. From the Sanskrit. In the chapter preceding, we have seen the influence of thought and reserve power on general preparedness for public speech but preparation consists in something more definite than the cultivation of thought power whether from original or from borrowed sources it involves a specifically acquisitive attitude of the whole life if you would become a full soul you must constantly take in and assimilate for in that way only may you hope to give out that which is worth the hearing but do not confuse the acquisition of general information with the mastery of specific knowledge information consists of a fact or a group of facts knowledge is organized information knowledge knows a fact in relation to other facts now the important thing here is that you should set all your faculties to take in the things about you with the particular object of correlating them and storing them for use in public speech you must hear with the speaker's ear see with the speaker's eye and choose books and companions and sights and sounds with the speaker's purpose in view at the same time be ready to receive unplanned for knowledge one of the fascinating elements in your life as a public speaker 
will be the conscious growth in power that casual daily experiences bring if your eyes are alert you will be constantly discovering facts illustrations and ideas without having set out in search of them these all may be turned to account on the platform even the leaden events of humdrum daily life may be melted into bullets for future battles conservation of time and preparation but you say i have so little time for preparation my mind must be absorbed by other matters daniel webster never let an opportunity pass to gather material for his speeches when he was a boy working in a sawmill he read out of a book in one hand and busied himself at some mechanical task with the other in youth patrick henry roamed the fields and woods in solitude for days at a time unconsciously gathering material and impressions for his later service as a speaker dr russell h conwell the man who the late charles a dana said had addressed more hearers than any living man used to memorize long passages from milton while tending the boiling syrup pans in the silent new england woods at night the modern employer would discharge a webster of today for inattention to duty and doubtless he would be justified and patrick henry seemed only an idle chap even in those easy-going days but the truth remains those who take in power and have the purpose to use it efficiently will some day win to the place in which that stored-up power will revolve great wheels of influence napoleon said that quarter hours decide the destinies of nations how many quarter hours do we let drift by aimlessly robert louis stevenson conserved all his time every experience became capital for his work for capital may be defined as the results of labor stored up to assist future production he continually tried to put into suitable language the scenes and actions that were in evidence about him emerson says quote, tomorrow will be like today life wastes itself whilst we are preparing to live End quote why wait for a more convenient season for this broad general preparation the fifteen minutes that we spend on the car could be profitably turned into speech capital procure a cheap edition of modern speeches and by cutting out a few pages each day and reading them during the idle minute here and there note how soon you can make yourself familiar with the world's best speeches if you do not wish to mutilate your book take it with you most of the epic-making books are now printed in small volumes. The daily waste of natural gas in the Oklahoma fields is equal to 10,000 tons of coal. Only about 3% of the power of the coal that enters the furnace ever diffuses itself from your electric bulb as light. The other 97% is wasted. Yet these wastes are no larger nor more to be lamented than the tremendous waste of time which if conserved would increase the speaker's powers to their nth degree scientists are making three ears of corn grow where one grew before efficiency engineers are eliminating useless motions and products from our factories catch the spirit of the age and apply efficiency to the use of the most valuable asset you possess time what do you do mentally with the time you spend in dressing or in shaving take some subject and concentrate your energies on it for a week by utilizing just the spare moments that would otherwise be wasted you will be amazed at the result one passage a day from the book of books one golden ingot from some master mind one fully possessed thought of your own might thus be added to the treasury of your life do not waste your time in ways that profit you nothing fill the unforgiving minute with sixty seconds worth of distance run and on the platform you will be immeasurably the gainer let no word of this however seem to decry the value of recreation nothing is more vital to a worker than rest yet nothing is so vitiating to the shirker be sure that your recreation recreates a pause in the midst of labors gathers strength for new effort the mistake is to pause too long or to fill your pauses with ideas that make life flabby choosing a subject subject and materials tremendously influence each other this arises from the fact that there are two distinct ways in which a subject may be chosen by arbitrary choice 
or by development from thought and reading. Arbitrary choice of one subject from among a number involves so many important considerations that no speaker ever fails to appreciate the tone of satisfaction in him who triumphantly announces, I have a subject. Do give me a subject. How often the weary school teachers hear that cry. Then a list of themes is suggested, gone over, considered, and, in most instances, rejected, because the teacher can know but imperfectly what is in the pupil's mind. To suggest a subject in this way is like trying to discover the street on which a lost child lives, by naming over a number of streets until one strikes the little one's ear as sounding familiar. Choice by development is a very different process. It does not ask, what shall I say? It turns the mind in upon itself and asks, what do I think? Thus, the subject may be said to choose itself. For in the process of thought or of reading, one theme rises into prominence and becomes a living germ, soon to grow into the discourse. He who has not learned to reflect is not really acquainted with his own thoughts. Hence, his thoughts are not productive. Habits of reading and reflection will supply the speaker's mind with an abundance of subjects of which he already knows something from the very reading and reflection which gave birth to his theme. This is not a paradox but sober truth. It must be already apparent that the choice of a subject by development savors more of a collection than of conscious selection. The subject pops into the mind. In the intellect of the trained thinker it concentrates, by a process which we have seen to be induction, the facts and truths of which he has been reading and thinking. This is most often a gradual process. The scattered ideas may be but vaguely connected at first, but more and more they concentrate and take on a single form until at length one strong idea seems to grasp the soul with irresistible force and to cry aloud, Arise, I am your theme. Henceforth, until you transmute me by the alchemy of your inward fire into vital speech, you shall know no rest. Happy then is that speaker, for he has found a subject that grips him. Of course, experienced speakers use both methods of selection. Even a reading and reflective man is sometimes compelled to hunt for a theme from Dan to Beersheba, and then the task of gathering materials becomes a serious one. But even in such a case there is a sense in which the selection comes by development, because no careful speaker settles upon a theme which does not represent at least some matured thought. How to Attract and Hold an Audience J. Berg Eisenfein. Deciding on the subject matter. Even when your theme has been chosen for you by someone else, there remains to you a considerable field for choice of subject matter. The same considerations, in fact, that would govern you in choosing a theme must guide in the selection of the material. Ask yourself, or someone else, such questions as these. What is the precise nature of the occasion? How large an audience may be expected? From what walks of life do they come? What is their probable attitude toward the theme? Who else will speak? Do I speak first, last, or where on the program? What are the other speakers going to talk about? What is the nature of the auditorium? Is there a desk? Could the subject be more effectively handled if somewhat modified? Precisely how much time am I to fill? It is evident that many speech misfits of subject, speaker, occasion, and place are due to failure to ask just such pertinent questions. What should be said, by whom, and in what circumstances, constitute 90% of efficiency in public address? No matter who asks you, refuse to be a square peg in a round hole. Questions of Proportion Proportion in a speech is attained by a nice adjustment of time. How fully you may treat your subject, it is not always for you to say. Let ten minutes mean neither nine nor eleven, though better nine than eleven at all events. You wouldn't steal a man's watch. No more should you steal the time of the succeeding speaker, or that of the audience. There is no need to overstep time limits if you make your preparation adequate and divide your subject so as to give each thought its due proportion of attention, and no more. 
blessed is the man that maketh short speeches for he shall be invited to speak again another matter of prime importance is what part of your address demands the most emphasis this once decided you will know where to place that pivotal section so as to give it the greatest strategic value and what degree of preparation must be given to that central thought so that the vital part may not be submerged by non-essentials many a speaker has awakened to find that he has burnt up eight minutes of a ten-minute speech in merely getting up steam that is like spending eighty per cent of your building money on the vestibule of the house the same sense of proportion must tell you to stop precisely when you are through and it is to be hoped that you will discover the arrival of that period before your audience does tapping original sources the surest way to give life to speech material is to gather your facts at first hand your words come with the weight of authority when you can say i have examined the employment rolls of every mill in this district and find that thirty two per cent of the children employed are under the legal age no citation of authorities can equal that you must adopt the methods of the reporter and find out the facts underlying your argument or appeal to do so may prove laborious but it should not be irksome for the great world of fact teems with interest and over and above all is the sense of power that will come to you from original investigation to see and feel the facts you are discussing will react upon you much more powerfully than if you were to secure the facts at second hand live an active life among people who are doing worthwhile things keep eyes and ears and mind and heart open to absorb truth and then tell of the things you know as if you know them the world will listen for the world loves nothing so much as real life how to use a library unsuspected treasures lie in the smallest library even when the owner has read every last page of his books it is only in rare instances that he has full indexes to all of them either in his mind or on paper so as to make available the vast number of varied subjects touched upon or treated in volumes whose titles would never suggest such topics for this reason it is a good thing to take an odd hour now and then to browse take down one volume after another and look over its table of contents and its index it is a reproach to any author of a serious book not to have provided a full index with cross-references then glance over the pages making notes mental or physical of material that looks interesting and usable most libraries contain volumes that the owner is going to read some day a familiarity with even the contents of such books on your own shelves will enable you to refer to them when you want help writings read long ago should be treated in the same way in every chapter some surprise lurks to delight you in looking up a subject do not be discouraged if you do not find it indexed or outlined in the table of contents you are pretty sure to discover some material under a related title suppose you set to work somewhat in this way to gather references on thinking first you look over your book titles and there is schaeffer's thinking and learning to think near it is kramer's talks to students on the art of study that seems likely to provide some material and it does naturally you think next of your book on psychology and there is help there if you have a volume on the human intellect you will have already turned to it suddenly you remember your encyclopedia and your dictionary of quotations and now material fairly rains upon you the problem is what not to use in the encyclopedia you turn to every reference that includes or touches or even suggests thinking and in the dictionary of quotations you do the same the latter volume you find peculiarly helpful because it suggests several volumes to you that are on your own shelves you never would have thought to look in them for references on this subject even fiction will supply help but especially books of essays and biography be aware of your own resources to make a general index to your library does away with the necessity for indexing individual volumes that are not already indexed to begin with keep a notebook by you or small cards and paper cuttings in your pocket and on your desk will serve as well the same notebook that records the impressions of your own experiences and thoughts will be enriched by the ideas of others to be sure 
this notebook habit means labor but remember that more speeches have been spoiled by half-hearted preparation than by lack of talent laziness is an own brother to overconfidence and both are your inveterate enemies though they pretend to be soothing friends conserve your material by indexing every good idea on cards thus socialism progress of socialism envelope sixteen socialism a fallacy ninety six slash two ten general article on socialism howells december nineteen thirteen socialism and the franchise forbes socialism in ancient life original manuscript envelope one o two on the card illustrated above clippings are indexed by giving the number of the envelope in which they are filed the envelopes may be of any size desired and kept in any convenient receptacle on the foregoing example progress of socialism envelope sixteen will represent a clipping filed in envelope sixteen which is of course numbered arbitrarily the fractions refer to books in your library the numerator being the book number the denominator referring to the page thus socialism a fallacy ninety six slash two ten refers to page two ten of volume ninety six in your library by some arbitrary sign say red ink you may even index a reference in a public library book if you preserve your magazine important articles may be indexed by month and year an entire volume on a subject may be indicated like the imaginary book by forbes if you clip the articles it is better to index them according to the envelope system your own writings and notes may be filed in envelopes with the clippings or in a separate series another good indexing system combines the library index with the scrap or clipping system by making the outside of the envelope serve the same purpose as the card for the indexing of books magazines clippings and manuscripts the latter two classes of material being enclosed in the envelopes that index them and all filed alphabetically when your cards accumulate so as to make ready reference difficult under a single alphabet you may subdivide each letter by subordinate guide cards marked by the vowels a e i o u thus antiquities would be filed under i in a because a begins the word and the second letter n comes after the vowel i in the alphabet but before o in the same manner beecher would be filed under e in b and hydrogen would come under u in h outlining the address no one can advise you how to prepare the notes for an address some speakers get the best results while walking out and ruminating jotting down notes as they pause in their walk others never put pen to paper until the whole speech has been thought out the great majority however will take notes classify their notes write a hasty first draft and then revise the speech try each of these methods and choose the one that is best for you do not allow any man to force you to work in his way but do not neglect to consider his way for it may be better than your own for those who make notes and with their aid write out the speech these suggestions may prove helpful after having read and thought enough classify your notes by setting down the big central thoughts of your material on separate cards or slips of paper these will stand in the same relation to your subject as chapters do to a book then arrange these main ideas or heads in such an order that they will lead effectively to the result you have in mind so that the speech may rise in argument in interest in power by piling one fact or appeal upon another until the climax the highest point of influence on your audience has been reached next group all your ideas facts anecdotes and illustrations under the foregoing main heads each where it naturally belongs you now have a skeleton or outline of your address that in its polished form might serve either as the brief or manuscript notes for the speech or as the guide outline which you will expand into the written address if written it is to be imagine each of the main ideas in the brief on page 213 as being separate then picture your mind as sorting them out and placing them in order finally conceive of how you would fill in the facts and examples under each head 
giving special prominence to those you wish to emphasize and subduing those of less moment in the end you have the outline complete the simplest form of outline not very suitable for use on the platform however is the following why prosperity is coming what prosperity means the real tests of prosperity its basis in the soil american agricultural progress new interest in farming enormous value of our agricultural products reciprocal effect on trade foreign countries affected effects of our new internal economy the regulation of banking and big business on prosperity effects of our revised attitude toward foreign markets including our merchant marine summary obviously this very simple outline is capable of considerable expansion under each head by the addition of facts arguments inferences and examples here is an outline arranged with more regard for argument foreign immigration should be restricted adapted from competition rhetoric scott and denny page 241 one fact as cause many immigrants are practically paupers proofs involving statistics or statements of authorities two fact as effect they sooner or later fill our almshouses and become public charges proofs involving statistics or statements of authorities three fact as cause some of them are criminals examples of recent cases four fact as effect they reinforce the criminal classes effects on our civic life five fact as cause many of them know nothing of the duties of free citizenship examples six fact as effect such immigrants recruit the worst element in our politics proofs a more highly ordered grouping of topics and subtopics is shown in the following ours a christian nation one introduction why the subject is timely influences operative against this contention today two christianity presided over the early history of america one first practical discovery by a christian explorer columbus worshipped god on the new soil two the cavaliers three the french catholic settlers four the huguenots five the puritans three the birth of our nation was under christian auspices one christian character of washington two other christian patriots three the church in our revolutionary struggle muhlenberg four our later history has only emphasized our national attitude examples of dealings with foreign nations show christian magnanimity returning the chinese indemnity fostering the red cross attitude toward belgium five our governmental forms and many of our laws are of christian temper one the use of the bible in public ways oaths etc two the bible in our schools three christian chaplains minister to our law-making bodies to our army and to our navy four the christian sabbath is officially and generally recognized five the christian family and the christian system of morality are at the basis of our laws six the life of the people testifies of the power of christianity charities education etc have christian tone seven other nations regard us as a christian people eight conclusion the attitude which may reasonably be expected of all good citizens toward questions touching the preservation of our standing as a christian nation writing and revision after the outline has been perfected comes the time to write the speech if write it you must then whatever you do write it at white heat with not too much thought of anything but the strong appealing expression of your ideas the final stage is the paring down the revision the seeing again as the word implies 
when all the parts of the speech must be impartially scrutinized for clearness precision force effectiveness suitability proportion logical climax and in all this you must imagine yourself to be before your audience for a speech is not an essay and what will convince and arouse in the one will not prevail in the other the title often last of all will come that which in a sense is first of all the title the name by which the speech is known sometimes it will be the simple theme of the address as the new americanism by henry watterson or it may be a bit of symbolism typifying the spirit of the address as acres of diamonds by russell h conwell or it may be a fine phrase taken from the body of the address as past prosperity around by albert j beveridge all in all from whatever motive it be chosen let the title be fresh short suited to the subject and likely to excite interest questions and exercises one define a introduction b climax c peroration two if a thirty-minute speech would require three hours for specific preparation would you expect to be able to do equal justice to a speech one-third as long in one-third the time for preparation give reasons three relate briefly any personal experience you may have had in conserving time for reading and thought four in the manner of a reporter or investigator go out and get first-hand information on some subject of interest to the public arrange the results of your research in the form of an outline or a brief five from a private or a public library gather enough authoritative material on one of the following questions to build an outline for a twenty-minute address take one definite side of the question a the housing of the poor b the commission form of government for cities as a remedy for political graft c the test of women's suffrage in the west d present trends of public taste in reading e municipal art f is the theater becoming more elevated in tone g the effects of the magazine on literature h does modern life destroy ideals i is competition the life of trade j baseball is too absorbing to be a wholesome national game k summer baseball in amateur standing l does college training unfit a woman for domestic life? M. Does women's competition with man in business dull the spirit of chivalry? N. Are elective studies suited to high school courses? O. Does the modern college prepare men for preeminent leadership? P. The YMCA in its relation to the labor problem. Q. Public speaking as training in citizenship. 6. Construct the outline, examining it carefully for interest, convincing character, proportion, and climax of arrangement. Note, this exercise should be repeated until the student shows facility in synthetic arrangement. 7. Deliver the address, if possible, before an audience. 8. Make a 300-word report on the results as best you are able to estimate them. 9. Tell something of the benefits of using a periodical or a cumulative index. 10. Give a number of quotations, suitable for a speaker's use, that you have memorized in off moments. 11. In the manner of the outline on page 213, analyze the address on pages 78 and 79, The History of Liberty. 12. Give an outline analysis, from notes or memory, of an address or sermon to which you have listened for this purpose. 13. Criticize the address from a structural point of view. 14. Invent titles for any five of the themes in Exercise 5. 15. Criticize the titles of any five chapters of this book, suggesting better ones. 16. Criticize the title of any lecture or address of which you know. End of section 18. Recording by Joe Mabry at 
www.ievoice.com.